I think all of us are um, very much aware of the vast distances that separate um, the stars and the closest stars are just over all light years away from the galaxy, 100,000 light years. And so day one through three, we've been looking at conventional solutions um, to the interstellar problem. But on the propulsion side of things, we're always going to measure trip times um, in decades, best case scenario, more likely in centuries, millennia, possibly. Um, and so if we're ever going to become a truly interstellar species with the capacity to cross a, the vast gulfs between the distance between the stars, we're going to need to make some profound breakthroughs. And day three is really devoted to uh, people who are thinking about how we might make those breakthroughs. And I'm always amazed um, by the ingenuity um, of human beings. And something that we've done for a long time is, is look at nature, use nature as, uh, as teacher. We believe that 13.7 billion years ago, the universe exploded into existence, um, uh, an event called the Big Bang. And in the early epoch of the universe, there was a very short period known as inflation. And uh, we believe that during that inflationary period, uh, space-time itself expanded at, at many times the speed of light. And so this offers tantalizing questions if we look at nature as teacher. Is this something that could be duplicated uh, on the around the vicinity of a spacecraft? And so one of the things we're going to be talking about uh, is something with, with a name that's taken straight from science fiction, uh, the warp drive. Um, we've known since the time of quantum field theory as well that the vacuum of space, which classically the notion of the vacuum is the region of space that's empty, that's devoid of matter, we now believe it to be uh, a seething inferno of virtual particles that come into and out of existence. And the most microscopic manifestation, experimentally, of the reality of the quantum vacuum is something called the Casimir effect, discovered in uh, the 1950s by the Dutch physicist Heinrich Casimir. And it was the physicist Robert Forward who actually demonstrated that, in principle, without violating the laws of thermodynamics, you could actually extract energy from the vacuum. So again, tantalizing hints at possible future reservoirs of energy that might be tapped into. Um, you've probably heard of Kardashev, a gentleman um, a last century, a Russian physicist, a Soviet physicist, who created different classification scales, uh, scales um, for civilizations based on the amount of energy that they use. So one of the things we, we're going to be looking at today are mega engineering projects. So, so, so um, Kardashev proposed that a type 1 civilization could utilize all the energy of its host planet, type 2, the host solar system, leading to the famous proposal by Freeman Dyson of, of the Dyson Sphere, and a type 3 civilization, uh, a civilization that could harness all the energy output from an entire galaxy. So uh, mega engineering projects uh, are going to make up a theme um, of today. Uh, something else is going to be a theme of today. Is it possible for us to go to other worlds that are not friendly to human life and terraform them so that they become friendly to us, so that we can walk around without breathing apparatus? So day three is devoted to deep future thinking, uh, 50 years to 500 years out. So um, we've got some great keynote speakers today. Uh, uh, Sonny White is going to talk about warp field physics and update, and we've got Rachel Armstrong, who's going to be talk Dr. Rachel Armstrong, who's going to be talking um, this afternoon. Uh, in addition, uh, we're going to have the last session of the first General Assembly. Uh, that's uh, again this afternoon, and then the evening event. Uh, Pete Garrison is going to be talking to us about a billionaire plan, um, and after that, uh, we've got uh, Haley Bright, who's presenting an event called uh, Dreaming of Starships. So. Uh, enjoy day three, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, thank you. I'm just getting the slides queued up right now, folks.
think I got everybody up here ready to go. So let's see. It's a little early, folks. Why don't we wait just another five more minutes before we get started? We don't want to uh, begin before other people have a chance to get here. They're expecting the first talk at 9 o'clock, so let's not uh, get started before that. Mark Millis, are you here? Okay, I see you. Jeff Lee, are you here? Jeff, if you're here, say aye. Oh, I see your arm. Okay. I just want to be sure you're here this morning. And Lance Williams. Lance Williams? There you are, Lance. Okay, I wanted to be sure you're here. Probably got some jokes to fill in the time, but I don't I don't know any. So um, we'll hang out for five minutes. Well, remind everybody that Lance's talk is at noon because it's not in the schedule. Do you know what yeah, I'm saying? Uh, no, no, no. You don't understand. You need to remind everybody that Lance's talk is at noon because it's not in the schedule. You see, it's not in here. Okay, you want me to do it? The laptop that's not Bring in the schedule. Yeah. I just want to remind everybody that there was a erroneous omission from the schedule. We have a 12 o'clock talk at noon. Noon, 12 o'clock today. We have Lance Williams, who's giving his talk, Rise of the Scalar Field, and, and its implications. Uh, it was omitted out of the schedule for today's talks, and I apologize for that. So don't take off after Dr. Cleaver gives his talk at 1135. Uh, lunch will begin as shown in the schedule at 1225.
student that I'm mentoring myself personally among two or three other students that I'm bringing up hopefully as the next generation of warp field scientists to take over for the day when Hal and Sonny and I pass off, uh, pass on to the great bird of the galaxy days. <laughs> so so uh, welcome to Tiffany, take it over. Thank you everyone. So, um, I'd like to personally um, welcome you all to the what I think is a really exciting subject. And um, our first speaker is going to be the keynote speaker for the day. Um, that's Dr. Howard Sunny White at the NASA Johnson Station is actually doing experimental research on warp fields and warp drives. And his talk for the day it's, gonna, it's entitled Warp Field Physics and Update. So, um, everybody, welcome Dr. Um, Harold Sunny White. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I have quite a bit of stuff to. Yeah. I have quite a bit of stuff to cover today, so let me dive right in. Uh, I've got quite a bit of stuff to talk about. Um, So this morning's theme is going to talk about trying to get somewhere very quickly. Uh, we've talked about some interstellar missions the last couple days. Uh, and like uh, <clears throat> Richard talked about when he was doing the intro this morning, uh, some of the transit times associated with that have been measured in centuries and millennia. Uh, but what do you need to do if you want to try and change that transit time to something measured in uh, weeks, months, or maybe even years? Uh, it turns out within general relativity, there are two families of solutions that will potentially allow for uh, a very quick interstellar travel. One is a solution, it's going to be a family of solutions known as wormholes, uh, and another is a family of solutions known as uh, space warps. Um, I think there's some additional things that uh, will be talked about today as well. Um, now the Akubi Air metric uh, is a model that fits into the family of a space warp. And so as a number of you know, I've done some work the last couple years in terms of uh, sensitivity analysis on the field equations, and this is just a little bit of a refresher. I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, but you see here on the screen, this is um, uh, the field equations that uh, Alcubierre put out in 94, and then you see to the right uh, a little cartoon of the spacecraft that kind of uh, translates that math into some type of a physical interpretation of what it might look like. Uh, so you see there, there's a little football shaped, uh, a football shaped uh, spacecraft right there that would be considered like where the uh, sensitive robotic equipment would be, or if you want to be bold, uh, maybe the crew would be there. And then what's necessary to make the trick work is the presence of this ring around the spacecraft. It would be attached, this is just PowerPoint graphics, so forgive the, uh, uh, the lack of fidelity, but the ring would have uh, something known as uh, exotic matter or negative vacuum energy. Uh, and that, the presence of that is what's necessary to uh, make the idea of a, of a space warp work. Now, the problem we, uh, uh, the pro one of the problems with the idea of a space warp uh, prior to 2011 has been the uh, exceedingly large amount of uh, exotic matter or negative vacuum energy that was necessary uh, to make the idea work. Um, and so that's where we did some work uh, for the DARPA 100-Year Starship Symposium back in 2011. Uh, I was asked to pull together a paper uh, that talked about the topic, and uh, so I did a sensitivity analysis and found uh, two mechanisms to reduce uh, the amount of uh, energy uh, that's required for the idea of a space warp. And so what you see here is just a series of stills that go through and show the variation of the expansion and contraction of space across the top. Uh, this is for a 10 meter diameter spacecraft uh, with an effective velocity of 10 C. Uh, and you can see that the expansion and contraction of space uh, changes as we move from a very thin aspect ratio ring. So if you would imagine that ring that goes around the spacecraft, when it looks like a wedding band around your finger, the expansion and contraction of space has to be very high. So in engineering parlance, the strain rate uh, is very, very large. Uh, but what we found with one of the energy optimization techniques is that if you, if you change that topology uh, from something that looks like uh, a wedding band to something that looks a little bit more like, say, a lifesaver, uh, you can reduce the strain on space-time, and so that yields a significant reduction in the amount of energy that's required to accomplish that same thing. So if I were to try and compress this wooden panel here, 
uh, a full quarter inch, I don't have enough chemical energy in my muscles to be able to compress this panel. Uh, but if I only have to compress it, say, a nanometer, I might have enough chemical energy to do that. So by reducing the strain, uh, I reduce the energy requirement, and that makes it uh, uh, a little bit more tractable. And you see the energy density across the bottom there, um, uh, how it's collapsing many, many orders of magnitude. Now, the second uh, optimization technique, uh, and this is something I want to highlight because this has some pertinence uh, later in the talk. <clears throat> By going through and expanding uh, the idea of the Alcubierre metric into some higher dimensional space time, uh, we did some consideration of the null like geodesics and found some additional ways to maybe reduce uh, the amount of energy that's required for the idea of a space warp. Uh, and we found that. <clears throat> If you oscillate the bubble intensity, you kind of see a, just a, uh, an, an animation trying to illustrate the idea. Uh, if you oscillate the bubble intensity, uh, you reduce the stiffness of space time. So in my little thought experiment, I just talked to you about compressing this little wooden panel here with my fingers. Uh, the wood is fairly stiff. Uh, if I could change the characteristics of the panel so that it was a bit more, you know, say it's just a, 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 a piece of foam, the stiffness is much less. So that further reduces the amount of energy that's required for the, uh, the, the target strain on space time. So it was these two optimization techniques uh, that uh, helped us maybe uh, reduce the, some of the colossal energy requirements that are identified uh, in the literature. I think the, uh, uh, the lowest prediction was done by Richard uh, a couple years ago. Uh, he reduced, reduced the amount uh, of exotic matter uh, to something about the size of Jupiter. Uh, and so I wanted to kind of pick up the baton where Richard left off. And so this is uh, kind of like the, uh, uh, the summary of the analysis that I did uh, the last couple of years and presented uh, at the last uh, uh, conference. Um, <clears throat> this is for a 10-meter diameter spacecraft with an effective velocity of 10C. And I can show how that, if you make that ring very thin, right, you can yield the solution uh, that requires an enormous amount of exotic matter or negative vacuum energy. Uh, but using these two optimization techniques, by changing the topology of the ring and inducing the oscillations, this is a DFTT. So as you move from left to right here, you see some cartoons that show what the ring kind of looks like, relatively speaking, on this log-log scale. Uh, and then if you go through and, in, and induce DFTT, you can further reduce the energy requirements. Uh, and in this case, we were able to reduce it to something about the size of the Voyager spacecraft. Now, there's nothing special about 10C or 10 meter diameter spacecraft. And there's nothing special about <clears throat> the Voyager 1 spacecraft in terms of, you know, that's like the absolute net limit. That's not what I'm saying. It was just a way to try and illustrate uh, uh, the benefits of the optimization approach uh, that kind of came out of the, uh, uh, the sensitivity analysis. And I suppose the other important thing to, 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 to mention here is that you know, this sensitivity analysis, I didn't do it to try and find these optimization techniques. They just kind of came out of uh, following uh, curiosity. And so it was kind of a, a useful finding just in the process of, of following curiosity. So, so it was these, uh, <clears throat> it was this uh, significant reduction uh, in energy requirements that encouraged us to go through and uh, uh, think about ways to try and generate uh, some kind of uh, manifestation of this in the lab. So uh, again, let me put a word of caution. This is not something that you're, you know, we're not trying to advocate something that you're going to bolt to a spacecraft. This is just uh, science trying to go through and find maybe existence proof for the application of the physics uh, in a controlled laboratory environment. Uh, but it's kind of like the, the next first step you'd want to take in the process of trying to move from just the math to some type of uh, experimental setup. Uh, so this is a uh, uh, interferometer that's been adapted to try and measure uh, uh, the presence of a warp bubble on an interferometer table. And this is actually a concept uh, Eric and I had talked about years ago, uh, but didn't take any action on because of the uh, colossal energy requirements. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> we dusted this off and came up with some additional software. Uh, Dr. Richard today came up with some software to help uh, uh, diagnose uh, the presence of uh, a warp bubble on the uh, interferometer table. So just to kind of go through uh, what's going on here, you have a laser source, uh, in this case it's a helium neon laser, and so it spits out a laser beam that goes to the beam splitter here. Uh, we split that laser light, and once one beam goes down the reference leg of the interferometer, uh, the other beam goes down the uh, active leg of the interferometer. Uh, the light combines and constructively and destructively interferes, and then forms an interference pattern uh, at the detector. Now what happens is, in the presence of a test device, we're trying to alter 
the, the path length here uh, for the photons that are going down this leg of the interferometer. And so by changing the path length, we'll see a change in the interference pattern that's seen in the detector. And so you kind of see a, an early numerical simulation uh, of what, uh, what that might look like in terms of the light and dark uh, bands and then some type of change in those uh, with the corresponding uh, presence of a, uh, a field induced by a test article. <clears throat> now, some of the things we've also had to do in terms of trying to pursue this, we have to be very diligent because uh, there's a lot of things you want to make sure that don't uh, uh, reduce the sensitivity of your test setup. Because uh, some of our, uh, what we're trying to work towards now is getting to one one hundredth of a wavelength of sensitivity of light uh, so we can measure changes uh, in the path length down to one one hundredth of the wavelength of light with the uh, interferometer. We're actually trying to get lower. Uh, we'll talk about some of the additional techniques and hardware that we're putting in place to do that. <clears throat> so, so what we've got is uh, we're using a vibration isolated optical table. I'll show you some pictures of that in a minute. Uh, we also have a vibration isolated room. I'll show you some pictures of that as well. Uh, we uh, use an optical hood to enclose the, uh, the test setup. Uh, and then of course we use quite a bit of uh, 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 software to try and uh, uh, analyze uh, the data. And then we also gather statistical data as another method of trying to increase the uh, uh, sensitivity of the experimental approach. So this is, the, uh, this is the setup in the lab we're in today. We were in a different lab uh, about a year ago. Uh, there was too much vibration in that lab uh, and we couldn't, uh, we didn't feel comfortable continuing to pursue that work there. So we, uh, uh, we managed to uh, uh, get a home in a, a lab that was built back for the Apollo program uh, to work on <coughs> inertial measurement units and so forth. So it's a, a fairly a nice lab in terms of very seismically quiet. So the, the picture that you're seeing here, this whole lab uh, is seismically isolated. So the whole concrete slab is actually on a, uh, a, a, a whole bunch of uh, pneumatic piers uh, that'll actually float the whole concrete floor. Uh, and then on top of that, we have the, uh, uh, the pneumatic tables that we go and activate as well to get further seismic isolation. And so what you see here, this is the interferometer. We'll show a close-up of it here in a minute. And then here in the background, we have what's called the time of flight experiment. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. <clears throat> so this is the uh, interferometer uh, without the optical hood, so we can illustrate uh, the components. So you've got the laser here. Uh, we've got a beam expander. Uh, this goes through and takes the uh, uh, very small diameter laser beam, and we blow it up to about uh, a one inch in diameter uh, to go through and fully fill uh, the region of interest over here in the test article. Uh, this is the, uh, the beam splitter over here. Uh, the light comes out and we uh, send part of it down here uh, to the off-axis mirror. Uh, and then we send the other uh, portion of light to the active region here where we have the test article. Uh, the light comes back and then of course we send it here to the imager. Uh, and this is the computer that collects the imagery and then this is the, uh, uh, the power supply for the test article. So this is what we would call our low fidelity test article. This is a series of uh, barium titanate ceramic capacitors. We're trying to establish a very large uh, potential energy fee uh, that's blue shifted relative to the lab frame. And we're trying to concurrently uh, achieve uh, a, a Lorenz transform with hyperbolic cosine uh, of the target value. And so we're trying to establish those two conditions as close as we can to what we're trying to get to. Uh, so certainly in terms of just changing the topology, there's some challenges with that. Uh, so we also want to pull on uh, the DFDT, and we'll talk about that in just a minute in terms of some of the, the testing that we've done to date and the testing that we want to do in the future. <clears throat> uh, this shows the underside of the, the lab here. So this is the, 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 the picture we were just looking at. Uh, and then underneath here, we have the control panel uh, that goes through and will activate all of the uh, isolators and actually will float the concrete slab uh, to further seismically isolate it. Uh, I suppose the, the, the benefit of the construction is whether the slab is uh, floated or not, it's still very seismically quiet. So it's a, it's a very uh, useful environment to go do the, the testing in. Um, but uh, as a measure of atrophy, it hasn't been used in quite a while. Uh, so when we went through the process of getting it uh, reactivated, I had to do some small rebuilding of some of the leveling switches. Uh, when we first activated the lab and closed the doors, uh, the slab floated up about a half an inch and we couldn't open the doors. <laughs> so <clears throat> we had to uh, uh, have the doors cut so we could actually not get in trouble, right? 
So. so let's talk about some of the data we've collected to date and some of the analysis techniques. So first let me uh, talk about uh, uh, a concept known as modal analysis, right, going through and trying to increase uh, <clears throat> the sensitivity of the test setup. Like I said, we're trying to get to uh, one one hundredth of a wavelength of light. Uh, so this is one of the techniques that helps us get uh, way down in the resolution on uh, the uh, trying to detect some type of a signal. <coughs> so what you see here is a, um, uh, a synthetic series of images to go through and uh, calibrate the, uh, the algorithms. We've got uh, an interference pattern. Uh, you kind of see a, a close-up of the top left of the image. Uh, uh, optically to our eyes, we don't see a, a significant difference, but there is a difference between the, the, the two. And so there's a, an undulating uh, roll of these things. We have about uh, a thousand images that, are, that were stripped to, uh, stitched together to go through and simulate uh, the scenario of turning a device on and off as a function of time uh, and going through and gathering statistical data and then using uh, uh, some DFTs and some FFTs to go through and uh, characterize what are the different, different signals that we're seeing uh, uh, in the data. And so what you see, and so this is about uh, almost one one hundredth of a wavelength of light in terms of um, uh, the input signal we're putting into the algorithms. And so on the bottom right you see uh, the, um, <clears throat> the output from the analysis algorithms that goes through and shows that what it, when it looks at this data and does the, uh, uh, the analysis and then spits out the, uh, the Fourier series, uh, you see some, uh, uh, some very uh, strong energy here uh, in the Fourier series expansion, and then you see some uh, uh, small amount of energy over here at the, the Nyquist frequency. And you could potentially see, in, in the real world, you could see some uh, harmonics as well in terms of multiples of the uh, uh, one-fifth of Nyquist frequency. Uh, <coughs> so this was kind of our way of making sure that the, uh, the software uh, does what, it, uh, what we want it to do. It, go, it can see uh, some kind of a change uh, in the interference pattern, and it'll report that in the, uh, uh, the modal analysis of the data. So this is looking at um, <clears throat> some real data, uh, going through and doing a, a 2D DFT of uh, a portion of the, the data. So you see here on the left, uh, this is an interference pattern from the, from the rig. Uh, and if we go through and take this 128 by 128 window, and we do a 2D DFT conversion of it, uh, we get this complex representation of the information. Uh, now, it's, this is useful for us because we can go through and we can sample a small region of this complex representation of the image and we can squash all these other variables uh, down to zero so that, that eliminates a lot of other unwanted noise. Uh, and then we can go through and we can take that and convert that back into its uh, original uh, configuration, but it's now picked up some complex values because we uh, went through and modified uh, uh, this representation of it. And so the complex values will have the, uh, the phase angle uh, associated with uh, that particular, uh, 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 in this case, that particular pixel. <coughs> so we, uh, we decided to go through and take a look at uh, just one pixel to start with uh, for some data. So here, what you, this is uh, what we would call the reference data. So this is uh, a single patch, single pixel modal analysis with a test device off, kind of a reference, right, when nothing's going on. This is what the spectrum looks like. And so you'll notice a little difference from the, <clears throat> uh, the previous slide where we've picked up a lot of, uh, we picked up a lot of noise here uh, in the spectrum. So all these other terms in the Fourier expansion have uh, non-zero exponents. And that has to do with whether it's air handlers or whether it has uh, some oscillation in, in the laser intensity or uh, some vibration or somebody walking down the hallway or, you know, the waves in Galveston Bay, right? Um, <clears throat> So we can go through and, and exercise the device uh, with a known uh, turning on and turning off uh, periodicity uh, and sample the imagery with a known sampling rate. <clears throat> and so here we see, just looking at the single pixel uh, with a test article, test article cycled on and off uh, at uh, a quarter hertz, it's about four seconds. And then taking uh, uh, images every two and a half hertz or uh, at a two and a half hertz rate uh, over uh, around 3,150 uh, samples. Uh, so we should be, we'll be looking for uh, any kind of a change in the spectrum uh, associated with uh, uh, the Nyquist frequency or some multiple of one-fifth of the Nyquist frequency. Uh, and so looking at this particular data, you see that there's a little bit of a bump 
at uh, uh, around 600 hertz. So you might say, hey, that's kind of exciting. However, uh, when we go back uh, to the test device off, you see that that's there. So that's just part of uh, something in the environment, uh, whether it's something in the air handling equipment or something. Uh, so just taking a look at uh, a single pixel of the image uh, and going through and gathering 3,100 some odd samples, uh, we don't necessarily see anything that we're looking for here. Now, one of the concerns we had is that we're just looking at a single pixel, so maybe that's you know not sufficient. We want to try and sample uh, more of the image. Uh, so we uh, also went through and looked at um, taking more data uh, across the image at different locations and trying to build a, a better statistical representation of anything that's going on. <clears throat> so here we have, uh, uh, again, cycling the test article on and off uh, every four seconds, uh, capturing a frame every quarter second, and uh, around just a little over 3,100 samples. Um, and then we're looking at the, uh, uh, a much larger cross-section of the image. We're looking at uh, 88 points uh, throughout the image plane, uh, trying to get a better representation of the information. So this is the uh, reference baseline. Uh, this is with the test article off. Uh, the one thing you'll notice is that by taking uh, more data, more samples across the uh, image, um, we're getting a lot more statistical data, uh, and so we're beating down uh, some of the noise, so the spectrum looks a little cleaner. <coughs> and so anything, this right here is just a little over that Nyquist frequency, so everything on this side is a mirror image of everything on that side, so you can see everything on this side is just a complex conjugate of that. So this is with the device uh, always off. Uh, and this is with the device uh, cycled, as we mentioned. Uh, when you look at the spectrum close up, uh, there is some small energy we pick up uh, uh, in a couple spots in the spectrum that's a, a multiple of the Nyquist, that's gonna be one fifth the Nyquist frequency. So we're seeing a little bit of energy uh, appear uh, in some of the Fourier series uh, that was not there uh, with the device off. Uh, so that's some interesting uh, findings, but uh, certainly not conclusive. Uh, we wanted to go through and do some additional work uh, with trying to put, instead of run, running the beam through the bore uh, of a test article, uh, we wanted to go through and actually put a very large potential field directly in the beam path. Um, in a perfect world, you'd like to be able to stick, in this case, the ceramic capacitor directly in the beam path, but it's not transparent, so you have to try and find a different way to do that. Uh, so we established a very large uh, uh, air capacitor, an air dielectric, so we uh, set up a very large potential field uh, directly in the beam path uh, around uh, 20,000 volts. Uh, and so you kind of see the, the, the setup that we had to try and establish the, the large potential field uh, directly on the, uh, the beam path. <coughs> and then we cycled it uh, in a similar fashion um, uh, to go through to gather some statistical data. And so this is the, uh, the test results uh, with the device always off. Uh, so this is what the spectrum looks like. It's uh, uh, not quite as many samples as the, uh, the, the previous data set, um, just a little over uh, 750 almost. And this is the change in the spectrum uh, with the device being cycled. Uh, so you see the Nyquist frequency at uh, 369.5. Uh, then we see uh, some potential energy uh, around uh, one-fifth of the Nyquist frequency. Um, so let me go back and show you. There's also a change in the characteristics of uh, the frequency uh, uh, in the 300 to 400 range. So there is a little bit of change there uh, as we turn the device, uh, we go through the process of cycling. Uh, we pick up uh, uh, something interesting, uh, but again, not definitive. It could still be uh, just noise. <clears throat> so in parallel with us, uh, we have a, uh, a sister lab up at South Dakota State University, uh, Dan Neelick. Uh, was, uh, did a summer term uh, in our lab while we were setting up the interferometer. Uh, and so he went back to South Dakota State uh, and also set up uh, a, a duplicate uh, uh, experimental approach to what we were doing, uh, but using some different uh, analytic techniques. So this is uh, his experimental setup. Uh, you've got uh, very similar to what we have. Uh, you've got the, the laser, the, the, the beam splitter, uh, and then he's got his uh, detector uh, over there on the right. I see a close-up of the test device, uh, very similar to what we have. I think he even has the exact same uh, uh, barium titanate ceramic capacitors there embedded uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the test article there. 
So you see a reference uh, interference pattern from running his device. Uh, now he did things uh, a little differently. He, uh, he looked at um, how does the fringe change uh, as you charge and discharge the device. So he specifically focused on the charging and discharging portion uh, of the test device in terms of what happens uh, to uh, the interference pattern. And uh, the technique that he used in terms of the data we're fixing to look at is he used a subtraction technique. So just to describe to you, if you have an image uh, that it's a, it's a piece of digital information, it's a matrix of numbers uh, that represent the intensity on a pixel by pixel basis. Uh, and so he takes the uh, one image and then the next subsequent image, he can go through and subtract that subsequent image from the first one. And so what happens if there's no change whatsoever, uh, then the, uh, the matrix that results in the subtraction is zero. So the average intensity of the difference between the two would be zero. Uh, so if there's some change in the interference pattern from one frame to the next, then that would be represented as a non-zero difference. Uh, so that's kind of the technique he's using for this first analysis approach uh, where he's going through and taking uh, difference images uh, sequentially as he runs through the process of uh, uh, charging up and discharging uh, the test article. So we're going to be looking at some plots from uh, around 2,200 data points. Uh, each point represents uh, 20 separate uh, uh, data points. Uh, and so he's got uh, a reference baseline uh, and then a, a, a series of data for charging and then a series of data for discharging the, the test article. Uh, so what you see here on the top, <clears throat> this, is the, uh, this is the process that, uh, this is the baseline. Right? There's, uh, it's very stable. There's no changing as a function of time, which is what you want to see for the control. Uh, now, when you look at the subtraction method for the charging cycle going from uh, 0 to 19,000 volts, uh, you see that there is a change uh, in, uh, the, uh, in the data uh, that's being processed by the algorithm. Uh, you can look at the slope here, and the slope is about uh, almost an order of magnitude uh, higher than the uh, uh, slope associated with the baseline. Uh, the Discharging similarly also has uh, uh, a changing slope here, so there's something going on in the information. So there, there is a change in the information as a function of time, and that too is similarly about uh, an order of magnitude higher uh, than the baseline. <coughs> so this potentially could be some indications of one of the threads we wanted to pull on, which was the dependency of the energy optimization of DFDT. Right, one of the techniques to reduce the uh, amount of energy that's required uh, was to go through and change the topology uh, of, the, uh, of the ring that we were talking about. Uh, and then the second thing is to go through and establish a very large varying potential DFDT. Uh, so uh, curious enough, this might potentially be uh, some initial indications, but uh, uh, definitely not definitive. Um, he went through and did some additional analysis to go through and, and more directly uh, quantify if indeed the, f the, the interference pattern is shifting around as a function of charging and discharging the device. Uh, so we went through and looked at doing a, a Huff transform uh, where he went through and looked at the image and then uh, uh, looked at how the interference lines were moving relative to one another. So you kind of see the, uh, uh, the, the lines as recognized by the algorithms uh, relative to uh, an origin. Uh, and then he looked at all the data to figure out are those lines really moving uh, or not. And so the <coughs> What he finds is that uh, there is uh, a, a pixel per frame value for the charging and discharging uh, that is uh, uh, larger than for the reference baseline. So there is uh, some movement of the uh, interference pattern in the process uh, associated with charging and discharging the device. <coughs> so, let's see how I'm doing on time. In terms of some of the additional things that we're trying to do uh, to um, uh, increase our, our sensitivity, we talked about one one hundredth of a wavelength, right, and that's, that's fairly challenging, and I think we're getting right at that value now, uh, but one of the things we want to look at is also doing image averaging. However, one of the challenges associated with that is this image is fairly repetitive, right? There's not a lot of distinguishing characteristics, uh, and so just like it would be hard for you to be able to correlate one image from one to the other uh, uh, based on our optical capabilities. Uh, computer algorithms would have some challenges with it. And then you run into the question of, in the process of trying to register image to image, if there's some vibration you're trying to get rid of, and then you average those, are you actually losing information? 
Uh, so it's one of the things you have to be very careful about in, in terms of doing image averaging. Uh, you could potentially smear out the very data you're trying to tease out of the noise. Uh, but uh, there are some software algorithms that are out there that are used in astronomy. And so just to show you, uh, if you look <coughs> uh, here, there's some dust motes. Uh, when we go through and run them through some uh, image averaging software, you can see that the dust motes become a, a little bit uh, uh, more pronounced. Uh, so that's potentially one technique we're looking at trying to increase uh, the sensitivity of the test setups that we're using. Now the other thing we're looking at, uh, George Katsopoulos was a uh, graduate student with us this summer from the International Space University. Uh, and he came up with the idea of adapting a Fabry-Perot interferometer uh, to go through and try and do some work with uh, uh, trying to measure the, the uh, change in the beam path length. Uh, and so what you see here is a schematic of how a Fabry-Perot interferometer works. It's a little different from a, a Michelson. Uh, you've got a distributed source here uh, that comes into what's called the uh, etalon. And so the etalon are two mirrors that are uh, 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 in close proximity that take that uh, incoming beam and it bounces back and forth many times uh, between the mirrors and then is sent to the detector. Uh, and so the, the, the benefit of this is, is like image averaging uh, where the constructive and destructive interference is reinforced. Um, it's like image averaging without software and you're not losing information. Uh, so you see here on the left, this is what an interference pattern might look like in a Michelson from a sodium source. Uh, but if you look at the same uh, interference pattern uh, on an etalon, you see this, uh, this double ring structure, and that's representative of the, uh, the doublet, the, the fact that there's atomic structure uh, in sodium. So there is the potential with the Fabry-Perot that we can break the 1 100th of a wavelength uh, and get down uh, to uh, maybe uh, less than that. Uh, and so here we've got uh, some initial uh, process of getting used to running the, the Fabry-Perot interferometer will be, <coughs> this is the Fabry-Perot interferometer right here. This is a laser source. Uh, we'll eventually put a test article and embed the Fabry-Perot interferometer directly uh, in the bore of the test article. Uh, and then this is the time of flight uh, experiment. This is a different way to measure the phenomena. So the interferometer is trying to go through and measure uh, a change in optical path length uh, by looking at how the interference pattern has changed. Uh, this would be looking at uh, uh, seeing if there's a change in how long it takes a photon to run through uh, a, a, little, uh, a little course of mirrors. And so you see we've got uh, a laser source here. We run that through a modulator, and so it's like a, a, an electric uh, chopper, and it creates a light pulse that comes out. Uh, it splits the light pulse. Uh, one light pulse goes to one detector, the other light pulse runs through the, the racetrack here and goes to the detector. And so you would have a start and finish associated with the device off, and then you could run the same test with the device on and see if there's some change in the time it takes a photon to run through that, uh, uh, that course. So it's a different way uh, to measure the data. So in the process of trying to explore this, you want to make sure you don't get any false positives. So this is just a different way to try and explore it to see if you're seeing uh, similar characteristics. Uh, so this is a picture of the time of flight facility. Uh, we've got the two uh, optical detectors there. There's the uh, chopper that's there with the laser source, and it runs through the, the mirrors here. And we can expand and contract the, uh, the beam length uh, as appropriate. <coughs> so moving forward, uh, so we've got two separate labs that have been working on this. Uh, uh, and I think uh, we've got some potential non-null results uh, intriguing um, uh, in two different uh, interferometer setups using uh, three different uh, analysis techniques uh, that do indicate a potential change in beam path length, uh, uh, a little bit more uh, intensity with the DFDT. Uh, however, these results are uh, far from conclusive and it's uh, way too early to, to say anything definitive. And so we'll, uh, we'll be continuing to investigate uh, uh, this with some additional techniques and some software approaches. Uh, so in terms of the what we call our low fidelity approach, just uh, not pulling on the D, not pulling on the DFDT thread. Uh, we'll continue to work with larger data sample sets to try and decrease the effect of vibrational noise, uh, and then we will um, uh, develop test articles uh, with longer regions of optical influence. So instead of just a single ring, maybe we'll have uh, ten rings. Uh, so we'll have a, a much longer tube uh, that would increase the magnitude of the effect potentially by an order of magnitude. So just like we're trying to get down to below one one hundredth of a wavelength. Another approach is to increase the magnitude of the effect uh, by an order of magnitude. Uh, again, using image averaging, uh, and then uh, certainly we want to go through and explore what, we'll, what, what the capabilities we can have with uh, using the Fabry-Perot interferometer with some software. 
Uh, now, what we really want to pull on is we want to pull on the, uh, uh, the DFDT dependency in our future test articles. Uh, we, um, we've seen some hints that uh, that may be, uh, we might have seen some indications of that in the lab. Uh, now, the, the unforeseen intersection of some of the work that we're doing was the fact that there is this dependency on DFDT from the energy optimization analysis uh, and uh, also the need for uh, negative vacuum energy. Um, so both of these characteristics are present in another line of technology we're working on called uh, Q thrusters. Uh, so let me talk about those now. Uh, now, in terms of moving forward, we'll want to try and adapt uh, some of the physics to guide some construction of test articles uh, that we would put into some of the different uh, uh, experimental setups we have to see if we can't uh, increase the magnitude of the effect. So let me talk a little bit about Q thrusters and help you understand where we are with those and why we're uh, uh, encouraged with the physics models and the data we've collected to date with those. Now, a Q thruster is a form of electric propulsion, much like a, say, you know, a Hall thruster is a form of electric propulsion that has a, a, a low thrust, uh, but a, a very efficient uh, system. But in this case, a Q thruster works off the principle of pushing off the quantum vacuum. Now, a mental analog for this is to think about a submarine that's in the water. Uh, it has a propeller on the back. It doesn't uh, carry a big tank of seawater and then push that seawater out the back uh, to generate uh, momentum. It just uses the propeller to couple with the, the medium that it's embedded in. Uh, similarly, with the a Q thruster, it pushes off the quantum vacuum. Uh, we use the tools of magneto hydrodynamics to uh, model uh, this interaction. Uh, so the quantum vacuum pushes off the, uh, the sea of virtual particles that pop into and out of existence. I think Richard gave a, a good uh, primer for me this morning about you know, what is the quantum vacuum? We know from quantum mechanics that the quantum vacuum is not empty. It's full of these virtual particles that pop into and out of existence. Um, <clears throat> now, the idea of pushing off the quantum vacuum is not new. I certainly am not the first person to come up with it. It's been in the literature for uh, many decades. Um, however, the magnitude of the force has been uh, one of the principal obstacles uh, to be able to try and use this in any manner for exploration that we would think about. Uh, now, some of the work we've been doing with some of our theoretical models uh, and some of the experimental data suggest that we uh, are potentially getting this technology where it could be useful for, in our case, human spaceflight. Uh, we've got some data that shows that uh, we've got some uh, uh, good experience in the 0.1 to 1 newtons per kilowatt, uh, and then we've got some experience in the uh, a little bit over 10 newtons per kilowatt. Now, as part of an additional validation of some of the stuff that we're doing, uh, you know, you can also go through and compare your physics models to known data uh, that's been collected uh, over the centuries. Uh, we know the gravitational constant to an exceeding high value. Uh, we know the Bohr radius of the hydrogen atom to exceeding high value. And so the models that we have uh, predict uh, a Bohr radius of 5.29 times 10 to the minus 11th exactly. Uh, similarly, they uh, predict uh, an electron mass of 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31st kilograms. So that's encouraging uh, that we can reproduce those numbers as part of the mechanism, excuse me, the models that uh, underlie the construction of a cube thruster. Now, what you see here is uh, an experimental setup that we use to go through and measure uh, the force uh, generated by some of the test articles that we're working with in this quantum vacuum plasma thruster. Uh, there's a vacuum chamber uh, that's over here on the left, uh, the support rack that's here, and then this goes through and shows the sensitivity of the system. Uh, we've got this low thrust torsion pendulum here, uh, liquid metal contacts, uh, so there's no cables that go across the interface, uh, uh, optical displacement measurements, so there's nothing that touches the torsion pendulum. We want to make sure we isolate it in every way possible from the environment. Uh, this particular, you see a, just a test article that's in there with a Faraday cage shielding around all the support equipment. Uh, this goes through and shows the sensitivity of the device. We can measure down to single digit micronewtons real time without any uh, signal averaging. Uh, just to put that in context, you know, six micronewtons is if I were to cut the antennas off a mosquito and put them on a scale. So fairly sensitive. We can actually see the, the, if it's a windy day, we can actually tell you because we pick up the change in the seismic environment from uh, the waves in the, the, the bay. Uh, you kind of see a portfolio of some of the different test devices we've worked, worked with over the years. We've got uh, a good amount of experience uh, with uh, working in a, uh, from the uh, 100 to a few thousand micronewtons. Uh, the specific force values, certainly in the, the 0.1 to 1 newton per kilowatt range. Um, we just finished uh, some testing here on the left. Uh, we had a guest device in from uh, industry, uh, and uh, we were asked to go through and evaluate that with some of our uh, partner agencies. Um, <clears throat> and so that test experience, we were able to, uh, 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 after we did everything to try and eliminate any other source of thrust, 
uh, generate 20 to 110 micronewton thrust pulses with a thrust to power ratio of around 1 to 20 newtons per kilowatt. Uh, and then we've got some additional testing we'll be doing in the future, trying to work uh, at very high uh, RF frequencies. Uh, matter of fact, when I get back on Monday, we have test articles waiting for us to get busy. Uh, in terms of different applications for some of the numbers I've been throwing at you, what does 0.1 newton per kilowatt mean uh, for space exploration? What does 10 newtons per kilowatt mean for space exploration? And you kind of see some of the things that we've been thinking about, and I'll back this up with some of the mission analysis we've been doing to try and understand the value proposition. Um, uh, 0.1 newtons per kilowatt is on the bottom there. It's going to be predominantly associated with in-space propulsion. Uh, and then when you get to 10 newtons per kilowatt, you can come up with some additional approaches uh, that uh, might be useful. Um, uh, but certainly, uh, from our perspective, 0.1 newtons per kilowatt is uh, potentially a little easier from a technology perspective. Uh, and I think we've got uh, a good indication of the value proposition for 0.1 newtons per kilowatt. So I'm going to talk about some emission analysis that we had. Uh, Udravov Pika, another International Space University student that was with us uh, this summer, uh, using Copernicus. Copernicus is a trajectory analysis tool that's used uh, across the agency, a uh, very high fidelity analysis tool. And so we went through and looked at modeling uh, some different missions using a uh, effectively a single heavy lift, a 90-ton spacecraft, uh, 50 tons of cargo. Um, it's got two megawatt power, two, two megawatts of nuclear power uh, at 10 kilograms per kilowatt. So for folks that are versed with nuclear reactors, that's not overly exotic. That's just we know what's necessary to go make a, uh, that kind of a reactor. Uh, and then uh, uh, 20 tons associated with uh, uh, the propulsion system uh, in terms of you know 10,000 of these little. Uh, Q thrusters bolted to a board for uh, a, the least elegant way of trying to scale it up. <clears throat> uh, so looking at uh, Mars mission, uh, we can potentially, with this uh, single heavy lift vehicle, it could do a, a low thrust trajectory to Mars at 0.4 newtons per kilowatt on a pretty reasonable time. Uh, and with a, Now the 70 day stay is just arbitrary just to try and understand uh, uh, closing the mission. So the return trip's a little long, 110, it might be good just to go ahead and expand the stay. but. Uh, Four newtons per kilowatt is a little better. I'm running low on time, so let me cruise through here. Uh, we wanted to look at all the destinations in the solar system for this same spacecraft. So it's 50 tons of cargo, 20 tons power, 20 tons propulsion. Uh, a mission to Jupiter, and these are all capture. We're not flybys. So you accelerate halfway and you decelerate halfway. Uh, you got the transit times uh, pretty reasonable for the 0.4 newtons per kilowatt. You're starting to see some benefit for the four newtons per kilowatt. Going all the way out to the outer solar system to, <coughs> excuse me, Neptune, it's uh, 492 days. You're starting to get to the limit where the 0.4 newtons per kilowatt is uh, either you need more power or you need to do something different. The 4 newtons per kilowatt can still do that within transit times associated with DRA 5.0. Uh, and then Pluto, uh, of course, it's around almost uh, 50 AU. Uh, and then we also wanted to look at uh, the JPL, uh, Interstellar Precursor, 1000 AU, uh, with uh, this same spacecraft uh, at uh, 0.4 newtons per kilowatt. That's uh, 5.6 years to get out to 1000 AU. Uh, Voyager 1 is at uh, 120 astronomical AU, uh, and it's been taking it a little over 30 years, so it's a, a potentially a, a good improvement for robotic exploration. Uh, and then we did do a trajectory analysis for an interstellar mission, so this is um, just with the Q thrusters. Uh, so uh, in terms of, and this is capture, this is accelerating and decelerating halfway. Uh, at 0.4 newtons per kilowatt, we're just a little over 122.5 years. I think the important thing is that uh, Copernicus, we didn't realize this, but we worked with Caesar and Campu at uh, University of Texas, uh, and Copernicus can natively handle uh, galactic coordinates, so you can actually put in any galactic destination and it will actually be able to solve for a trajectory. Uh, so it was kind of a useful finding. Um, now I'm going to kind of finish with this. <clears throat> this is a little bit of life imitating art. Uh, so as part of trying to uh, uh, take some of the findings uh, from the last couple of years and try and uh, uh, articulate that in a, in a visual way. Uh, I worked with uh, Mark Rademacher and Mike Akuda to go through and update some historical artwork uh, from the 60s. So this is a concept uh, from, that was made by Matthew Jeffries. He's the guy that came up with the familiar look and feel uh, of the Enterprise. Uh, he also had this concept and I think uh, Gene Roddenberry was kind of fond of it. Uh, but you can see there's a few things that might be wrong with it from uh, uh, the things I just talked about. The rings are very thin, so they're going to require an enormous amount of exotic matter to work. Uh, but more importantly, the fenning region that's formed, the warp bubble that's formed as a result of these two rings would be kind of like a hot dog shape. Uh, so when they turn on the warp field for this spacecraft, it would cut the bridge off here on the front, and the bridge would go floating away, and Scotty would be in a lot of trouble. 
Now this is an update of the little, uh, the concept working with the uh, microcomputer Mark Radar Maker, uh, where we go through, and the rings are much more athletic in this case. This is, you know, just going through and articulating the physics. Uh, the rings are considerably thicker. Uh, and then the spacecraft, instead of sticking out, uh, is well within what would be considered the fending region, so all the bits are, are where they need to be. Uh, and it's a lot fuller. You're not going to waste this space. It takes energy uh, for both the thickness of the bubble and the radius of the bubble, so you'd fill it with uh, everything you could. And then <clears throat> the important thing is, based on the, the work I did in 2003 to put the uh, Alcubierre metric into canonical form, you still have to have a main propulsion system. Uh, so here, you know, we're still going to need some form of propulsion that's going to provide an initial velocity that helps uh, uh, the process work. So I, I think in, in terms of a good intersection, I want to go off what Kelvin was saying yesterday, right? Uh, we, some of the propulsion systems that we're looking at for uh, even the longer missions, uh, we're still going to need propulsion systems for the idea of a space warp in terms of uh, based on the work I did in 2003. Uh, so in some ways, maybe this could be like a retrofitted version of something that Kelvin designs, right? So, um, and then with that, I think uh, I'll just go ahead and finish. I think I've used up all of my time. Well, um, unfortunately, we don't have any time for questions. I'm really sorry, but he should be available afterwards. So if you guys want to ask him a question, feel free. So um, our next speaker is um, Dr. Eric Davis, my personal mentor. Um, he is a senior research physicist at the Institute for Advanced Studies at Austin. He's an image really amazing scientist. So, uh, and his talk will be faster than light space war. What's it all about? So, um, please give him a warm welcome, everyone. Thank you. Today I'm going to give you a tour. It's going to be very brief because usually a topic like this is so complex it could take me up to an hour to really give you the, uh, the full Monty on uh, faster than light propulsion. Um, let's begin. So this is the outline of what I'm going to be talking about in brief. I'm only going to touch some of the more salient, important features that uh, you should know about, including the work that we're doing at Earth Tech International, or the Institute for Advanced Studies, which is our think tank. Uh, before I get started, I want to take you on a, a two-slide lecture, because I'm going to make you guys uh, warp drive specialists in just two slides so you can understand how you can go faster than light without going faster than light. First, we start with the causal structure of space-time according to Einstein. In 1905, Einstein's special theory of relativity was designed in flat space-time according to Minkowski, Lorentz, and Fitzgerald, and Einstein, and others. Basically, uh, Einstein's special relativity theory said that uh, no material objects can reach or exceed the speed of light. The speed of light is the absolute universal speed limit, and that is correct. That also establishes uh, the causal structure of space-time in a flat space. And uh, how do we define a causal structure? Well, we do it with something called a light cone. Uh, this is a really nice representation of the causal structure of space-time. What you can imagine first is to establish an axis in the vertical direction, which we identify as the time axis. Uh, the future is forward, and the past is downward on this axis here. And then perpendicular to that axis is a space axis. And then draw a line, it doesn't matter which side, this side or this side, but draw a line that's 45 degrees between the space and time axis. And the slope of that line represents the speed of light. Now, revolve that whole thing 360 degrees, and that 45 degree line and the space and time axis will sweep out two cones of revolutions, which we call the light cone. And in the future direction that I was showing you going up will be the future light cone, and the past direction down along the time axis is the past light cone. And the intersection of those two at the apex is where the observer's now, or their present, is. And this plane that was swept out by the space axis that was rotated, that's your hyperspace of the present. And what should be noted is that uh, because all material objects are limited, to traveling less than the speed of light, moving less than the speed of light, they have to remain within their light cone. They can only stay inside that light cone, and anything on the outside of that light cone in this direction, which is called the space-like direction, is forbidden because 
This requires speeds that exceed the speed of light. These are, this is the region where things move faster than light, and they're forbidden because no such things exist other than the hypothetical tachyon particles which haven't been definitively discovered yet. So this is the forbidden region of motion. This is the allowed region of motion. And the totality of the history of your events and your emotion and your motion uh, through time from the past through your present to your future is called the world line. And because you have to stay within your light cone, you're restricted to moving on what's called the time-like world line. And that's an allowed motion for anything that's moving at relative rest up too close to the speed of light. You know, maybe just a small fraction away. Okay, so this is an allowed world line along the time-like direction. We call that a time-like world line, and that's allowed. Now, the reason why we call that a light cone is because I, I skipped a part here. Uh, everything that lives on the surface of these light cones are massless, and they generally move at the speed of light. And the things that move at the speed of light in this universe are known to be light beams, electromagnetic radiation, light rays, photons. Um, there's not much else that we know of. Neutrinos do not qualify because they do not uh, move the speed of light. Um, anyway, so basically, uh, light-like world line are the motions of light rays or electromagnetic radiation on the surface of the light cone. All right, so in special relativity theory, or in Minkowski flat space-time, all the light cones of every event and every observer are pretty much lined up in the same direction. All their futures are in the same forward direction up, and all their past are in the same downward direction. So any world line, a time-like path connecting different observers or different events would follow this kind of a path, and this is allowed. And this is an allowed motion. And you notice how the observers or events lie within the light cone, so they're not exceeding the speed of light. So this is an allowed motion connecting these events together. This is a forbidden motion. It is not allowed because it's faster than light and we don't have anything that goes that fast. Okay, well in 1915, Einstein derived the general theory of relativity and he upended all that. And he upended all of it because uh, general relativity replaces Newton's laws of motion and Newton's law of gravity with forces and accelerations that are replaced by curve or warp space time. What you feel is a force the drop of, of a mass being pulled by the Earth's gravity is not really a force. It is a gradient in the curvature, change in the, in the Earth's uh, space-time geometry. And that changing in, uh, and that, that curving or warping of space-time will tilt light cones. So here's an example. Here's the Earth's mass. And so basically the mass is uh, placed on top of a flat grid, uh, grid line of space-time. And you see how the mass is bending space-time around it. Much like a, a stiff rubber sheet, you're going to put a bowling ball or a heavy lead ball on a stiff rubber sheet and it's going to dent, indent the sheet like that. And of course, uh, rotating masses also uh, warp space-time. They drag space-time around with them. But anyway, uh, special relativity theory is built into Einstein's general theory in that we still have light cones, but the light cones are not universally fixed anymore. They are now locally fixed. That means they can be tilted. Uh, light cones of causality are no longer fixed for all observers. Some light cones can be tilted over with respect to others. Therefore, relative, uh, relative faster than light motion is allowed. So let me show you how that works. Now let's go back to that uh, original light cone drawing, and I'm going to use this schematic here. This would be the time axis going forward to the future, and down is to the past, and this is the forbidden space-like motion in this direction. And here's a, here's a fixed observer right here, or an event. And so his, he's roughly lined up with the time direction. And then here's another observer. And then notice that these arrows are indicating curved space time. Space is being bent in the direction of the arrows, like this. OK. Well, this particular uh, event here is tilted. Uh, he's tilted roughly at 45 degree angle with respect to the first guy. That means that this guy looks like he's moving nearly at the speed of light with respect to this guy. But is he? He's not moving at the speed of light or nearly the speed of light. Notice that the direction of his time axis is this way. He's still moving within his local uh, light cone. His light cone is locally arranged so that his time axis goes that way, so he's not moving faster than light. Or, I'm sorry, he's not moving at the speed of light. But this gentleman here, watching him, thinks he is. Now, notice that this uh, fellow here, his light cone is completely tipped over. 
and you notice that the direction of his time axis is going this way. So his future is this way, and his past is that way. And uh, this fellow is looking at him, and he's saying, wait a minute, this guy is moving in a direction that's out in the space-like, the forbidden space-like direction, out this way, and uh, therefore he's moving faster in light. So this guy is moving faster in light. But this guy here, he's, take, he's measuring his, uh, with his rods and clocks, He's moving within his own light cone because his time axis is this direction, so he's in a, an allowed motion in this direction. In his reference frame, he's not moving faster than light. He's moving less than the speed of light. Now, the same thing, uh, this motion is going to be similar for this gentleman here. He's roughly 45 degrees down. His time axis is pointing down this way. And then this gentleman, he's pretty much parallel to the original one, but his time axis is now pointing downwards. The future is going down and the past is going up with respect to that guy. Therefore, this guy is moving in a loud time-like motion. He's going less than the speed of light, but he's moving backwards in time. This guy's undergoing time travel. So that's what warp drives and wormholes do. They warp space in such a way that the light cones of the traveler is tilted over in the space-like direction with respect to the non-traveler, the observers that remote distances away at relative rest. And that's how you go faster than light without going faster than light. Okay, so basically we have two kinds of faster than light space warps that are predicted by Einstein's general theory of relativity. We have warp drives, uh, warp drives and traversable wormholes. Uh, here's the Einstein's general field equation. This is basically 10 nonlinear coupled partial differential equations compactified in this nice notation here. Uh, the right quantity is the stress energy tensor. That encodes the uh, rest ener mass energy density and the pressure and the momentum flux of the matter that's warping the space. Now, this creates the space-time warping here as represented by Einstein's curvature tensor. And this is the coupling constant. That's uh, the universal gravitational constant, and that's the speed of light to the fourth power. And it shows you that this is such a small number. This number is like 10 to the... Uh, negative 40 something, and that means space is very stiff. It's an ultra stiff rubber sheet. It is very difficult to get enough matter uh, encoded in this energy tensor here in order to bend space time enough. It, that's, why, that's why it takes big astronomical bodies like planets and moons and galaxies in order to bend space time. Um, the requirement to go faster in light is, is that we don't decide what kind of matter goes into it. Instead, we design the space-time to the type of space-time that we want. We're going to design a warp drive space-time or a traversable worm, wormhole space-time, and that means we're going to define the Einstein tensor. We're going to design this. And then when we design it, we're going to input it here, and output comes here will be the type of matter we need to build that space-time, and that's called exotic matter. Um, I'm not going to get into where that definition came from, but basically exotic matter really isn't exotic. It's been with us forever. Uh, quantum field theory identifies it and defines it. Uh, nature provides it. Uh, but I'm going to describe more of it later. But basically exotic matter has a nice unique property that it has a negative energy density and flux. Whereas the normal type of matter that we're all familiar with in nature has positive energy density and, and uh, positive flux, and that gives rise to an attractive gravitational force. Uh, exotic matter having negative energy density will have a repulsive gravitational force. All right, so here's the, uh, I'm going to review the taxonomy of faster than light space warps. Here we have traversable wormholes with different connections. Uh, they can connect universes, locations, and times. Here are the different shapes of throats, and here we can have either static or dynamic type of wormholes. Warp drives come in different flavors. We have Alcubierre's original warp drive, Chris Vandenbroek's improvement, then the Krasnikov warp tunnel, and then Notario's uh, warp drive, which is more like a warp bubble that slides through space instead of pulling space in the front and pushing space in the pushing space out the back. And then we have the uh, uh, the D brain quantum uh, quantum gravity version of warp drives by uh, Harold White and myself and then Richard Abuzzi and Gerald Cleaver's extra space dimensional warp drive, and then uh, Hal Putoff, myself, and uh, Claudia McConey have the um, alternative uh, version of a warp drive via the vacuum polarization model of, of gravity. Uh, Alcubierre's basic warp drive is just 
establish this simply this way. You just uh, deploy a negative energy bubble around your starship and the bubble will contract space-time in front of it to bring the target star close and will expand space-time behind it to push the departure location further away instantaneously. And the York time diagram is a great way of showing this. Here you have the volume of space-time that has been contracted toward you and that's what this represents here. And this is the volume of space-time that gets pushed back behind the starship. And you see the starship resides within a flat space. There are no space curvatures here. There's no uh, force of gravitation, gravity acting on the starship. It's in a relatively, uh, it's unaccelerated. And so basically it doesn't experience anything. It's traveling within its local light cone. Okay, it's traveling lower than the speed of light where it's at relative rest in this frame here. Out here, the light cones are tilted over. Okay, that's the whole point. The light cones are tilted over here and here. A traversable wormhole uh, we can view by using a fictitious diagram that was developed by Flam. And basically, this is a, a snapshot in constant time, and the azimuthal angle is taken as pi half. And so this is a two-dimensional radial and cotangent angle. So any ordinary matter uh, that goes less than the speed of light or a light ray can depart uh, point A, travel through normal space-time to reach uh, point B. And the problem is normal space-time will take you, if these are different stars, these could be light years of distance, hundreds to thousands of light years of distance. However, for the case of a traversable wormhole, if you can deploy a thin shell of negative energy and form what's called a throat, you'll have a hyperspace tunnel that's a shortcut between the two locations. This is a three-dimensional tunnel that bypasses that whole long trip, and you could jump right through there to get from A to B in a matter of uh, days uh, or hours or whatnot, and the distance you travel could be anywhere from nanometers to a few hundred feet or a couple of astronomical units, but you'll be jumping between stellar distances very rapidly. This is what a, um, uh, a spherical wormhole throat looks like, and you can see on the other side the image is terribly inverted and distorted. This is, this is the kind of image you get as, uh, when you're looking at a spherical gold Christmas tree ornament. This is a flat face wormhole. This is a wormhole where the negative energy is threaded like a soap bubble across a ring, and basically uh, the negative energy here has an inverse relationship to its radii of curvature. So when the radius of curvature on one side and the other side are flat, uh, would, for a flat face, they're infinite. So uh, since the energy density and the two principal stresses across that soap bubble or that thin shell of negative energy is inversely proportional to the radii of curvature and you have an infinite radii of curvature, then these are zero. That doesn't mean there's no negative energy or stress here. It just means you don't feel it or you, see it, you don't see it. You just jump right through and go on the other side really rapidly. Okay, so now we're going to look at the uh, definition of exotic matter and space warp energetics. The taxonomy of exotic matter is this. This is what we know. We have both theoretical speculations and what we have in the laboratory and in nature on uh, exotic matter. Basically, the yellow objects are observed in nature or they're already observed in the laboratory or we're not able to observe them, but they have measurable uh, effects, or the measurable effects haven't been observed yet because our technology hasn't improved that far. Um, and you can see we have a variety of different casimir vacuum energies that uh, are a form of exotic matter. All right, for traversable wormholes, we're going to take a look at the, uh, the negative energy that's required to produce a short throat spherical wormhole. And uh, you see the negative energy is huge, tremendous. You've got this uh, 10 to the 44 coefficient here, and the total energy is dependent upon the size of the throat. When the throat gets larger, the negative energy gets larger, and this looks really ugly. The same thing, the total energy for, uh, to produce a basic warp drive, still you have that negative 10 to the 44 coefficient, so that's stupendous. Then it's going to depend upon the square of the warp speed, the square of the radius of the warp bubble, and the inverse thickness of the warp bubble wall. So this doesn't look too happy here. And uh, general relativity constrains the warp speed because there's gravitational coupling between the starship mass and the warp bubble. And so therefore you can only reach a maximum warp speed that's dependent upon the mass of the starship, the thickness of the warp bubble, divided by the square of the warp bubble radius. Let's take a look at these numbers. 
For the warp drive, here we have warp drives ranging from 100 times light speed, light speed, all the way down to 10 to the negative 5 times light speed, or 3 kilometers per second. And look at the magnitudes of these negative energies. The negative energies are awful. Uh, at 100 times uh, light speed, you have negative 10 to the 54. And if you're going 3 kilometers per second, you have negative 10 to the 40th. Compare that with the magnitude of the sun's rest energy, 10 to the, roughly 2 times 10 to the 47 joules. That's a lot. Um, but there's hope. In the case of wormholes, what I did is I took the total energy of the short throat spherical wormhole and I divided it by the speed of light squared to give you a mass equivalent so you can see how it looks compared to the mass of the Earth and the mass of Jupiter. You see, for very tiny wormholes that would be impractical for human travel, you're going to have tremendous amount of uh, equivalent negative mass. It's not a negative mass that's there. This is just what the negative energy is converted into is what it looks like as a comparison to these bodies. And then up to 1,000 meters, um, you're going to have uh, almost uh, negative 710 times Jupiter's mass. So that doesn't look so great. However, what looks great is that the Gauss Bonnet Theorem, together with Matt Visser's energy conditions for exotic matter, it turns out that the energy density needed for a wormhole can be made zero and the radial pressure that's required to hold the throat open can approach zero. It can be arbitrarily small. So we only need an arbitrarily small amount of negative energy to hold open a wormhole, and it may not be as bad as what I showed you before. Here's a parametric analysis I did on the energy density of wormhole. It's uh, on the order of the surface gravity inside the throat over the wormhole throat size. So as the throat size gets large, the energy density actually gets smaller, and as the surface gravity inside the throat gets small, the energy density will continue getting smaller. And just note that the surface gravity represents the tidal force that the, uh, that the space travelers will be feeling. They'll be buffeted by tidal forces produced by the negative energy shell as they go through the throat. So that's what the surface gravity represents. Now, if you integrate that uh, negative energy density over the total volume of a wormhole throat of a, of, a, of a shell of negative energy of thickness L, then you see, again, we're going to recover that dependence on the size of the wormhole throat. So if the wormhole throat gets big, then the total negative energy does get large. However, if you can bring that surface gravity down and make it small, then we can bring the total energy, the total integrated energy, and make that small. And in fact, I'm going to go over. Uh, in fact, the um, I'm, I'm going to end up going over. I'm sorry. I'm probably going to end up three, skipping three slides just to get to where I'm going. Um, uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, the surface gravity should be always smaller than 1g. You don't want your astronauts being pulled around inside the throat. So you, if you can make that near 0g, that would be wonderful. You get ne near zero negative energy. Um, Richard Abusi and Gerald Cleaver and colleagues, they used the negative Casimir vacuum in extra space dimensions to produce a warp bubble. Uh, they estimated that the negative energy uh, required was the equivalent mass of Jupiter, so they got that down. In the original Alcubierre implementation, it would take the negative uh, energy equivalent contained in the galaxy to be able to produce a warp drive. However, their universal warp speed is up to 10 to the 32 times the speed of light, which is pretty interesting. Uh, Sunny White basically, at my suggestion, looked at high frequency pulsing of the negative energy generator. Whatever it is that's going to make that negative energy, you're going to pile up that negative energy in very big pulses uh, with short pulse width times, and you're going to rapidly uh, repeat it, and you're going to uh, increase the thickness of the, of the warp bubble. Usually the uh, qu quantum gravity guys have a warp bubble wall thickness that's on the order of the Planck length, that's 10 to the negative 35 meters. We can't engineer that, but we can engineer electromagnetic radiation of electromagnetic radiation wavelengths that we can engineer. Okay, so if we increase that up to electromagnetic wavelengths, uh, then it's becoming very interesting. All of a sudden, your warp, total warp energy requirement drops down to the mass equivalent of the Voyager 1 probe. So that's something we might be able to engineer. Uh, I'm going to skip these because I'm running out of time. <laughs> All right. Detecting and producing negative vacuum energy for constructing space warps. All right. We have some techniques for producing negative energy already in the lab. It's called, quantum it's called quantum light squeezing or vacuum squeezing. 
and you're using quantum optics to uh, use parametric amplification, parametric excitation of laser beams, and you could produce uh, pulses of alternating negative and positive energy. And you'll have to have some mechanism uh, to separate out the positive from the negative energy so that you can accumulate negative energy. Uh, we, we don't know how to do that yet, but we don't know how to scale this up yet either. All we know is that the negative energy produced in a squeezed light state are very feeble. Uh, here's another alternative negative energy using squeezed states of light from multiple photon generators. This hasn't been realized yet. We don't know how to develop a photon combiner to produce a negative beam of energy. Uh, using the Casimir cavity to produce the Casimir negative vacuum energy, uh, it's not worth it. It's, uh, it's too feeble. The negative energy is, is so minute, you'd have to have an astronomical uh, size Casimir cavity to produce anything like a, a traversable wormhole. And then you've got to deal with getting through the plates, which is a barrier. This is an accelerating mirror. It produces a beam of, or a flux of negative energy out front. You'd have to accelerate this thing up to obscene amounts of uh, uh, rate, a uh, high acceleration rate to produce large enough negative energy flux. And unfortunately, you, you really just can't engineer this. It's too feeble. However, Larry Ford at Tufts University recently published a series of papers looking at uh, parabolic cylindrical mirrors, and he discovered with his colleague that these wonderful things can uh, reflect and focus vacuum fluctuations on the focal line of the mirror. And that focal line of the mirror is going to collect uh, negative energy fluctuations. So you're going to have a total negative energy there that Tiffany Frierson herself calculated from their results to be astronomical. They uh, came up with a result that we can have like negative 10 to the 30th joule per cubic meter energy density on the focal line. So that's an area of exploration that uh, we will be undertaking at my lab in the near future. And detecting negative energy uh, has already been done. If you're going to build uh, a negative energy generator to, to uh, deploy a wormhole throat or a warp bubble, you've got to be able to see this. This is like uh, you have to have a receiver and a transmitter. And uh, basically, uh, engineers are going to have to see where this radiation is going. And they can't visualize it any other way. So we're going to have to build a detector to be able to visualize what this negative energy looks like. So these things have already been developed. This is called the balanced homodyne detector. And these were invented over uh, 30 years ago in quantum optics labs. And this is actually an experimental squeezed vacuum state. Now, uh, we envisioned being able to produce negative energy that's static. This is uh, uh, AC negative energy. In other words, you have alternating pulses of positive and negative energy. Well, I want an overwhelming uh, region of negative energy. I want something that makes negative energy static. And I want a detector for that. So we have Piotr Marecki's proposal for a uh, double photodiode uh, detector array, which is a balanced, it's a modified balanced homodyne detector. We'll insert it inside the Casimir cavity and we hope to be able to measure the spatial and frequency dependence of the negative energy zone between the plates of the cavity. And here my coworker Jim Segala has done finite element analysis of what's going on when you insert two nanoprobes, two nanophotodiodes inside the cavity that's one micron separated and the plates are about a millimeter on each side and this is the transverse electric mode and this shows you a little bit of 0.4% uh, perturbation of the modes inside there so it's not really too bad. Um, I'm almost done finally. So uh, constructing FTL space warps, Einstein's general theory of relativity doesn't say a thing about constructing space warps. All he says is if you're going to uh, design space time to your specification, it will tell you what sort of matter you're going to need to design that space time. That's what general relativity field equations tell you, but they don't tell you how to assemble a space warp or a negative energy generator that'll produce the space-time effect you're looking for. So we really don't know how to thread that throat with negative energy density. We can only imagine maybe uh, an array of Ford's fader mirrors lined up in such a way to make a little hole right there for the throat, or maybe an array like this and create a spherical uh, wormhole throat. And for the warp drive, we don't know. Uh, that's still, uh, you know, that's still for future, future work. So basically, the critical technology issues that we're concerned about at EarthTech and the Institute for Advanced Studies at Austin 
is to produce negative energy in large amounts, we need to look at the scalability of present technologies, explore new ways to produce negative energy, scale it up. The Force Vader parabolic cylindrical mirror and advanced laser photonics are really the latest things that look promising in that regard. Detecting negative vacuum energy, uh, we've got our uh, design, experimental design program started on the balanced homodyne detector for the Casimir cavity. Like I said, we're using a Casimir cavity not because we're going to use it to make negative energy for a space warp. We're going to be using it to help us understand how we can make a detector for negative energy, a negative vacuum energy uh, for whatever generators like the Ford Svater mirror. We'll need some kind of balanced homodyne detector device that could take a look at the negative energy that's produced by a Ford Svater mirror, be able to tell us where it is and uh, how we can be able to manipulate it and so forth. Other insights that you can gain are, are by simulating FTL space warps in the lab. Lab experiments can be done by transformational optics and metamaterials. You can create analog gravity where the metamaterial behaves like the warp drive or the wormhole. And an electromagnetic field comes down and that'll be the background space time. And you'll look at what the metamaterial does on the electromagnetic radiation to see if there's any surprises. It'll actually reproduce general relativity uh, pretty well. There's also computational visualizations of the nonlinear dynamics of FTL space times. These are important because you want to take a look at a, a visualization to see are there any surprises when you turn on that negative energy and turn it off? Are there things that might make it worse or might make it better? The last message I want to leave you guys with is the importance of uh, vacuum fluctuation. Negative vacuum energy, just think of this. Vacuum energy classically has, is zero. It's zero energy. Uh, quantum mechanically, it's a zero mean or the average value of a quantum observable is zero. But the reality is, is that the variance of those quantum observables, whether they be time, space, momentum, energy, uh, is not zero. The, vari uh, the variance is some number, and that represents your vacuum fluctuations. Um, we know that we can't, we can't engineer space-time in the form of Einstein's geometry picture, because space, physical space that we go into, like the astronauts do up in orbit, or fly probes through, is not a geometry. It is not of lines, points, and curves. That's not what physical space-time is. Physical space is basically, whoops, sorry about that, I hit the wrong button. Physical space is basically a nonlinear optical medium of the quantum vacuum fluctuations, all the fluctuations that, com that are produced by the forces and matter in nature, in the universe. And basically, if you disturb or polarize those vacuum fluctuations, it turns out that you end up producing general relativistic effects uh, that you see from Einstein's theory, such as the Schwarzschild mass uh, effect, the black holes, um, Faraday effect, and gravitational Faraday effect, lens throwing, and so forth. FTL space warps would be another one of them. So uh, basically, we have this issue when we're talking about producing space warps using negative vacuum energy. We're not talking about engineering geometry. We're engineering vacuum fluctuations. And T.D. Lee said that is the first one who introduced the concept of vacuum engineering. He said, the experimental method to alter the properties of the vacuum may be called vacuum engineering. If indeed we are able to alter the vacuum, then we may encounter some new phenomena totally unexpected. And that's what's important. Um, what I was getting at about negative vacuum energy is that since the vacuum is classically zero energy, if you suppress that vacuum in a local region, then it has less energy than the undisturbed surrounding vacuum. That's what makes it negative. And so what we're really doing is distorting, modifying, or engineering the vacuum fluctuations to produce the space warp. And that's the important carryaway message I want you guys to think about. We're not engineering geometry, we're engineering vacuum fluctuations because the vacuum fluctuations together produce a phenomena that looks like general relativistic effects. And my boss is going to come up right after me and uh, talk about that and more and expand on that. So we're out of time and out of question, no time for questions. So we're going to go right on into, uh, go ahead and end your talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that talk. Um, we've gone over now, so no questions right now. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Howard Putoff. Um, he is the president of Earth Tech International and is the director of the Institute for Advanced Studies in Austin. Uh, great speaker, so let's give him a hand, please. Thank you. 
Well, my colleagues have painted a beautiful landscape of what engineered space time should uh, do for us. I'm the poor engineer in the crowd who's going to come up and say, well, how do we get from here to there? Now, if I do my job correctly, as I go through this presentation on metric engineering, it's basically general relativity for engineers. If I do my job correctly, even those in the audience who are challenged math-wise should be able to walk up to a general relativity professor and talk about some aspects of engineered space-time, and he'd have a hard time keeping up. So let, let's see if, if we can get there. What's the standard general relativistic uh, pedagogy? Well, we're told we have tensor formulations and curved space-time. The mantra is, matter tells space how to curve, space tells matter how to move. And we've had uh, discussions of exactly what that means. If we go into the math of it, matter tells space how to curve. We have a stress energy tensor associated with mass, fields, whatever. And then we have Einstein's curvature tensor that tells us how space gets curved by that mass, energy, and so on. Space tells matter how to move. Well, we solve that equation, and we get the metric coefficients, and then we end up with the general relativistic equation of Newton's law that tells us how matter moves in response to that space curvature. But Houston, we have a problem. These equations are not user-friendly for an engineer. I mean, there's got to be a better way. So the question is, is there a better way? And obviously, I'm here to tell you that there is, and let's see if I can convince you of that. One of the aspects we know about general relativity, we're told that if light is coming from a distant star and happens to graze a large mass like our sun, light is bent. That's just one of the outcomes of the so-called space curvature issue. Well, among engineers, under what other conditions is light bent? Well, we know them uh, easily. Send light through, uh, light rays through a lens, and light is bent. It's not general relativity, but hey, we can bend light that way. So the implication then is that whenever you have a dielectric constant, uh, say in a lens, uh, you can bend light, just like general relativity is telling us that space itself is bending light. So what that means is that we can actually represent space as a dielectric medium with a dielectric constant whose value may change. So for example, if around the sun the dielectric constant is pretty high, then the velocity of light uh, in that vicinity be rather low, and therefore, that part of the wavefront that's uh, going by close to the sun will be traveling rather low, low speed, and that part of the wavefront that's further away will be traveling higher speed. And so this variable dielectric constant of space can give us light bending. Well, is it reasonable to think that the vacuum, in fact, is like a material medium with a variable dielectric constant. In fact, uh, Eric uh, headed us off in that direction. There are papers uh, that uh, speak to this issue. So the bottom line here is that when submitted to stress, for example, by presence of a mass, the vacuum responds via polarization and magnetization of virtual particle pairs, yielding a variable vacuum refractive index effects that are actually equivalent to curved space-time in GR. Now, the nice thing about that is that there's a long history, so we don't have to invent it from scratch. Back when Einstein was working on general relativity, uh, Wilson, astrophysicist, came up with this refractive index version of space and uh, proposed the electromagnetic theory of gravitation, and it was developed on by others. Uh, Atkinson, and I'll talk about him in a minute, uh, actually showed that you could just forget general relativity, replace the vacuum as a variable refractive index medium, and now optical engineers can start thinking about how to design these various uh, space uh, metric engineered 
requirements to meet them. That continues on through the years, gravitational field acting as an optical medium, effective refractive index tensor for weak field gravity, and these days, uh, this is a relatively recent paper, uh, people who are working on gravitational lensing a la GR, in fact, revert to this variable refractive index background as a way of attacking these problems. I and my colleagues uh, have uh, contributed to this as well. A uh, recent paper published in JBiz, there are some copies out on the table out there, uh, basically forms the basis of the material I'm going to be presenting next, so if you want to get details, you can, you can look at, the, at that paper. For the math buffs in the crowd, you start with a Lagrangian like you usually do for any kind of problem and you write out the usual terms, particle density distributions, EM field density distributions, whatever, except that now you're taking into account the fact that you're in a medium that has a variable dielectric constant. And there's so, therefore, there's also a contribution due to the fact that uh, this variable dielectric constant will have its own contribution to the, to the Lagrangian. So, Let's compare PV with Einstein GR. Matter tells space how to curve. All right, well, this may not look like much of an improvement. It's a messy looking equation also. You may have to use a computer to, to, to solve it. But let's look at these terms uh, as we go across. We're talking about things that an optical engineer has no problem with. Here's a ordinary wave propagation of a variable dielectric constant in space. It's affected by the presence of mass, it's affected by the presence of fields, and it's affected by the presence that its own energy density also contributes. So now we're looking at engineering terms that uh, any optical engineer wouldn't have any problem uh, dealing with. And the nice thing is it then leads to our intuitive understanding of exactly what's happening under various conditions, and we'll be talking about that. Space tells matter how to move. Well, now it's looking very friendly as compared to the original GR approach. Uh, we basically have Newton's law, uh, except that we take into account the fact that the refractive index of the vacuum is variable. So where there used to be a general relativistic curvature or gravity, we now understand that there's just a gradient in the dielectric constant of the vacuum, and that leads to uh, effects that we ordinarily associate with gravity or space curvature, however you want to, want to describe it. So if you take those equations and solve them for the simple case of uh, the variable dielectric constant around the sun, it's actually quite a simple solution. And then you run through the standard tests of general relativity, bending of light, gravitational redshift, advance of the Friuli mercury, radar time delays. Using this refractive index model, you get exactly what you get out of GR. Except now, you can use your intuition along the way and actually understand what's happening. In fact, we can make a table of all the effects and uh, use this table to increase our intuitive understanding of, of what does it mean to have uh, space-time curvature uh, and uh, how can we understand the various effects associated with it. So for example, because uh, say in the vicinity of the sun, the dielectric constant of the vacuum goes up effectively, then we get an effective velocity of light that's less than C. Well, that corresponds to the GR statement that as you approach a black hole, as seen from afar, it looks like light stops. We have standard redshift. It just falls out as being, again, uh, dependent only on the fact that the refractive index is changing. Attractive gravity force is now understood as just being a force associated with the variable dielectric constant of space. Well, it turns out that we can now understand what space curvature really means. Let me give you an example that emerges from the fact that objects, even rulers, shrink in accordance with the value of the dielectric constant. So in ordinary space uh, where there's no mass around or whatever, uh, to measure the circumference of a circle, we just run our ruler around, and uh, there we go, we get a value for the circumference. 
We then turn our ruler at right angles and march it in toward the center, and we get our radius. And we find that c is 2 pi r. Now though, let's put a mass here in the center. Run our ruler around, we get a circumference. Now when we turn our ruler at right angles and march in toward the center, because as we march toward the center, the dielectric constant of space is going up, the ruler is shrinking, and therefore the value we get measured for r is too big, or it's bigger than it was, at least up in this case. And we can ask ourselves, well, under what other condition do we see c less than 2 pi r? Well, if you had a cup, and you measured the circumference around the lip of the cup, and then you measured the radius down into the bottom of the cup, uh, you also get c less than 2 pi r. So you really have an alternate way of looking at what space curvature really means because both these approaches give you exactly the same results. Atkinson said it, I think, best, and this is the, my mantra for the engineers in the crowd. It is possible in the one hand to postulate that the velocity of light is a universal constant, to define natural clocks and measuring rods as the standards by which space and time are to be judged, and then to discover from measurement that space-time and space itself are really non-Euclidean. In other words, curved space-time. Alternatively, one can define space as Euclidean and time is the same everywhere and discover from exactly the same measurements how the velocity of light and natural clocks, rods, and particle inertias really behave in the neighborhood of large masses. There's just as much or as little content for the word really in the one approach as in the other. Provided that each is self-consistent, the ultimate appeal is only to convenience and fruitfulness, and even convenience may be largely a matter of personal taste. Well, for the engineers in the crowd, and I consider myself one of the engineers, uh, I find that for convenience, thinking in terms of the variable dielectric constant of space is a much more intuitive approach that then gives us a whole range of ab uh, ability to understand what effects we might expect to see. Well, so far I'm just talking about masses and so on, but of course we're interested in space drives, the kind of space drive that Eric and, and Sonny have already uh, been talking to us about. So for those, what we want to have is a dielectric constant that's been engineered to be less than the usual value. All right, so now we can run through this table, and by the way, if one of these things happens to come by, we can see what you'd expect to see from a very intuitive optical engineering standpoint. First of all, with k less than 1, the effective velocity of light is greater than c. So out of that regime comes our space warps and warp drives. Having the mass decrease, hey, that's not bad. Uh, in place of red shift, we get blue shift, and other things are occurring, like clocks run faster, rulers expand uh, by reversing the gradient, the dielectric constant of the vacuum. Uh, in our engineering, uh, we can get repulsive gravity force to replace attractive gravity force. So let's uh, take a look at what we might expect to see in the vicinity of these engineered space times. And once we digest that, this is what you could walk up to your local general relativity uh, professor and say, well, what do you think would happen under this condition? What would you expect to see under that condition? And chances are, you'll be able to answer the question, but he would, he would have to struggle. <coughs> By the way, just for the uh, GR files in the crowd who might think I'm pulling the wool over their eyes by talking about this polarizable vacuum approach, you can go back and, and, and redo the whole thing in terms of the standard uh, GR nomenclature, so uh, it's, it's all absolutely copacetic. All right, mass. Kappa less than one means the mass of the spaceship is reduced. Inertial mass is reduced. So this thing can flit about and make rapid turns, and it's not a problem. It's also not a problem for the astronauts on board because their inertial mass has been reduced as well. 
And so that's one of the aspects you'd expect to see by a space-time engineered ship that's taking advantage of this reduction in the dielectric constant of the vacuum in the vicinity of the spaceship. There's another aspect that comes right along with it. As it turns out, clocks run faster in this kind of an engineered space-time. So your astronaut gets on board, let's say at noon, uh, 15 minutes later, he get, comes out and he's uh, aged a bit. His time has gone faster. Well, this has an interesting uh, element uh, of, of possible surprise, and that is people on the ground are watching this spaceship flit around, uh, bouncing back and forth, and uh, wondering uh, why aren't these guys getting turned into salsa on the back of the spaceship. Well, of course, we've already talked about the fact that their inertia mass has been reduced as well. But there's another element, and that is, since his time is running faster, when the astronaut looks outside and he sees all these people with their mouths open, uh, watching him dance around the sky, since his clock is running faster, for him, he's just leisurely moving around. It's not a problem. One thing I also meant to <coughs> point out uh, back in this uh, uh, table was that although we talk about velocity being greater than the velocity of light as we see these things fly by, as Eric already pointed out, within the space, clocks are running faster, rulers are expanding, so when he locally measures the velocity of light in a little laboratory on his spaceship that's going faster than the speed of light as far as we're concerned, he measures the velocity of light to be C as usual. So it's still, quote, generally relativistic. Okay, in place of the red shift, we get a blue shift and a very simple expression for it. Well, this has certain consequences of interest. You have radiation coming off the ship. Ordinarily, if the ship was just sitting on the ground, not powered, uh, most of the radiation coming off will be in the infrared uh, and, of course, uh, visible and so on. But when this thing is powered up, you get blue shift. That means the infrared will be shifted up into the visible part of the spectrum. So if the uh, ship is powered up and zooming by, chances are you'll see it be very luminous. And that's what would be expected, and that's what GR predicts. And that's what the refractive index model makes very explicit. But also you don't want to get too close to this thing because you notice the visible light, which is not harmful particularly, can now get shifted up into the ultraviolet and the soft x-ray region and so you could get radiated and have uh, health problems that, that emerge as a result. So if one comes by, I suggest running the other direction. Well, you might ask, what about the astronauts on board? Aren't they going to get fried by this? Well, the answer is no. E equals h bar omega. So energy and frequency shift at the same rate. So when k drops down to give us this blue shift in frequency, it turns out that the energy bonds go up. So the astronaut on board, even though he's bathed in this UV and soft x-ray, his chemical bonds in his body that were a few EV have, could now be tens of EV or even a kilovolt. So in fact, he scales up, so that's not a problem. Another uh, contributing factor to wonderfulness, you might say, is the fact that now that he's in this ultra-hard diamond uh, spaceship with really high energy bonds, the rest of the universe looks like butter to him. So it's not such a problem to run into debris or whatever. So we've seen the warp drive uh, situation described before. <clears throat> now we look at it specifically from the standpoint of this dielectric constant. And using Sonny's uh, values of, let's say, we want C to be 10 times C, uh, as we see it from out here as a ship going by and warp drive occurs, we see that both there's a flat region here where the astronauts on board uh, 
are living in, in normal space as far as they're concerned. It just so happens that their local value of C is 10 times higher. Not that they measure it, of course, because their rods and clocks have changed. They still get C. But from outside, we, we, we see it uh, being that high. And also, by engineering the variation in the dielectric constant to get attractive gradient gravity pulling you along and repulsive gravity pushing you along, uh, then you can engineer this so that you can surf along in space-time. And you can completely understand the entire thing from just an optical engineer's viewpoint of determining exactly what kind of a shape of the dielectric constant of the vacuum do you want to engineer. Same thing for wormholes. If you make a tunnel in space where you've managed to figure out how to reduce the dielectric constant of vacuum so that in that region of space, C is uh, much larger than ordinarily expected as seen from the outside, then you see a spaceship enter that wormhole and pop, he pops out the other side. And you really haven't violated any real physics. As I say, you've only engineered the vacuum dielectric constant to give you the equivalence of all the general relativity predicted phenomena. So just as we've already noted that as you approach a planet or a star, the dielectric constant, when we saw those uh, equations in the polarizable vacuum approach, climbs, and therefore you're going to get a gravitational force which uh, goes as the gradient in, in the slope of that uh, dielectric constant change. Under the right conditions, it turns out uh, in recent Nordstrom type solutions in general relativity where you have strong electric and magnetic fields, uh, you can actually reverse uh, the gradient and therefore end up with uh, a repulsion. It's called electrogravitic repulsion. Uh, this particular paper uh, discusses this electrogravitic repulsion. And so you've got a whole panoply of things that you want to engineer, and you can understand from a very engineering standpoint uh, how to get there. So what are the take-home messages <coughs> from this approach? <coughs> well, first of all, reduced inner time Reduce time interstellar travel either by advanced extraterrestrial civilizations at present or ourselves in the future is not, as naive consideration might hold, fundamentally constrained by physical principles. And we've had two other papers that make that very clear as well. <coughs> the other take home message is that the exotic physics for such can be addressed in engineering terms, metric engineering, by adopting the polarizable vacuum approach as I've described here. So that's my message for the engineers. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Kudal, for that talk. Um, we will now be having a five-minute break. So everyone, if you have to pee or anything, go ahead. And uh, please be back here in uh, five minutes, please.
Mark Mellon, who is the um, president of the Tower Zero Foundation. And he will be giving a speech entitled From Sci-Fi to Sci Method Space Drives. So everybody please give uh, Mr. Miller a round of applause. Thank you. I hope you uh, like my montage of various science fiction vehicles, all of which imply some degree of space drives, meaning uh, control over inertial gravitational forces to move through space without needing rockets. Um, and also the uh, vehicle over there, I have to admit, as a kid growing up, that was like my central uh, icon that I used to uh, start pondering such things. Okay. Okay, um, instead of talking about a specific propulsion method, what I'm gonna do today is talk to you about a process that if you want to uh, toy with these ideas on your own, um, if there's some science fiction thing that you like to do, um, how to go through that process. And in this case, I'm gonna do it in the case of uh, space drives. But when doing this, it's like why science fiction? Well, certainly in, uh, under, uh, has been documented uh, that it's inspirational to scientists and engineers. All of the rocketry pioneers, Tsiolkovsky, Goddard, Ober, von Braun, all of them were inspired by the science fiction of their day. Um, but what's cool about it is the stories show us why we really want these gadgets. So it helps add purpose to what we're doing. Uh, the novelty that is in the stories helps you break from the familiar, which makes it easier to think out of the box, which brings us to that, like the best gadgets, the ones that are the most fun to think about, are the ones that cannot be created just simply by extrapolating what we already know how to do, but the ones where you need to create new discoveries. Um, what's convenient, too, is the images that come from the science fiction kind of make it easier to toy with these things because you don't have to devote mental energy to coming up with, oh, what's this going to look like? You can just kind of use the, what they gave you in the background and then go about your thought experiments as you would. And then also, in the stories, there's very often logical inconsistencies, which helps provoke the reasoning process. Um, <laughs> And no, this is really good because I many times in watching stories I go, wait, that just doesn't make sense, and it pulls you into thinking about it. And you know, it, it, uh, a good part of it too. So I'm first going to play with some notions. You know, the kind of questions you would ask if watching science fiction. And for example, here we have Luke's uh, land speeder, which is somehow magically levitating. And so, well, to try and figure out how is it doing that? Well, what would happen if it ran over something like a frog? Would the frog get squished? Uh, would nothing happen to the frog? Would the frog get caught up and thrown in the levitation? And two, what would happen as it's cruising along if there's objects in the way? Well, clearly, you know, those aren't very high to be of concern, but what about that one? And, well, what about that one? And uh, when you start thinking about these things, you realize, you know, there might be more than one way of thinking about this. So let me show you another way of more than one thinking. In the, uh, the first movie, or I should say the one that happened in 1977, I remember a scene where they're parked up on a cliff uh, overlooking a spaceport and thinking, gosh, I'm wondering why that thing doesn't drift and fall over the edge. And if it did, why would it? Uh, which brings to mind two things. Um, you'll notice that this land speeder in the show, when it's off and no one's in it, it's rigid. You know, it's not moving anywhere. And so how does it get those lateral forces so it doesn't accidentally get blown by the wind? And it says, well, if it has that ability, then why do you need these jet engines? You know, okay, you could do that to propel it. So anyway, um, well, if it fell off the cliff and if its effect was, you know, had something to do with real close to the ground, it would just come crashing, which would be a short end of the story. Or what if that ground effect was really good? Well, then maybe it would fall, but be before it came too close to the ground, it, it wouldn't hit. Or if it was completely levitating, that didn't mean what was underneath it, oh, then it can just continue across. And in that movie, you have no idea what those were. But I am going to show you this is because contemplating those various options helps get you into thinking about dissecting this to come up with ideas. Now, let's say somehow magically he was shielding gravity. Well, in that case, like if he were to park under half of a, um, a carousel here, uh, this side would weigh nothing and this wide side would still have its weight, so it would start spinning faster and faster and faster. And then you have to ask, well, where is that energy coming from? Well, it obviously has to come from this device if it's doing it. Um, so, you know, 
when you start playing with other examples or the examples, if this thing is somehow levitating while he's in it, does that mean that as soon as he pops out, it's going to be flying up because <clears throat> uh, it compensated uh, for his mass being there? So you can have a lot of fun playing with these questions. Um, but the point is, is that once you have those inspirations, you want to move on to the scientific method so you can actually do something with it. And the first step there is to define the problem, to analyze it enough to where you're asking the intelligent questions. And then after you have the intelligent questions, start collecting the data to where you understand what you're dealing with enough to where you can make hypotheses about, well, I wonder if this helps explain it. Test those, learn and iterate, and so on and so forth. Now, the difference between doing this and um, a science for curiosity's sake is you know, science right now, physics, is most interested in the, uh, the fate of the universe, cosmology, um, grand unification, and this puts it into a specific application focus, which then affects how you look at the data. Now, we're looking at the same anomalies of unsolved things in physics, but now we're looking at them from a different point of view, which changes the perspective and how we go about trying to solve them. Okay, now, when, where do you start? Uh, two things I want to point out is here we have the laws of physics as we reliably know them, which are undone. I mean, one thing we've got to remember about science, science isn't just the accumulated knowledge, it is also the process to continue to accumulate knowledge and correct the errors and the prior knowledge. And then here you have your wishful visions. So how do you connect these? Well, quite simply, there are some things that have not been solved yet. Um, if you could do these with the physics that already existed, well, they would be doing them. Um, so obviously we need to figure out what hasn't been solved yet. So that's where you go looking for things you start working on. And here you have to ask, well, what are the critical issues on unknowns um, that pertain to these? And where those two intersect are things that you can actually do research on. So that's how you get to the point um, so, and I'm going to be talking more about this process today. Um, this one talks more about um, you have to be familiar with what the physics has done and not done. So that's a different subject on itself. But this is the more fun uh, one that I'm doing today is how do you figure out what those critical issues and unknowns are? We play with it. Okay. Let's say I want to have a nice levitation device. And uh, just as a segue, as a 14-year-old boy pondering these things, uh, think about having a panel van that can go anywhere. Um, <clears throat> oh, enough said. Um, okay, first we're going to start by making analogies to ways that we know how to levitate. Uh, buoyancy, balloons, uh, blimps, and what have you, they basically wear the, uh, weigh the same thing as the surrounding air. That's why they float. Uh, helicopters, those blades are pushing air down uh, with enough force to keep the helicopter up. And then you have ground effect trains where something's happening in this little space here to keep it hovering, but it usually requires specific tracks. So you start from a variety of different ways of looking at the problem and then take it to the next one level of detail. Well, and here already I'm uh, making a choice. I'm going to focus in terms of gravitation uh, to make a, uh, you could do this in terms of electromagnetic forces. Um, if you want to do Higgs fields or, or whatever. But um, the idea is, is that there's more than one way of thinking about it. So let's take a closer look about what this would mean. Well, buoyancy. Well, could you zero out the gravitational mass of the vehicle so that there's nothing pulling it down? Okay. Well, rather than doing that, could you turn off the gravity in the surrounding area here? And if that still had mass, so it does not fall down. Or the term anti-gravity, um, could you create an opposing gravitational force so the thing uh, would be in balance? Uh, one thing I want to point out here, anti-gravity was a term that was widely used trying to describe this whole uh, arena, um, which is only one specific method and has been tainted over the years because it's been used very sloppily. Um, but, you know, it is just one approach here. Um, well, what about like the helicopter? Could you produce force fields on the air so it's going to uh, be up? Well, more than just the air, could you do it on space-time itself um, or shielding gravity and about the ground being repulsed? Okay, so here we now we have, we've gone from analogies to several different ways of thinking about it, and this is just in the context of gravitation. So now we take it to the next level of detail where we start asking, okay, 
well, what if that were true? Um, if you zeroed out the uh, gravitational mass of the vehicle, would you also zero out its inertia? In which case, if you pushed on it ever so slightly, it would go uh, uh, flinging off in a dramatic fashion, uh, which you may or may not want if <clears throat> you're already inside of it or not. Um, if you're turning off the surrounding gravity, well, how far do you have that uh, effect need to extend to really function? And on this one, well, consider that. If you had an opposing gravitational force, you would kind of have a gravitational uh, well right above the thing, and would it start collecting debris? And if you're a fashionable uh, a space traveler, you don't really want to go around with a whole bunch of garbage over your head while traveling. So, you know, I don't know if that would be cool. Um, okay, if you do the force field on the air, well, is it affecting other objects around? And how far do you have to actually extend it to get enough lift? Well, why not just expand that to everything on space-time, but then what's that reaction mass? What are you really pushing against? Because space-time, naively looked at, looks empty, uh, but that's another subject we get in, and some of the prior talks uh, alluded to that, well, no, it's not empty. Um, if you're shielding gravity, what about everything up above it? Um, and if you're ground repulse, what happens if you go over something soft, like water or frogs? Um, <clears throat> so. Taking these questions gets you to another level of detail, but wait, we're not done. Let's flip this on a different perspective. Here we were talking about negating gravity where it does exist. Well, let's flip it. What about when we want to provide gravity where it doesn't exist? Now, um, think about this. How many of your science fiction vehicles do you see where they have these parallel decks um, and everyone's walking around in normal Hollywood studio filming conditions, which is quite convenient for filming them. Uh, but this would be a huge breakthrough unto itself. This is profound, and I, I, I can't tell you how many frustrations I have when I watch science fiction movies that get this stuff so inconsistent, uh, like Wally. Um, I won't go into the specific example, but they messed it up big time. Um, and you know, inside here you have gravity, and outside you don't. Well, let's play with that a little bit. Okay, so somehow you have your interior corridors where you have gravitation. And so what if you had some guy sitting in there that you didn't really want to be there? Well, what if we just increase the intensity of the field to squash him? Okay. Or what if we change the direction to disorient him? Or if we really want to have fun, what if we just smack him around a bit by oscillating the field? Okay. Now, as fun as that was, um, and all people who are technically the audience, I want you to look at what we were just thinking about. Magnitude, direction, time rate of change. All of these things are the beginning seeds of taking these fun, playful ideas and putting them into some mathematical representation where you can check for their consistency um, and, and, and so on and so forth. So this kind of playful stuff does lead to things deeper. Okay, so now let's extend this again. If you can do those forces inside the ship, then why not outside the ship um, and push yourself uh, around it? Okay, that's kind of like when I was talking before about the levitation, pushing against things. Well, rather than just surrounding objects, what about the entire universe? Um, so this spherical shell represents all the mass in our universe, but at a, a long distance, and here's our magical spacecraft, and we turn on the engines, Spacecraft goes one way, the universe goes the other. And for those physicists in the audience who just went, huh? And asking, okay, well, what's the entire universe and this system conserved to? If that made you feel kind of twisted, then you know that we're embarking on things that haven't been finished yet. In particular, the physics of inertia frames, completely unfinished. And they were hoping that Einstein's general relativity would help deal with that, but it did not address that problem. Okay, here's yet another way of looking at these things. How many have ever done the thing where you have um, a soap boat where you put something in water and then you touch a detergent right behind it and it goes scooting off? Okay, well what happened there is that that vehicle had no propulsion on it, no sails, no propellers, no nothing. Um, you changed the surrounding water. You made an asymmetric change, particularly in the surface tension, which moved along. Well, make analogies to that. What if you change Newton's constants, gravitational potential, Planck's constants, the speed of light, or other things? Would you get those same effects? And what is the space-time on that? Is the water analogous to uh, space-time itself? Um, and again, you know, here you have a bunch of different ways where you could proceed with this in more detail. And 
when you actually go through these, you can have like branching diagrams of, oh, maybe this way, maybe this way, maybe this way. And as you go through that and eliminate ones, well, you still have plenty of other ways of checking it out. So if you want to get to the dead end, no problem. You just take a back step and try plan B. Okay, so basically what we're talking about is the difference between rockets, where you spew out propellant in one direction and your vehicle goes in the other, or our space drives where somehow you're pushing against the universe. Now, why, I mean, other than the coolness factor, what's the real benefit here? It's the amount of energy that you need. And um, in this case, all you're talking about is fundamental kinetic energy, which uh, if, and which goes as the square of how much velocity change you want to do. So if you double your speed, you quadruple your energy. Um, but also, every time you pull another one of those maneuvers, you do it, it's uh, just an integer change. Now, when you're talking rockets, which have to take all that propellant along them, you're in a completely different situation. Every time you have a change in velocity, it's in an exponent now. And every time you need to do that again, that is also in the exponent. So what happens here, for very short journeys or Earth to orbit or whatever, it's no big deal. This is only like a factor of three better. But if you're talking interstellar flight and you also want to stop when you get there, then you're talking well over 100 orders of magnitude difference. Um, so it completely changes the energy. Now, by the way, these are both ideal 100% efficient equations um, with no loss mechanism. So you know, trying to compare them on, on some form. And, and this is not to say that this will be exactly this way, but it's a way to kind of illustrate the kind of benefits that we're aiming for when going for something like this. Okay, well with enough of that plane, you can actually get to where you have the first step of the scientific method, um, where, you know, we want to move a vehicle relative to space and even using it, but we need to conserve, uh, conserve momentum, we need to conserve energy, there has to be net external force. Okay, I can't tell you how many propulsion ideas I've had to review where it amounts to you have some device on the vehicle which is pushing on another device in the vehicle and they hope that's somehow going to create thrust. Well, what that does is that just creates forces against those parts inside the vehicle. It's like trying to move your car by pushing on the dashboard while you're seated inside. You don't go anywhere. It's such a common mistake, I bring it up explicitly. And of course, all this has to be cons uh, consistent with known phenomena, whether they have been measured yet or not. Um, and then there's practical issues about being able to turn it on or off and having it be strong enough. But first, let's get to these. So, like I said, step one of the scientific method then takes you to the next question about how do you go about collecting data? In which case now the questions are framed towards that problem. Like, what are the indigenous phenomena in space or of space-time itself that might suit as a reaction mass? And can you induce forces relative to that? And can you induce net forces relative to that? And then the controllability issues. are. Are they strong enough to do anything? So this gives you what you can start looking for. Okay, now if you heard from the other speakers about, you know, what is the uh, consistency of, of space, and ask, well, you know, is space enough to push off itself? I mean, this empty stuff? Well, uh, I have this in two terms, the density of space-time um, and the uh, quantum vacuum energy of which there's a a great deal of uncertainty about what the specific value is. Now, there's two estimates here, and I want to look how, want you to look at how much they vary. Um, that there's only 10 to the minus 26 kilograms per cubic meter, or 10 to the plus 25. That's a huge amount of uncertainty. Or um, to say less politely, we're pretty dumb right now. Um, and if you're wondering how did I get that big number, this is taking an analogy to Young's modulus, uh, which is about stress and strain, uh, using the things that you've seen before about how stiff space-time is, where that's where you get the equivalent mass density of space inferred from that stiffness. Um, it's, it's for illustrative purposes, not to say that's exactly the interpretation there, but to give you an idea that you know space might be quite substantial to push off of. And the quantum uncertainty, if you infer the value from the uh, apparent dark energy, you get a minor number. If you take it up to the Planck limit, you get an astounding number. Uh, and you might notice that both these numbers here and here are higher than the density of lead, and that's for empty space, so you're obviously talking about interesting regimes. Okay, now some thought experiments. To, we're, no, I mentioned before inertial frames are kind of the big deal here, and to figure out what are they and how do you uh, mess with them. So. 
This is uh, just playfulness here. Uh, let's say that we're starting with space that has no inertial properties. That means if you're uh, spinning or accelerating, you don't feel any forces. So let's put something in there that is a cause for inertial frame. Um, and I'm not even gonna uh, say what that might be, but here now, this describes where we suddenly created an inertial frame, and inside here are inertial properties. Um, and all this stuff doesn't matter. Okay, let's put a test mass in there. Now, if indeed this is the entirety definition of an inertial frame, and with our test mass in there, no matter how that moves or rotates, that test mass is gonna stay centered in that reference frame because that's how it defines its entire inertia. You move the inertial frame, you move the object with it. Okay, slight segue, is this absolutely certain? There's, um, there's healthy debate about the exact details of this. As a matter of fact, this is related to something called Mach's principle, of which there are at least 10 different definitions or, or um, further ideas on. Okay, so now let's make it more interesting. Let's say we put a second frame around this. So both of these now are inertial frames, and they're both affecting that mass. Um, and what happens when we move the frames relative to each other? And say, well, where's the mass? Okay, if you only had the yellow frame, and that's the only thing that governs inertia, then that mass is gonna stay there. On the other hand, if you only had the blue frame and nothing else, the mass is gonna be there. If you have both of them and they contribute proportionally, it's gonna be somewhere in between. Now, the reason why I show you this is because this helps you take it to the point of, well, how would you describe this? And one of the versions uh, that goes on this is a, uh, like a center of mass thing, or to show you, uh, this is just one. This is not the, this is just one example of people who've tried to uh, play with this. Um, and you know, I'm not even gonna bother to tell, to go into the detail of this, other than to show that this is not new and also it is not finished. Uh, but these thought experiments help you work these things out in more detail. And there's other variations on a theme with these thought experiments, which I'm not gonna show you, um, which are too long. Now, there are also plenty of other ideas of how to approach the space drive idea, some of which you've uh, heard. And um, if you break them down by disciplines, um, and including the common mistakes, you know, there's a lot that are just bad ideas. Um, ideas for trying to uh, do the fundamental coupling before forces, ones that involve quantum physics, one that involves space-time uh, geometry, and these kind of things are the things you heard in particular talks or if you're talking about the fundamental physics of inertial frames and fields within those frames. Um, and the one that I've just been describing is only this one. Um, as you can see, there's a whole bunch of different approaches on there. And even this one has only branched out on some of the possibilities. So there's plenty of opportunities left. And um, as my last chart, I'll leave you with some uh, references. Um, the paper that goes into listing uh, what are the various approaches to this that have existed and how do they compare in terms of um, where they came from, what their critical next step is or key issue, and uh, what you might do about it to continue. Um, a lot more detail in this book um, and several chapters on the idea of controlling gravity or inertia um, at various levels of detail. And if you want a good single reference for Mach's principle, which is the details of where do inertial frames come from, uh, there's this excellent book. Um, it was from a conference in 95, and not only are there articles, but there's the recorded debate amongst the um, various attendees about fine points of Mach's principles, and it's really insightful. Thank you. Um, we do have time for one question, so um, you want to have any questions? Yeah, and please wait for the microphone. I have a hearing problem. It's okay, I have a speaking problem, so weaving each other out. Um, I have a question about navigation. So with any of these warp drives or um, sort of space manipulation, if you've got zero inertial, uh, inertial uh, velocity and you're creating a symmetrical field around this spacecraft, how can you give it a, um, 
a destination? How can you actually go in any, any direction? I'll cover that answer in uh, uh, more than one way. I'll cover more than one answer to that question. The question is, is that, well, how do you navigate? How do you point it where you want to go and things like that? And he also brought up with the faster than light concepts. By the way, all this space drive stuff is not necessarily faster than light. This is slower than light, but it would be an energy breakthrough or, you know, it would drastically reduce how much energy you needed to do interstellar flight. Um, okay, on these concepts, because you're still slower than light, you can still see everything around you. So you have the visual cues to use for your navigation. Um, by the way, one of the things I wanted to point out, when Putoff was talking about those, um, it went by many names, the optical analogy, uh, polarizable vacuum, metric engineering, um, those Euclidean ideas of old, one of the issues that came up with that is that they imply a, um, a uh, preferred reference frame uh, for inertia or for motion. And um, at the time that those were beginning to be studied, which was at the turn of the last uh, uh, century, um, that's when Michelson-Morley experiment was out. But what they didn't know then is the cosmic background radiation, which is a phenomenon, is in fact a uh, absolute reference frame for motion through our universe. It's, uh, you can tell how fast you're going by Doppler shifts and it's relative to the mean rest frame of the universe. So that phenomenon does exist. So those issues about preferential reference frames or whatever might be related to that and that might actually be a clue how to solve it. So anyway, for those, navigation, you could use that to tell how fast you're going and for the space drives that are sublight speed, you can still see what you're doing. For the faster than light ones, that is still a subject of requiring more attention. Um, one way of looking at it, as soon as you're going beyond the speed of light, you've broken your connection with electromagnetism and you, can never, you cannot use that anymore as your clues. But that's not the only way of looking about it. And um, I'll, if there's discussion points with others uh, next, like Eric, that will be a good one to do. But that is a question with the uh, uh, fast and light ones. You know, point it to where you hope your destination is going to be, do all your math, and get there, okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Alex, go ahead. Go ahead, now it's okay. And our next speaker will be Mr. Jeff, Mr. Jeff Lee. Uh, Mr. Lee is a physics teacher at the Creature School and is an Icarus Interstellar Scientist. Um, his speech will be on the singularity, pro singularity proposed in acceleration of a squirt child, something starship, um, I can't pronounce that. All right, everybody give him a hand, please. Thank you. Hey, I'm, um, I'm talking about the uh, Schwarzschild Kugelblitz starship, which has uh, appeared in previous papers in the literature, but uh, under a very different name, actually. Um, I want to talk about Schwarzschild Kugelblitzes, their power and life expectancy, propulsion through an inertial spherical cap, um, using Kugelblitzes for engine power, and then a, a few conclusions on this topic. So Schwarzschild Kugelblitzes, or SKs um, for short, the Schwarzschild obviously implies a non-rotating, electrically neutral, spherically symmetric object. And Schwarzschild seems to imply this has something to do with black holes. And in fact, it sort of does. Kugelblitz is really a, a homage to, I think, one of the black hole greats, John Wheeler. Um, literally translated to ball lightning, but not to be confused with the ball lightning atmospheric phenomenon. This has nothing at all to do with that. Um, so in 1955, John Wheeler proposed the possibility that if you were able to focus enough pure energy into a region of space-time, you could create a horizon which would trap that energy. A microscopic black hole, but not made by the collapse of a star and matter, but instead made by energy. So essentially, a Schwarzschild Kugelblitz is a subatomic black hole, but one created by energy. The 
only proposed technology that I've seen come into the literature for the creation of anything like this would be the gamma ray laser or grazer. We've been, some would say, nipping at the heels of this technology for a handful of decades right now, so far unrealized. The gamma ray laser that would be required to create an SK, I just like to comment on for a moment, is largely beyond anything that I have read about in the literature. Grazers discussed seem to be in the KEV range, MEV range for, um, for photon energy. In order to create a, an SK, the photon energy would have to be into the TEV range, and you would have to create the SK with enough energy that it would equal the approximate total solar output over 10 or 20 milliseconds. All of that would have to be delivered into a region of space-time in the form of hard gamma rays and focused into a region of space-time approaching that of the Schwarzschild radius with a beam length approaching that of a Schwarzschild radius. So we're talking a cubic atometer or so of energy equal to a few tens of milliseconds of solar output and all of TEV collimated coherent photons. So the power and life expectancy, um, according to the classical model of Hawking radiation, we assume a photonic spectrum, in which case we don't have any other particles being produced. So this is very applicable to stellar mass black holes, but not applicable to subatomic black holes or SKs, as we'll see. These are the, the familiar equations for Schwarzschild radius where um, GN would be the uh, Newtonian gravitation constant. Um, the Hawking temperature inversely proportional to the Schwarzschild radius, so obviously smaller black holes are hotter. The Hawking power radiated, it's, it's noteworthy that this is inversely proportional to the square of the Schwarzschild radius, which we'll return to shortly, and that the lifetime of an SK or a, a black hole really is proportional to the cube of the Schwarzschild radius. So the bigger you are, the longer you live. However, if we consider particle production model of Hawking radiation, the instantaneous spectrum of an SK, because of the extremely high temperatures due to these very, very small objects, will be awash with quarks, muons, talons, gluons, and probably also spin to gravitons. So the radiated power coming out of an SK, we cannot use the classical formulas accurately because they do not take into account production of these particles. The formula that has been derived and dates back to um, really, I think, first done that I know of by the, uh, the McGibbon and Weber team of about 20 years ago or so when they looked at the instantaneous spectra of primordial black holes, came up with an equation in which, once again, power is inversely proportional to the Schwarzschild radius but relies on a function of its temperature which accounts for particle production, F of T. <clears throat> Through numerical simulations, they came up with the value of this proportionality constant A um, of 1.06 times 10 to the minus 20 watt meters squared. Um, for additional detail on that, I, I would gladly refer you to those papers. F of T can be written as an analytic approximation across a given range of temperatures and thus Schwarzschild radii. Each of these parts of the function accounts for various particle production. So for instance, the 1.569 value that we're looking at here would be for an SK emitting 
electrons, positrons, photons, neutrinos. If we then begin to take into account other particle production, we have a term to account for muons, gluons, tauons, and then the six remaining quarks. So this analytic approximation of f of t is valid for roughly between 0.06 GeV and 100 GeV SK temperatures. This translates to structures that are between about 260 atometers at the large size and down to about 0.16 atometers at the small size. So we're talking objects that are more than a thousand times smaller um, in some cases than the classical electron radius. So if looking at how the analytic approximation of f of t varies with temperature, we see a very sharp rise followed by a um, more or less of a leveling off. The values of f of t don't vary a great deal. They're all certainly within the same order of magnitude, around approximately, give or take, say, 10. If we look at the variation of f of t, however, with Schwarzschild radius, and I've got a log scale on the bottom in reverse, um, primarily because, of course, over time, the Schwarzschild radius is going to decrease. So we see that f of t increases with decreasing Schwarzschild radius. Again, no surprise. However, the power is a very interesting story when we compare the classical Hawking power to Hawking power according to particle production. The classical Hawking power gives us a curve very, very much like this, and this is the function which I showed earlier on. However, if we insert the particle production curve, we see significantly greater power for any given Schwarzschild radius. So if we compare power radiated for one particular size of SK, say one atometer, a one atometer SK radiates at 0.79 petawatts, 10 to the 15th power watts, classically. But taking into account for particle production, we see the power is actually more like 129 petawatts. 129 petawatts is essentially in context, this SK would put out in an hour what the world used, or certainly North America of the world used in major energy production about five years ago. All we have to do is to be able to capture that energy. So the instantaneous spectrum of quarks, muons, tauons, and so forth, through particle interaction, is composed ultimately of protons and antiprotons, electrons and positrons, gamma ray photons, and neutrinos and antineutrinos. So it's a melee of charged and uncharged particles emanating at and slightly below the speed of light. <clears throat> so the energies which each of these particles carry, of course, will vary according to the Schwarzschild radius. So if we take a look at protons and antiprotons, each of those carry significantly more energy than would photons or electrons or positrons. However, looking at the total energy, the total energy is carried mostly by neutrinos a quarter of it or so by photons. Now, the unfortunate fact of neutrinos when it comes to applications is they tend to pass through everything. And so they're largely inaccessible. So the accessible part of the Hawking spectrum is that which is on the right side of this graph. And so if we look at the percentage of total energy carried by accessible parts of the spectrum, we see just under half of it is carried by photons. 
Similarly for flocks, more than half the flocks is carried by neutrinos and antineutrinos on inaccessible channels. Very little flux is carried relatively by protons and antiprotons, not surprisingly because they are larger and more difficult to produce. Looking at accessible flux, almost half of it is photons. Very little of it is protons and antiprotons, and in a way, in terms of what I'm about to talk about shortly, that will turn out to be advantageous that not a, not a lot of it is carried by protons and antiprotons. So Hawking showed black holes evaporate. E equals mc squared, differentiated, substitute and integrate um, with respect to Schwarzschild radius, and you can estimate the lifetime. This is, of course, done classically. Here it's done by particle, in terms of particle production. So if we have a reference SK, something to compare to the 0.6 atometer one year SK, and assuming generously that f of t is less than or equal to 100, which across this range it certainly is, then we see that the lifetime is going to be somewhere between these two values. Once again, in some sense proportional to the cube of the Schwarzschild radius as it is classically. And so the classical evaporation time or lifetime as such, but the particle production lifetime upper and lower is as such. The classical prediction significantly overestimates the lifetime of the SK. For example, a one atometer SK has a particle production lifetime calculated to be about five years. So we're a couple of orders of magnitude less. These things will evaporate fairly quickly. The range which I showed of 0.16 atometers up to 260 atometers, we're talking lifetime ranges between a few weeks up to four or five millennia. So then, one possibility, what about putting this radiation into some kind of a spherical cap in front of the ship and using it as a kind of a solar sail? Well, in this case, the GEV Hawking radiation is either going to be absorbed or it's going through. I wouldn't expect much reflection to occur at these energies. And so if we call the distance between the SK and the spherical cap D, the apex half angle theta, and the thickness of the cap Z, then the radiation absorption we have to look at for each of the three main accessible channels. Photons, we look at the linear absorption coefficient. Protons and antiprotons, we turn to the beta Bloch equation, which gives us the amount of energy removed as a function of the thickness of whatever the particle passes through. For electrons and positrons, we can't use exactly the beta Bloch equation, we have to turn to the somewhat ugly looking modified beta block equation. So the absorbed flux into the cap is going to be proportional to the thickness of the cap, the dis inversely proportional to the distance squared, and then of course to the solid angle that the cap occupies. The mass of the cap is just a straight geometric expression. The accelerations that this will give, we only get, of course, the single punch for absorption, not the double punch for reflection. The photon acceleration is going to be based on kinetic energy flux and inversely proportional to the sum of the masses, the mass of the SK, the mass of the ship, the mass of the, uh, um, the cap, and I've even included in my simulation the mass of particles absorbed into the cap. Similarly for protons, antiprotons, electrons, and positrons. The cos theta term comes in because we're interested in the forward directed component of momentum. These SKs are essentially isotropic radiators. 
So integrate all of that across the solid angle, and we end up with an expression which is analytic, but too ugly to include. So the scenario was I took a wild guess at a half megaton starship, so this would be a 100-story office building or so. Smaller is better. We utilize all accessible particles against the cap and midpoint acceleration scheme where we accelerate for half the time, flip the ship around, and decelerate to the destination. So we have to bear in mind, unfortunately, that the spherical cap is going to be heated. And if we assume that it's heated only photonically, and we want to keep its temperature below the melting temperature of whatever it's made from, then I've proposed, let's say, use a one atometer SK whose lifetime is just under five years. I picked a material, make it out of titanium. I suppose one could make it out of anything. It's not actually going to change much in the end as we're going to see. In order to keep the temperature of the cap photonically below the melting temperature, we've got to put the SK about 33 kilometers away that does not give us a great deal of radiation pressure at that distance from this source. We'd be interested in knowing the optimum z and theta values that will give us the highest speed and displacement across the lifetime of the SK using, um, in this case, a 20,000 step iteration scheme. And so this graph really shows the optimal values of z and theta. So here, for example, if we have a value of, say, um, 0.8 centimeter thick cap, then the optimal apex half angle is somewhere around 25 degrees. If we make the cap bigger, we absorb more radiation, but the cap gets heavier, the ship slows down. Make it smaller and it's lighter, it absorbs less radiation, the ship slows down. So the optimal values that we get here are a centimeter and 23 and a half degrees. Unfortunately, what we end up with is a ship that crawls. In the five years, this has only pushed the ship one and a half astronomical units and to some ridiculous speed. We might as well get out and push. The acceleration increases primarily at the end due to the increased rate of evaporation of the SK and beta similarly rises towards the end. There must be a better way than this. So what about supplying the SK's energy directly into the Starship's engine? Whatever type of engine could take its energy along all accessible channels, convert it into kinetic energy. I'm not suggesting that Daedalus is the ship that would do this, but some ship. So the kinetic energy of the Starship is just a fraction of the total energy. If we solve this for the speed, we end up with that familiar expression where m naught is the relativistic rest mass, not the initial mass of the SK, which is evaporating. So these are both functions of time. Run the iterative scheme again. see that the speeds which are possible for a perfectly efficient engine from the six-month SK of 0.5 atometers up to four atometers measured against the percentage of lifetime can get us to speeds which are fairly respectable for interstellar travel. If we look at efficiency, the um, lowest efficiency gets us to around 0.3 or so with increasing efficiencies all the way up towards about three quarters of the speed of light over the lifetime of the SK. Of course, it takes longer and longer in years to get there. 
acceleration, the proper time derivative of velocity. Doesn't like my. Uh, Killed your slide. Oops. <laughs> Sorry. Let's see. take acceleration to be just the uh, proper time derivative of velocity um, and then look at the acceleration for a, a full efficiency engine, then we're looking at accelerations which are more or less constant but reasonably close to 1g for the smaller SKs throughout the trip. Displacement, the um, speed up, slow down type scheme, we can just double the first half of the trip. And in terms of engine efficiency, we see that for a one atometer SK, we're accelerating and decelerating over a distance which can approach a light year. So compared to fusion, um, fusion has much greater speeds than the SK spherical cap could ever hope to. 
has a much higher technology readiness level, we're going to see it a lot sooner. SKs, on the other hand, can last for much longer. You can have centuries or millennia of power available, so they could be very long-term power sources. Um, and fed to an engine capable of much greater subluminal velocities approaching the speed of light. Begs the question, could the Hawking radiation from SKs ever be used as a propulsive source for faster than light travel? The unfortunate answer is no. We can't look to SKs for this because Hawking radiation does not behave like vacuum energy. At least I could not find a space-time metric in which it would. And so particle production must be considered for SKs. Spherical caps are barely comparable, hardly even close to comparable, TRL level 9s. And SKs uh, used as power sources for engines can produce significant subluminal velocities. So I modify the quotes of Chandrasekhar about black holes being the perfect macroscopic objects. Schwarzschild Kugelblitzes could be the perfect microscopic objects. All you need are space, time, um, and a grazer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Lee. Very insightful. Um, unfortunately, we won't have time for a question for this, job, for this talk. Our next speaker, however, will be Dr. Gerald Cleaver. He is a professor of physics at Baylor University and is a scientist at Icarus Interstellar. And his talk will be on the quark of quark engines. That would be very interesting. So everybody, please give him a hand. Okay, now let's see if that works. Okay. That works. Yep. That looks good. Okay, remember, point toward the computer, not at the screen. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, and here's uh, my laser pointer. Okay. <coughs> okay, like uh, was said, the title of my talk is The Quirks of Quark Engines. Actually, I should have, I've been doing more research on it, and I should have relabeled it now, The Quirks of Quark and Electron Engines. And so I'm going to be uh, adding some aspects to it. And um, I've been, Richard and I have been looking at uh, uh, understanding a Cuvier warp drive through string theory and M theory in the past, but then also recently I've been looking at uh, something that might be uh, obtainable uh, sooner, uh, um, and that is how to work out the, the possible uh, physics of matter-antimatter propulsion systems. I'm going to use the acronym MAM for matter-antimatter. And the ideal matter-antimatter propelled uh, MAM spacecraft should consist both, uh, should contain systems for both collecting and generating MAM, with creation especially as an emergency option if stored MAM leaks out of magnetic containment chambers or is annihilated prematurely by matter leaking in. Uh, one of the simplest methods for generating MAM on board would be to use Schwinger pair production of scalar particles or spin a half fermions from the vacuum through intense electric field quantum effects. And this is not uh, anything new. This was uh, discussed first by uh, Sauter in 1931 and then by uh, leaders in quantum mechanics such as Heisenberg and Weisskopf in the uh, 1930s. Then Julius, Julian Schwinger brought it all uh, uh, together by putting uh, particle antiparticle production on, on a sound QED basis in uh, his uh, famous paper in 1951 and hence became known as Schwinger pair production. Um, it's been researched by several people in the last few decades, uh, particularly useful papers, one by Kim and Page that came out in 2007. Uh, and I'll go through the, the process that uh, they derived, and they, their results came from uh, con uh, working out um, um, the uh, tunneling or instanton effects for this process in, in quantum mechanics. And first, one, one thing they consider, they consider a static, plain, symmetric, Z-dependent electric field, EZ, uh, pointed in the, in the Z direction and with maximum or a, uh, value E0 and, uh, and of effective length L using that. Um, defined here, let's see, where is it? Oh, I 
missing it. Okay. Oh, here we here we go. Right here. So we're defi we're integrating over the total E field to get the, and then just define it in terms of the maximum value and then produce an effective length L. Um, and this will allow pair production of a particle of mass m and charge Q if the constraint epsilon defined as the mass of the particle divided by its charge E naught and L is less than one or equivalently we need uh, maximum. Uh, electric field strength greater than m divided by QL. And I'm always going to be using uh, natural units of uh, Newton's constant equals C equals H bar equals 1 in here. If these equations look a little strange, they can be converted to proper units by uh, going to the uh, uh, numeric values of these. And so this for uh, in a static field such as this, this is an absolute value. This is an absolute constraint. We need E naught greater than this value. You can also work in a homogeneous time-dependent electric field frame E of t, E that is E uh, as a function of t, in the z direction with, again, maximum value of E naught with an effective time, total uh, run time, or total on time, capital T, such that, uh, again, defined as E naught as the maximum value over an effective uh, uh, run time t, averaging over the total uh, E field. Uh, time that's running. This will allow pair production of a particle of mass m and charge q for, again, epsilon tau, defined with simply uh, length being replaced by time here, uh, less than 1. But nicely, it's not an absolute constraint now. If epsilon tau is greater than 1, we can still work out par particle production. It simply suppresses the particle production rate, which is very nice. And we're, what we're going to need to use is uh, uh, electric field that is, in fact, time dependent. Um, and then in each process, when E naught is above the, the, the minimum value um, or uh, giving suppression factors, the pair production rate, PPR, of charged particles per unit time and unit cross section was found, as I said, from tunneling of virtual pairs from the Dirac C where instantons determine the quantum mechanical tunneling probabilities. And then uh, uh, Page and his colleague worked out to leading. A WKB order uh, using what was known for a long time as the Sauter electric field definition. E of z is a, uh, as a function of E naught times hyperbolic uh, secant and then a function 2 z over L. Uh, the pair production rate, uh, if we look at it in the limit of epsilon goes to 1, uh, excuse me, epsilon goes to 0, that is uh, E naught much above the constraint. look at it to get the overall form. The production rate it goes as a function of E naught to the 5 halves uh, and then also just a proportional then to the uh, length uh, of the E field where it's on. Key thing is rate goes as a function of E naught to the 5 halves. Um, for electron positron production, the critical value of the electric field strength is around 10 to the 18 volts per meter. Uh, the strongest lasers pro are producing electric fields that are now only one order of magnitude below this. And the X-ray free electron lasers from, uh, from uh, SLAC and from DESI, the, te the uh, LINAC coherent light source at SLAC and Tesla at, De at DESI, could approach the critical values in the near, in the near future. Um, much research in this area has been carried out by a series of papers by Gerald Dunn at Connecticut et al. Uh, is uh, seen here. Some of the research includes showing how you c there can be an enhanced production rate on uh, increasing by about an order of four production rate if there's a combination of e, of, uh, e as a function both of EZ and ET to form pulses with internal producing electric fields that are now only one yeah, order of magnitude like below this. The and the X-ray free electron lasers from, uh, man, from uh, SLAC uh, and from DESI, the, the uh, Lin LINAC coherent light source at SLAC and, and Tesla was, at, De uh, at DESI could approach the critical values in the near, in the near future. That my friend uh, Page had much done research in this area has been carried out by a series of papers by Gerald Dunn at Connecticut at all. You have effectively lower the minimum value of E naught when we're using time dependent uh, field significantly by adding a constant magnetic field B parallel to E naught and the pair production rate of the charged particles per unit time and unit cross section then is modified as derived by Don uh, by by B being or basically or magnitude below this research and the x-ray free electron lasers from uh, from uh, SLAC uh, and from DESI the, the uh, LINAC coherent light source at SLAC and Tesla at, De at DESI
things are simplified a lot, and we, we can see it reduces to the new form, simplified form of B over E naught here times hyperbolic cotangent times then the production rate uh, uh, when there is no B field. And if you take the limit as B goes to zero, taking the derivative of B and hyperbolic cotangent, you would see that NB re uh, reduces simply to N then. This whole factor cancels out and the limit is, is B going to, ze to zero. And this allows significantly weaker E naught. Uh, and this idea was in fact first presented uh, by John Preskill back in 1987 in a series of lecture notes that he gave directly in the class. And then uh, I proposed it for spacecraft propulsion uh, at the 100-year Starship uh, proceedings. And I'm going to get now, that's the details of it. Uh, I want to cover that punchline first. Now I'm just going to uh, present the overall idea of how parallel electric and magnetic fields um, allow this production of uh, particle antiparticles uh, uh, in a simplified form and lower energy than just pure um, E field would. Uh, and the underlying principle behind this man production from parallel electric and magnetic fields is associated with what's known as chiral symmetry breaking. And chiral symmetry breaking is the fact that one connects left and right handed elementary particles, specifically uh, for quarks, in the strong coupling limit of QCD and or distinguishes between left and right-handed particles via B-field interaction effects in QED. Um, and then why only in this whole process, why only uh, parallel components of the electric and magnetic fields are relevant to the effect will be worked out in the Hamiltonian formalism that I will show now. But again, just review of the particles. I want to point out the, the electrons, the leptons and the, um, and the uh, quarks. The, the electron has a mass of 0.511 MeV. Uh, the up quark, the lightest of all of the quarks, uh, in, in, uh, has an effective free mass of about 2.4 MeV. Uh, so it's about uh, um, five times the mass of an electron, which I'll point out uh, what that gets to in a little bit. Chirality means handedness, left-handed and right-handed. Chiral symmetry, if we have chiral symmetry, this means that the left-handed and right-handed versions of the same particle, uh, equivalently left-handed particle and antiparticle, are independent particles. Technically, this means that the phases of each are independent. Chiral symmetry breaking, uh, CSB, occurs when left-handed and right-handed particles are not independent, when their phases are correlated and exactly opposite. Um, or when there's a distinction in the production rate of the two. This is the definition of chiral symmetry breaking through the strong force, uh, different masses through the ele electromagnetic force. At high energies, above a few GeV, the, the strong force becomes weak. Quarks have chiral symmetry. Uh, at low energies, below a few GeV, when strong force is strong, quarks experience uh, chiral symmetry breaking. Chiral symmetry breaking allows an a new interaction term, FF dual, where F is the field strength and F, F dual uh, is a uh, rotation of it, between the field strength tensor F and its dual field strength tensor F dual. Uh, the indices here are 0, 1, 2, 3 for time and space. I, for the electromagnetic force, when we look at the uh, fields in the, uh, in, in the uh, field strength tensor, this is where we get our E and B field components, F0, 1, is, e, is the X component of the electric field, uh, F20 is the Y component, F30 is the Z component, etc. F12 is the VZ component of the magnetic field, uh, and etc. And so for electromagnetics, we take a look at this interaction term FF dual, and it is in fact E dot B. So chiral symmetry breaking in electromagnetics produces this e, a parallel E and B field. Now I'm going to show why this term can result in particle-antiparticle pair production. Uh, it's interesting. So we're going to take a look at it from the Hamiltonian. To start, let's consider a particle, of, a spin a half particle uh, from, with a uh, fermion of mass m and electric charge E in a constant magnetic field B uh, aligned along the B, Z axis. So this is uh, B is uh, the magnitude B, and this should be Z hat, which somehow moved over here. The electromagnetic gauge field producing the physical magnetic field B can be chosen uh, as uh, A is B X Y hat. A is the vector field producing the, the magnetic field B. The square of the Hamiltonian for fermion in this field is this. 
and this is just the standard form P. Whenever you're adding uh, a gauge uh, field to uh, um, standard Hamiltonian, it, uh, you just replace P with P minus E A, and then the square of that, et cetera. Now we expand that out. We have these terms, Px squared plus Pz squared, and then we have this Py minus E Bx squared, the mass term. And now we also have the term of the B field interacting with the uh, spin. With, with the P is the fermion's momentum operator, G is its, right here, is its gy uh, gyromagnetic ratio, which is very close to 2, and I'm going to set it to 2 from now on. Px and Pz are constants of motion, that is, they commute with H, and so can essentially be ignored in terms of the physics, except for one term that I'll point out. What's interesting here is the contribution that we get, Px squared plus uh, e, uh, b squared times the d uh, x minus x naught, where x naught is defined as minus Py over Eb. This has the form of a simple harmonic oscillator, which in quantum mechanics has quantized energy states of 2n plus 1 times uh, Eb. Uh, it, where n is a positive uh, integer or zero. And so let's we'll insert the um, quantized energy states of the magnetic operator here, and we get down to this. This is interesting because multiplying now E times the B field is this quantity 2n plus 1 minus 2ez. And again, 2 uh, times the spin of the particle can either be plus 1 or minus 1 uh, on here. Uh, this, if we have uh, negative spin, this if we have positive spin. So now let's consider the right-handed particle. I've defined that as the one which has the spin up spin of a half rather than minus a half. And let's take a look at the ground state mode. The ground state mode is n equals zero with no motion in the y direction. We're, we're, we're just specifying that. We're only allowing motion in the z direction. So uh, this is very nice. Everything sub uh, subtracts out then. And all we have is uh, the B field, the B field contribution here cancels this um, uh, ter energy term right here. And so we're nice and simple. All we have now is momentum plus mass. The, the B field effectively has canceled uh, uh, the, the interaction part. So in the theoretically massless limit, this produces a zero mode, which even very low energy parallel E which we haven't turned on yet, and B fields can excite, resulting in pair production. In reality, for actual massive states, we have the minimum field constra uh, uh, constraints on E that I mentioned before. That is, E field has to be stronger than zero, and there's some minimum value to it. Uh, and uh, note that also then that the uh, minus a half spin fermion, if we go back to here, we'll s and in insert a minus value here, then this whole thing becomes positive, even for the ground state. This has the effect of increasing the effective mass of the left-handed particle, which is another indication of, of uh, chiral symmetry breaking. Production of rates of right-handed particles increase, but of left-handed particles decrease. Now we're going to turn on the E field in the B direction, slowly, adiabatically, increasing the field strength. Uh, and again, we can use, to produce an increasing electric field, we can use um, uh, a vector field that has a Z component proportional to ET. I'm, going to, I'm choosing the gauge choice of A naught is zero. And then we get this, a nice simplified form. The energy levels of, of the Hamiltonian squared now are discrete, and with increasing T, move along a mass shell hyperbola. And while this process was originally constructed to produce a quark antiquark propulsion system, it can also be used to produce an electron anti electron engine. Uh, and, and producing the electron anti electron uh, pair is actually going to, uh, will occur more frequently. Uh, because, because, again, of this mass ratio. The electron mass is about one-fifth of the up-quark mass. And as I'm thinking about the physics that's produced here, it's probably not even the up-quark mass that's necessary to consider, but the pi meson mass, because we're going to have up and uh, anti-ups uh, needing to combine to form pi's, which are, uh, uh, a pi has about a mass of 270 times the electron. So I think what we're really going to be looking at here is electron, the most likely particle produced in the pair production will be electron, uh, anti-electron pairs. Uh, in, in understanding how they're produced, we can apply the famous Dirac C concept uh, of both positive and negative energy states. In the ground state of the system, all negative energy modes are filled, and the grounds, that's all of these here with uh, negative energy. These are all filled in the ground state of what Dirac defined as the particle C, and all positive energy modes are empty. Each mode can be assigned a helicity, uh, 
and again we're dealing with spin a half particles, then positive energy modes with positive momentum are right handed and uh, positive energy modes with negative momentum are left handed. Uh, the opposite is true for filled negative energy modes. For an electric field E with sufficient energy density, the negative energy quarks or electrons will jump across the 2M gap, uh, which again is about 1 MeV for electrons, 8 MeV for up quarks, and about 14 MeV for down quarks. So you see we're only be, we'd be talking about the electrons um, uh, and then the uh, up quarks, uh, which would nevertheless need to form pions before they could escape. Uh, separating the negative and positive energy states. The physical realization of this is a, chi is a chiral particle pair production, a right-handed particle, filled energy state, and a left-handed antiparticle, negative energy state, that is, the whole produced. So when we give enough energy to bump the uh, negative energy particles up here, we have production of an actual particle here, and, it, and the whole here represents an antiparticle. So we'd see that as pair production. And when we use, and, and as I was saying, when we use the concept of the E and B field both, uh, we, can, uh, we don't have to have the absolute value of E being equal to this gap, but we can uh, produce the energy, uh, we can share the energy needed between the E field and the B field, which allows us even perhaps now to use E fields of, uh, of the maximum strength that, that uh, they can be produced at now. A quark and a quark pair will then either form, as I said, from an uncharged pion state uh, when they're produced, or multiple charged and uncharged pions if the pair has sufficient kinetic energy to separate far enough uh, for the virtual energy, for the potential energy from strong force interactions of the quarks to be greater than the mass of another quark pair, then you're going to have not just single quark anti-quark production, but uh, several pairs that pop into existence, and a net effect uh, would be a, a pairs of pions of opposite charge produced uh, to use. Or more likely, as I said now, what I'm expecting to be produced here are electron-positron pairs that are going to pop into existence. Uh, thus, parallel electric and magnetic fields can be used as a matter-antimatter generator, aka chiral fermion pair production, via low energy effects allowed through chiral symmetry breaking. The charged pion pairs and electron-positron pairs can be directed by external magnetic fields to produce thrust for the starship. This is actually a very efficient process. Uh, because you have the uh, electron, you have the electric and magnetic fields. They are energy is going to be sapped off from them, pretty much 100% for particle production. There'll be a, some loss to heat of the system. In particular, we need an electric field that is oscillating through time, as I said, rather that's time dependent rather than space dependent. Uh, so we're not bound by the epsilon uh, limit, less than one. Uh, but that's not going to be a lot of heat. The only really heat loss is is through uh, the oscillation process for the electric field. Uh, but so it is a very efficient one. And we're at the point now where I'm, I'm actually going to be doing some calculations now that I have the production rate equations uh, working out uh, the, the size of uh, the, the electric and magnetic fields to produce uh, viable production rates uh, for things. Conclusions. Ma uh, MAM production from strong electric fields is nearing feasibility. Enhancement of MAM production rate via addition of magnetic fields parallel to electric fields is likewise feasible. It provides MAM on demand propulsion. Acknowledgements. I want to acknowledge, of course, the original people Sauter, Heisenberg, Euler, Weisskopf, Dan, and Schwinger, of course, uh, Gerald Dunn for the work that they did for E field pair production design and engineering. The idea varies that Richard proposed in JBiz. John Presco for originally presenting the B parallel E idea and Don Page and, and Kim for the pair production rate calculation that I used here. Thank you. Uh, questions. So does anybody have a question of uh, gentleman right there? Dr. Winterberg? Yeah. How, I don't understand how can you get momentum on this spacecraft? I mean, and you, you have, and how do you get the energy to produce matter and matter you would like if I understand you right you would like to produce matter and matter on the spacecraft is it right or is it incorrect uh, the, the energy is going to have to be stored in the electric and magnetic fields on, on the ship so essentially we've stored the energy that we're going to be using to propel the ship in the E and B fields 
then we use the ENV fields to produce the particle antiparticles. There's going to have to be additional magnetic fields to direct the particles produced outward in a single direction. Some and type of, of thrust. Okay. That means you would like to store all the energy in the electrical magnetic fields. Yes. Then what kind of magnetic fields you get? Giga, Gauss, or what? The, the electric field strength, as I said, the minute the um, uh, order of the magnetic of the electric field that we want is is on uh, 10, to, 10 to the 18 uh, volts per meter. I think. How can you store that? <coughs> and that's that's right on the order of, of what can be produced in lasers. Oh but sure, we can but now go okay, below but that you must drive. Fields. I'm sorry, but you must drive the laser. You need an energy to drive the laser. Somewhere must the energy come from, uh, and then you must conserve momentum in order that your spacecraft. Can I'm be accelerated, you must have momentum conservation. How do you propel that with, with the matter and the matter annihilation? You get uh, direct momentum in all directions. Right, that's what I'm saying. We, we would have. That's what I pointed out. We need. In my we need. We talk, need. You we, need we need. We need external magnet. We need additional external magnetic fields to to direct and to what route. What kind of how strong must the magnetic fields be? Uh, strong, and I don't have those calculations. Okay. Do you want to run here? Um, okay. Um, not sure so. so I think to amplify here, the issue I see here is that in order to produce matter to matter by any of the mechanisms that you've been speaking of, um, classical uh, production in a high electric field or at any high field situation, uh, does not get you more energy out than you put in. Agree, oh, exactly. Okay. So yeah, if no, you're we're not. I'm not arguing that. I'm saying the energy has to be in the E and B fields. Okay. Well, but the nice thing this. is, by adding a B field, we can have lower uh, E field strengths. Okay. So let's let's say you have zero. Let's say you reduce down to zero. Okay. So you have you have no threshold production mechanism. So whatever energy you have goes directly into relativistic particles. Yeah. You, would, you would have done the same thing by taking that energy and converting it into photons or any relativistic source. You're not, I don't see the relevance of this propulsion mechanism because you're not using it as a source of energy production. You're simply using it as a source of energy conversion. Right. And therefore, I do not see how it's efficient in terms of propulsion. Um. It's efficient in, in terms of the, I'm saying it's efficient in terms of the conversion factor. And basically, it's, I'm suggesting something like this uh, as possibly an emergency propulsion system. Something, you know, again, if you had already stored your particle, antiparticle, in, in chambers or something and there was a leak, this is a way of producing them on hand. Okay, um, thank you so much for that. Um, that speech, uh, Dr. Kluber, very interesting. Um, our next speaker is actually excluded from the program. Uh, we might we remind you that you guys of that. Uh, it would be Dr. Lance Williams with Confluence Research, and his speech would be on the rise of the scale of field and its implications. So, um, everybody, please give Dr. Williams a hand. Okay, uh, good evening everyone, or good afternoon I should say. Uh, I'm Lance Williams from Confluence Research. Uh, thanks for having me here, thanks to the technical chairs. Uh, it's great to be here. I'll be talking about a subject that's near and dear to my heart, scalar fields. Uh, I thought it might be appropriate to talk about scalar fields given the discovery last year of the Higgs boson, which is the last element of the standard model of particle physics and the Higgs field is a scalar field. Uh, but uh, today the ones, did you say point it to this? Yeah. The, uh, my approach uh, today will be to survey modern scalar fields in particle, or er, scalar fields in modern physics through the lens of the Friedman equation, which is the workhorse equation of modern cosmology. Through the Friedman equation, we parameterize apparently mysterious forces operating on galactic scales. So even though I introduced it with the Higgs field, 
I will not be talking about quantum scalar fields and the scalar fields I talk about here have nothing to do with the Higgs. You can consider these scalar fields that I'll be talking about to be of infinite range. Their bosons would be massless. The Higgs is massive and of short range. Um, I will be pointing to the mathematics for just for demonstration purposes and it does allow me to speak unambiguously to the technical audience but I think anyone should be able to follow the basic ideas I'm laying out and not to be too bothered if you don't understand the equations I'll just be pointing to them for demonstration purposes. So a bit of taxonomy what do we mean by scalar field? Uh, it's quite simple actually uh, by scalar field, I just mean one number at every point in space and time. Uh, and by field, I mean a force field, something that will push on bits of matter or radiation. And I've uh, sort of uh, introduced a cast of characters here. Um, there's also, uh, by, by way of contrast with the scalar field, which is one number at every point in space and time, we can consider uh, vector fields, such as the electromagnetic vector field, which I've written as A, four numbers at every point in space and time. And a uh, tensor field would be the relativistic gravitational field, which I've written as G, ten numbers at every point in space and time. Uh, the Friedman equation. Uh, typically, the Friedman equation is derived from general relativity, but I want to get the point across that it's very basic. Uh, and so I've included a short derivation here using Newtonian concepts, just Newton's law of gravity and F equals ma. You consider a self-gravitating blob of material of radius r and mass m, and you solve for the equations of motion. You convert the mass into, a, uh, in terms of a density, which I've written as rho, and the radius in terms of a scale factor, which I've written as a, and you come up with, uh, the, the standard, or most of the standard Friedman equation, this, uh, this bit on the left side, let me change pointers here, uh, yeah, that's better. This one on the left side, this just shows the rate of change of the size of our blob. On the right hand side, we have the, the gravitational mass term, and it's being multiplied by g, the gravitational constant. You get this extra little piece that we're not going to worry about because it turns out that without that piece, uh, the, the fully relativistic Friedman equation is exactly like the Newtonian one we've derived. Um, you do get a, a, uh, uh, a term just like we saw before, which depends uh, on the gravitational constant, but we've replaced the mass density with the energy density divided by c squared, which is what you might expect for a relativistic treatment. Uh, this A dot over A is uh, also known as the Hubble constant, the Hubble parameter. Uh, the cur it changes over the time in the universe, but the current value is about 75 kilometers per second per megaparsec, and it's a typical time scale for our universe. The, uh, so this, this, is, this uh, equation describes the expansion of the universe driven by the mass energy content of the universe, and that epsilon, the energy content, can come from any source. So uh, to start uh, our tour, uh, we'll start with the field equations of general relativity. Eric wrote them down. Uh, I think uh, you've seen them already this morning. Basically, we, we have this is an equation for the relativistic gravitational field, which is written as G here. Uh, that's 10 numbers at every point in space and time. As has been discussed this morning, it's balanced by stress energy on the right-hand side. This is all the stuff that bends space and causes gravity. We see our friend the gravitational constant here. Uh, in the lower right-hand corner, I've written the, the old Newtonian gravitational equation. You can see this is just a generalization, but the basic concept applies that you have some source to the gravitational field and the gravitational constant is setting the magnitude of that coupling. Uh, okay, so our first scalar field, the first modern scalar field was introduced by Einstein in 1917, soon after he came up with uh, the field equations of gravity. And uh, he, at that time, he was trying to describe a static universe. And of course, if you have a gravitating mass and you demand that it's static and it can't fall in on itself, you need something to push it apart. So that was the idea behind the gravitational constant. 
you get the same thing from Newton's law, so again, nothing too fancy here, but we do have a modification to the equations of gravity uh, with this quantity lambda, which is called the cosmological constant. And in the, in the bottom, I've written how it enters into the Friedman equation. So we get an extra constant term that is driving the expansion of the universe. Uh, this cosmological constant is, uh, it counteracts gravity and acts to inflate spacetime. Uh, our next stop on our tour is the bronze dickey theory. Uh, this is a very contrived theory, and it's not really thought to represent reality, but it had a couple interesting points. Uh, Brons and Dickey, they, they, were, uh, they had this Machian idea that the gravitational constant depended on the mass, the mass density of the universe. And so they found that the, uh, the forms of the equations of gravitation would allow the introduction of an extrascalar field without violating all the other symmetries that Einstein was after when he first developed them. Uh, so two features here. Uh, the, the scalar field has a stress energy tensor which contributes to space-time curvature, but also we see now the scalar field is entering in the product, uh, within the product of the, the mass stress energy term. So the bronze dickey scalar field controlled the coupling of gravity to, to matter. And even though this is sort of a toy model, we see here, I think, the first time in the literature, the seed of gravity control, where you can think about tuning the magnitude of the coupling between mass uh, and space-time curvature or between mass and gravity. Uh, dark matter. Dark matter in the Friedman equation is also treated as a scalar field. Uh, the, the, ob the observational evidence for this first came in the 1930s when Fritz Zwicky Notice that the uh, speeds of galaxies and galaxy clusters were too high to be explained by the gravitating mass of the cluster. And then decades later, as uh, observational resolution improved, uh, Vera Rubin determined that the stars and in individual galaxies are rotating, moving too fast to be bound by the galaxy. So uh, dark matter, the concept of dark matter, was introduced to explain this or to account for it. Uh, and I will admit that it's widely viewed that dark matter is indeed some invisible gravitating material, but in the Friedman equation, we're still treating it as a scalar field. Inflation, 1980. Here we have a scalar field at the moment of creation. Uh, there were some problems uh, in observational cosmology that were neatly explained by introducing a scalar field. Again, the approach was to think of a cosmological constant. Uh, the idea here was that this cosmological constant w would emerge from the vacuum at the moment of creation, let's say 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang, and would dominate the expansion of the universe, drive a period of exponential expansion, flatten the universe, and then recede back into the vacuum, never to be seen in the universe again. Uh, the guy, they did, uh, they set up a toy equation for the scalar field, but all the parameters are tuned to give the behavior desired. So uh, we don't know if it's a scalar field, but that's how it's modeled in, in, the, uh, in the Friedman equation. Dark energy, 1998. Uh, this is the last discovery, the last major discovery, and it finishes the energy budget of our universe. Uh, and we had to await the, uh, the age of precision cosmology uh, to discover this. Uh, Looking way out into the universe at Z around 0.5, which is millions of light years out, uh, we discovered that the uh, supernovae are about just one quarter of a magnitude fainter than they would be in a universe without a cosmological constant. So that was the initial indication. Then the evidence has increased looking at the cosmic microwave background. It's now pretty well established that dark energy uh, does exist. Uh, it's the dominant component of the mass energy of our universe. Um, I do note that uh, they, you can uh, constrain or you know, parameterize the observations in terms of a general equation of state. It doesn't have to be a cosmological constant, but the evidence, as I've shown here, appears to uh, favor that explanation. So 
So at last, uh, after, from 1917 to 1998, we really do have a cosmological constant, may or may not be related to the vacuum energy. Uh, as the other speakers mentioned, there are some problems in accounting for this in terms of vacuum energy density. So, uh, this, let's just take a moment to take stock. Here is uh, our current model universe called lambda cold dark matter. And I've written the Friedman equation in the yellow box, uh, again, just for demonstration purposes, but we have several, uh, several items in the energy budget here. We have the energy of radiation, which is, gen which is basically the cosmic microwave background. Uh, we have dark matter, visible matter, the inflation scalar field, which now is no longer a player, and dark energy. So the, the point I want to make here is that our universe uh, appears to have many scalar fields, or perhaps many scalar fields. The, uh, the effect of these mysterious forces is parameterized mathematically as a scalar field. Maybe it's something else going on, but it seems safe to assume that, that we have scalar fields in our universe. And so scalar fields do not occur, uh, they don't fit into any nice framework, the classical scalar fields. So the question is, what are these things? Where do they come from? Is there any way to, to try and understand why we would have scalar fields and what they mean? And I think the, the best theory that introduces scalar fields, we would have to go back to the future, back to 1921, when Kaluza, soon after Einstein published his field equations, uh, noted that if you take Einstein's vacuum field equations, which I've written here, and write them in five dimensions, there's enough mathematical complexity, if you will, to recover not only four-dimensional relativity, general relativity, but also electrodynamics. Uh, so, so this is a unified field theory of electromagnetism and gravity back in 1921. And I'll just say a couple words, this G tilde, this is the five-dimensional gravitational field, if you will. It's a five-by-five five matrix. The upper left-hand corner is the four-by-four uh, the four piece is the standard metric of general relativity, and then it's framed with a column and a row by the electromagnetic vector potential. And you see that when you do that, you have a free spot in the corner. That's where the scalar field goes. No one really knew what this thing was, in fact, in Kaluza's original paper, he set this equal to one, which caused some confusion about the validity of this theory. But the idea of writing general relativity in higher dimensions has been tried and true throughout physics since then. So it is a, a valid procedure. Um, moving on, here's what the field equations look like from that theory. Uh, and as I noted, the field equations didn't come until the late 1940s. So again, there was some confusion about this theory, but we see a very bronze dicky like right-hand side to uh, the equations of general relativity. We have our scalar stress energy term, which we might have expected. And here we see the scalar field is multiplying the coupling of electromagnetic stress energy. So it's multiplying the gravitational constant, if you will, and I see here the promise of gravity control. Uh, possibly, uh, there's enough freedom in this theory that you could tune this scalar field and adjust how much mass energy it would take to generate space-time curvature. Here's the equation, Maxwell's equations, and here is uh, the equation for the scalar field. So the scalar field is acting as a, uh, a pivot point, a coupling between general relativity and uh, electrodynamics. But why didn't this thing gain traction? Uh, why haven't we heard much about it? Uh, the narrative that I think is appropriate is that the first modern unified field theory joined general relativity and electromagnetism, but it was not pursued because at that time there was no scalar fields known in the universe. So it was thought that that was uh, totally out of the question. The other pr reason it wasn't pursued is because we thought we would have a quantum theory of gravity. Well, a hundred years later, we have no quantum theory of gravity, and precision cosmology has revealed that scalar fields dominate the universe. So, this, uh, this has some profound implications, I think, 
if we put the uh, Kaluza hypothesis with these observations of scalar fields, uh, we, we see, appear to be implying that uh, the discovery of these cosmic scalar fields could suggest a coupling between electromagnetism and gravity. And uh, such a coupling in this theory, I think, has the two basic uh, legs of uh, practical interstellar travel. One leg of interstellar travel, I think, is gravity control, uh, and we've uh, heard talks about various approaches to that. And the other leg is a hyperspace dimension. Uh, I think the hyperspace dimension is relevant for the time distance problem. Uh, as, as I've, uh, what, what we have here is sort of a way around the limitation uh, that Eric discussed earlier. Eric talked about warping space time but still obeying the speed of light locally. Uh, what we have here is the possibility of actually getting around the speed of light locally. And uh, I won't go into the details, but we have the normal four-dimensional length element with an extra piece that depends on the scalar field and uh, on the electromagnetic field. So uh, I think this is very good news because electromagnetic control of gravity is necessary for the human control of gravity. Um, of the four known forces of nature, we seem to be swimming in the electromagnetic field. We are electromagnetic beings. Um, we, don't, uh, we don't really control or engineer gravity. We don't really control or engineer the strong or the weak forces. But our metallurgy, our chemistry, our telecommunications, our energy generation, all our machinery is electromagnetic. So if we are to achieve practical interstellar travel, I think we want to be looking for some sort of electromagnetic means to do so. And the scalar fields that precision cosmology have revealed to us may indeed suggest uh, both electromagnetic control of gravity and electromagnetic control of the, the space-time interval and a possible solution to the time-distance problem. And that concludes my talk. We have time to uh, questions. Uh, thank you so much for that talk, um, Dr. Lance Williams. Uh, we actually have time for about three questions, so if anybody has uh, any questions. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. Are there any questions, Lance? I can't, I can't see. Uh, back there. This one here, uh, just a quick question. Um, you, you're treating dark matter as a scalar field. Um, the conventional approach is not to treat it as a scalar field, but rather as a um, possible exotic particle. Um, so I'm just curious. It's not, not a major point, but I'm just curious why you're treating it as a uh, scalar field. Uh, yeah, I, I would be the first to admit that the conventional wisdom is that dark matter is a gravitating substance of some sort, and I think there's recent evidence where galaxy collisions have sort of separated the dark matter from the visible. But in the, uh, in the Friedman equation, it's a scalar field in there along with everything else. So by scalar field, I just mean how it's parameterized in the Friedman equation. It could be something more complex. But uh, the point I just wanted to make is we have apparently quite a few scalar field candidates in the energy budget for the universe. I just want to comment that uh, in string theory, we can provide you not just with one, but six or seven compact dimensions and on the order of about two dozen uh, scalars like these per model. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't really have time to get into the Kaluza theory as I've written it here, but this fifth dimension is not compact. So that's a key distinction here. We, we're talking about a macroscopic dimension that we just don't see. And that's different than the way, you know, the whole compact dimension thing sort of veered off from Kaluza's hypothesis. And, and we began to think of these extra dimensions as compact. But what I've shown you is a macroscopic fifth dimension. Does that, I'm not sure. Right. 
Yeah, that's right. You're one of the few people that understands uh, that. Uh, yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, the uh, Kaluza had a macroscopic theory in mind. Klein came along and compactified it, and Kaluza Klein has been compact ever since. But, but I take the macroscopic interpretation. Okay, one more question. Hello. Okay. So, um, uh, something I, I wanted to add that uh, maybe it's relevant for this. So, um, uh, it's uh, it's thing is related with uh, with this, and I, I I was surprised I didn't see it mentioned today because that is uh, arguably a lower hanging fruit for for observational consequences. Uh, uh, there is a, uh, uh, the coupling between the Gauss-Bonnet uh, topological term on four dimensions, which, I, which uh, is not of, uh, has no any consequences on four dimensions. There's a, a theory that couples the inflation, inflation scalar with the Gauss-Bonnet term that actually may uh, allows stable Warm, uh, wormholes, uh, Lorentzian wormholes, and the, the interesting thing is that uh, uh, that theory almost matches general relativity in most observational cases, but has uh, has some constraints uh, on on the solar system. I, I, I was hoping to 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 see that today, um, but. Uh, so that's just a comment. I, I think I, I share uh, what you're saying. Uh, I think there's a rich field of research in this area to look for couplings between gravity and electromagnetism. Uh, but physics is sort of locked in this string theory, quantum gravity mode for the past century. And perhaps these uh, cosmological discoveries will maybe break us out of that. Hey, um, thank you all so much for the question. Uh, it's lunchtime, so um, I'm sure everybody's hungry now. So. Okay, well, I want everybody to thank Tiffany for uh, the morning session share. She did a fantastic job. Uh, since we're now behind, I want to have everybody back here for the afternoon session 3B, uh, chaired by Haley Bright, at 1.20 p.m., please. Thank you.
This episode of Eggbusters is brought to you by Earthbound for the Wii U Virtual Console. Austin, I thought the Mega Man X episode was brought to you by Earthbound. Well, yeah, guess what? It's my show and the game's just so gosh darn good, we're going to put it in front of two episodes. watching this. Well, look what it is. It's DuckTales. And it's back. And for Eggbusters, it's DuckTales time. The first DuckTales glitch we're doing is the same one that we did the first last time. It's called Scrooge Gets His Head Chopped. And by that I mean it's exactly the same, only it's different looking. Uh, we'll go to Transylvania level just like before. We gotta find that gut dang minecart. Now I haven't. If you have a business, you have a story. And of course, every story needs an audience. So, how do you.
else can I t say about you? There's a lot. I'll just, I'll take it. Okay. Well, I'll everybody welcome Haley Bright. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> she has a very long resume. Thank you. Uh, uh, hello, guys. Welcome back from lunch. All right, so let's just go ahead and get this started. Please welcome to the stage the very prestigious and lovely Dr. Rachel Armstrong. She is our keynote speaker this afternoon. She works with Icarus Interstellar and, as you guys know, a million other things. And um, she's going to be speaking on Project Persephone today. So welcome, Dr. Rachel Armstrong. Thank you, Haley, for that very warm welcome. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Put you there somewhere. There you are. Okay. I have my finger on the button. You're set. Okay. I'm set to go. I've got the finger and I've got the script. Yeah. And I don't know that you need a laser pointer, do you? Um, but yes, I would. Yes, I, w I would like a magic wand. Okay. Yes, please. You're set. Okay, we're good to go. Right. Just making sure that the buttons are going in the right direction. A world like ours, except for the emptiness. There is a small cluster of dwellings on a watery planet way beyond this solar system, where pioneering explorers called Newmans, who have come down from the artificial moon, hang out. They are joined in their terraforming activities by oddlings, who are not quite Newman. They have a more sprightly stride and a quicker eye for new signs of life. The Newmans have travelled across centuries to establish themselves on the planet Glyes 581G. This was rather a mouthful, so they renamed it Nostalgia. Their first terraforming move was to sprinkle their precious dirt from their homeland into the planet's atmosphere, which carried living seeds from their laboratory experiments. After decades, these creeping chemistries went native with interesting results. Now, slithering scoundrels flop, gaping out of the silt and flap tirelessly on the beach in an evolutionary race to gain a colonizing foothold on the hallowed land. While the sentinels, who have only just evolved their magnificent tri-legs, which raise their skinny bodies out of the puddles, scream, no room, and pick off the scoundrels in droves as they flail helplessly in the effort to dry dirt upgrade. But these frantic events make the planet sound like it's teeming with life, when it's not. Despite the sentinels' protests, there is plenty of room. Yet the ecosystem is fragile, and if it was not for the Newmans, it may have been another few billion more years before the carbon-rich silt yielded any life forms at all. However, once loosed, the Newman's laboratory cultures have made a very good job of metabolizing the dirt and have literally succeeded in eating themselves into existence. Every evening, in the 30-hour diurnal cycle, which is precision marked by the gazer clock, the Newmans stroll down to the brimstone lake and dip their bread with a giant spoon into the simmering waters so they can feast upon the protein-rich pinworms that devour the succulent bait. The pinworms have only one collective neuron that glows prettily when they swarm. But as lovely as their thin thoughts may be, they can weave no memory of the previous night's feast. So the pinworm learn nothing about their fate and continue to devour the bread made by the Newmans from flour that is carefully ground out of the leftovers from pinworm feasts. Yes, it's a strange place, but no stranger than the planet from which they hailed, a former blue watery planet where the ice caps had long melted and the only remaining evidence that there were ever oceans was a steam-clogged atmosphere that never stopped spewing torrential rain. The humans, the evolutionary ancestors of the Newmans built their world ship from space debris and fled their planet, which was in shockingly poor condition. The ship ripped itself from Earth's orbit as the nuclear fusion engines blasted an incandescent rainbow that scratched the ozone-thick troposphere 
and the already nostalgia-struck explorers rubbernecked for one last fleeting view of their home. They were expecting a memorable spectacle and were disappointed. The massive communications holofields gave them no farewell view of the pale blue dot of legend, but soiled their memories with a dirty grayish mass which was scarred by the creeping cracks of vast gullies, poisoned by leaking piles of toxic plastic and gnawed by flash floods. Indeed, these inhospitable conditions would drive the humans that remain to seek shelter as their world collapsed in an eyeless, subterranean existence. But of course, fantastic voyages to other worlds and what adventures they may hold are as old as storytelling. Yet in the modern age, we have access to technologies that enable us to write our dreams beyond the world of stories and transcribe our imaginations into physical forms. It is impossible to say which leads, reality or our imaginations, since the two are so tightly coupled that philosophers are unlikely to ever need to worry about their own obsolescence. And yet, surfing the tidal time wave of change not only requires agile thinking and the capacity to act upon it, but also relies on our ability to think beyond our conventions and customs. At the start of this millennium, we have adopted a condition of comfortable familiarity and romantic idealization of our resources on Earth. Under the self-regulating gaze of Gaia, these rather magically never really get old, run out, or even poisonous. An irony indeed, as our industrial processes turn our cherished idols into toxic landscapes that are not quite fatal, described by Rachel Carson. While futurists look to the horizon or scan the blue skies for solutions to the conditions faced by humanity in the 21st century, they seldom seek to explore the black sky for insights and boldly probe the possibilities of the completely unknown. Indeed, some consider interstellar exploration a folly when there are more immediate problems to fix using our tried and tested approaches. Yet when these established methods are actually part of the problem itself, it is time to take Einstein's advice and step outside of our comfortable cognitive space that gave rise to the problems in the first place and plunge into the abyss of black sky thinking. Not as a self-destructive act, but as a creative tactic to uncover fertile terrains that may inform our choices and actions and inform current and future generations both on Earth and amongst the stars. Yet if we are to conceptually and physically leave the planet for the sake of human advancement and expansion, then we first need to consider what it means to be earthbound. Earthbound is a term used by French philosopher Bruno Latour to describe humans that recognize the Earth's ecology as being integral to their identity. Earthbound therefore depicts a cultural condition for those generations that are always heading for Earth as they are unable to escape its materiality and its laws. In interstellar terms, we are earthbound, being tied to and shaped by our materiality and seeking other habitable Earths that will promote our survival. Perhaps we may even carry out native terrestrial soils with us so we may flourish in lands way beyond our origins. I am project leader for Persephone which is one of the Icarus interstellar projects that catalyze the construction of a crewed interstellar craft within 100 years in Earth orbit. And I'm responsible for the design and implementation of a living interior to the world ship. Although details of Icarus interstellar have not been formalized, the ideas that I will share with respect to the design and engineering of Persephone are best suited to a slow, wet world ship. You may even imagine this soggy interior as being, in a very physical sense, alive. If it is to survive interstellar travel over evolutionary timescales, which may exceed a thousand years or so, then it will need to gather resources from extraterrestrial sites. So with that in mind, where do you start 
in designing and developing a living interior for such a vessel. The vital technologies for a world ship do not depend solely on mechanical systems, but also on soft nature-based ones, like the ones, for example, that encircle the outer surface of our own planet, which carry out useful work through metabolism and challenge our notions of control through their innate agency. Indeed, for a living system to be sustained, it needs to be kept from reaching equilibrium. In other words, the design and engineering priorities are to preserve flow and flux within the system, rather than maintaining the integrity of a hierarchical series of objects, as in the case of machines. But once living systems are established within a niche environment, they bring many unique features that increase survivability, such as robustness, flexibility, the ability to deal with unexpected events, the capacity for propagation, and the propensity to adapt and evolve, even when there is a relatively limited flow of exchange, as in a troglodyte cave. In thinking about evolutionary timescales, they are most frequently depicted in space operas as modifications of current humans and machines where the surroundings, the living spaces in the world ship may be taken as a constant. But in space, the fate of the earthbound is tightly coupled to more than just their machines. When they evolve, it is with their entire ecology. And whilst we do not need to factor this in in a terrestrial setting, it may be critical to take a holistic view for long-term space colonization. Persephone therefore aims... Sorry. <laughs> Did I... To, to work with Thinking world about evolution as extended human ecosystems, they are most frequently depicted as a point in space operas as on our modifications current of current humans challenges. and machines where the surroundings, Perhaps the living spaces, heard someone observe that the human body is 90% bacteria. These collections of microbes are called human biomes and they appear to be critical to our health, nutrition and even in regulating our moods. Whilst we consider these relationships as being symbiotic in a terrestrial environment, we have no idea what happens to them over prolonged times in world ships, especially as bacteria evolve much faster than we do. Well, not quite no idea. The salmonella pathogen has been shown to increase in virulence three to seven times under reduced gravity in the ISS as a result of fluid shear, which makes the bacteria think they're inside a gut. However, from an ecosystem's perspective, Persephone is also aware of the very difficult task it faces as the new kid on the block in the challenging legacy of biosphere design. Richard Buckminster Fuller viewed the Earth as a well-provisioned ship on which we sail through space, a neatly cling film wrapped pale blue dot surrounded by a dark murky universe that, separated, uh, was, that was separated from the cosmic fabric by its exalted earthness. But David Deutsch has criticized Fuller's lyrical idea of spaceship Earth as a harmonious habitat afloat in a barren cosmos as being difficult to defend, even metaphorically. In only 4.5 billion years, our sun will become a bad-tempered bad red dwarf, prone to cosmic fits of ill temper that will swallow us whole. Deutsch echoes Darwin's view of the world governed by a nature that is red and tooth and claw, and while it creates, it is also ready to tear our world apart. The first real effort to create a terrestrial arc to demonstrate that careful management alone can produce functional closed systems was the Soviet BIOS 3 series of experiments that ran from 1972 to 1984. They supported a community of three people supported with an algal cultivator and a phytron, where sunlight was stimulated to grow wheat and vegetables. Whilst BIOS 3 demonstrated that chlorella algae could produce oxygen and that it was possible to recycle up to 85% of the water in the system, it was not a closed biosphere. Dried meat and energy were provided from external sources and human waste was stored instead of being recycled back into the system. 
The mission was attempted again with Biosphere 2 in the 1990s that aimed to understand how people in close confines in a closed ecological system could work together over a sustained period. Yet it was quickly clear that despite being equipped with a desert rainforest and ocean, it was going to be very difficult to create a sustainable environment. Oxygen levels steadily fell. The ocean acidified. Internal temperatures rose, carbon dioxide levels fluctuated, vertebrates and pollinating insects died, while the crew became depressed, dysfunctional and malnourished. Only the cockroaches and ants thrived. Of course, there's nothing sustainable about closed systems. Despite McDonough's and Brannock's success with promoting their industrial-friendly cradle-to-cradle approach, the truth is that closed systems with living things in them are coffins and will ultimately grind down to an entropic halt. Regardless of the attractive view that Fuller paints of our world, Earth is not and has never been a closed system. It gets external energy, lots of it, from the sun, and it is constantly bombarded by cosmic rays, one of the sources of mutation and variation in our DNA. Yet for those who would like to insist that the Earth is closed because effectively no matter leaves the planet, other than the notable exceptions of space telescopes, robots, kilograms of bacteria and piles of space junk, it is perhaps worth remembering Einstein's equation equals mc squared. This elegant concept describes matter and energy as different versions of the same thing. So in physical terms, our planet being soaked in sunlight can be regarded as receiving a continual flow of matter. Indeed, the Earth receives many cosmic packages in a more mat familiar material form as meteorites, asteroids and cosmic dust. Our planet is being rained on from space. The majority of meteors that bombard the Earth are little more than particles of dust. Larger ones enter the Earth's atmosphere and rapidly burn up to form small meteors and micrometeorites. 10,000 tons of this extraterrestrial shrapnel falls on the Earth every day. Admittedly, the more spectacular large-scale material payloads are no longer so frequent in the vacuum of space, they're abundant, but they're not that rare in the history of Earth. Indeed, Paul Davis notes that the Earth's oceans were leftovers from intense asteroid bombardment during the Hadean period. And earlier this year, of course, an asteroid exploded over the region of Chelyabinsk in Russia, bringing its heavenly gifts of destruction, mayhem, and a smattering of weakly magnetic radioactive rocks. My point is that in proposing a living interior for a world ship which contains living things, the system needs to be imagined and designed as an open system, or our world ship will become the universe's most beautifully designed and best traveled compost heap. Yet even if we can build a world ship to operate within an open cosmic system that can munch on cosmic foods such as electromagnetic spectra and dirty asteroids, there is an even deeper issue to address which relates to the way that we design and engineer with lifelike systems. In 1948, Erwin Schrödinger noted that the characteristic of life is that it resists the day decay towards entropic equilibrium. This observation is profoundly important when thinking about the design of an of environment for living things, as it requires us to consider far from equilibrium conditions as the substrates for our interventions. This flies in the face of all our design efforts to, um, to date in history, because when we design, we generally assume that our surroundings are at equilibrium, and therefore we are engaged in a culture of making objects. Yet if we look at the very large and very small scales of existence, this object-centered version of reality does not hold true. When the atom was split last century, strange subatomic particle worms were released into reality and into our imaginations as leptons, bosons, and hadrons. And when we dive down into the nature of these massless specks of matter, they are anything but still, existing as probabilistic clouds of nearly nothingness. Their essence is so primitive that they do not exist in nature and can only be experienced in the most indirect way of seeing anything ever. In the biggest Swiss watch ever made, the Large Hadron Collider, a whole particle superhighway is dedicated to evidencing the imperceptible. 
Buried 100 meters underneath the Swiss-French border, the LHC viewing platforms orchestrate minuscule Ballardian fantasies by smashing primordial plasma streams of hydrogen and lead ions into one another. As these particles shatter in layers upon layers of thick sensate materials, sophisticated algorithms interpret their screams from the wreckage and translate them into digital visualizations. And once you've witnessed the screams of a particle dying, how can anything around you ever be still again? In building a new world, Persephone is therefore invoking the existence of a new nature. And if we are to design a space that supports dynamic systems, then we must learn to design effectively at non-equilibrium states and create environments with material flows whose cultural equivalent is dirt. Design hates dirt. It is aesthetically and materially subversive. Yet the various forms of dirt, such as shit and grit and dust, when combined, have powerful transformative potential. In space, shit is surprisingly useful. Dennis Taito's ship will protect its astronauts from cosmic radiation using food and water, which contains more radiation absorbing atoms than metal. And since organic matter blocks rather than absorbs the radiation, it apparently also remains safe to eat. The lucky married couple's excrement will gradually replace these larder supplies during their round trip to Mars scheduled for 2018. Yet practical development of the concept is needed so Taito's space honeymooners and generations after them don't find themselves in a round trip to a substandard hotel in Benidorm full of unpleasant sights and smells. However, these concepts add ecological depth to the idea of space travel. More than 90% of wastewater can be recovered using membrane filtering techniques, and indigestible fiber in human feces can be transformed into a material that resembles an adobe brick wall. Greenhouse gases, namely carbon dioxide, methane gas, and water vapor, can also be harvested. And while these processes are not cost-effective in short-term missions, in long-term missions, where systems are effectively closed, these approaches are increasingly valuable. Therefore, when building for world ship interiors, it is worth remembering that all civilizations are founded on their relationship with the potent transformer that we call soil. Persephone's first task is to identify her native soils, to transform and develop them into subjects worthy of design, exquisite stuff that is not simply a life support system, but provides the very context and meaning for living processes. Soils are a living web of relationships within complex bodies that will eventually grow old and die. Plants take roots in the rich chemical medium and bind the particles together to attract animal life. Conversely, soil harbors fungi and bacteria that break down the bodies of dead creatures and turns them into more soil. The speed of this dynamic conversion process varies. In fertile areas, it may take 50 years to produce a few centimeters of soil but in harsh deserts, it can take thousands of years. Soils are biological cities. They house, nourish, and provide the vital infrastructure for terrestrial life, which laid the foundations for the establishment of ecosystems, the evolution of humans, and the construction of the built environment. The rich complexity of soil systems provides a model and literal substrate for a built environment that can self-maintain and connect with ecological systems. On the face of it, it may appear a straightforward thing. I did want to turn that down. Is that, can I turn, turn the sound down? It's just, it's just a, a, a tourist commentary. Oh, okay. Okay, that was, okay. On the face of it, it may appear a straightforward thing to grow a soil, like we might construct a building. Soil scientists observe how we can mix the various particles, adjust the acidity, compost the organic substrate, and bring these inorganic and organic worlds together. But making a soil is more than measuring ingredients for a recipe. They are composed of matter that possesses the vibrancy and vivid hues of the rainbow, embody the poetry of symbiosis, and perhaps most importantly, they are our binding contract with nature. But how may we form a contract with nature in space where there is no native biology, only physics and chemistry? Over the last few years, I've been working with living chemistries and synthetic biologies, shaping materials that possess a will and exert a force of their own. 
These materials have formed primitive dynamic cell-like structures or protocells. I've also been able to clump these primitive chemical assemblages into oily vessels to punctuate the cybernetic hylozoic ground installation, a collaboration with architect Philip Beasley, where they fix carbon dioxide from gas-hungry solutions into artificial smell and taste systems. You can see one of these um, little organs sitting in the, in the middle of this uh, jungle-like cybernetic matrix. I've also used gravity to infiltrate gel-like matrices that creep towards the ground, producing lisergang bang bands of chemical separation and reconciliation. And I have exploited the relentless splitting of crystals into rhizomatic mucus fronds which lengthen and grow when entangled with carbohydrate polymers. Persephone proposes to create her soils before she even contemplates the possibility of life by applying the physical and chemical principles of their native environment. She aims to develop an architectural practice of natural computing, a term inspired by Alan Turing's interest in the computational powers of nature to produce a new kind of spontaneously self-organizing and autopoietic system that is unique to the world ship. Persephone will harness the creativity of particle worms and develop their connections at different scales using the parallel processing power of chemistry to create a condition of fertility that within definable limits of probability may give rise to its own lifelike events. Soil is a probabilistic matrix that is peppered with events and flows within which life is not inevitable but increasingly feasible. Soil hosts many chemical events that arise from the horizontal coupling between dynamic chemical systems. It may give rise to living things by facilitating chemical assemblages such as Stuart Kaufman's notion of autocatalytic sets. It offers a fertile field in which living things are anthropogenically midwifed into existence by farming technologies. Yet by while, while life is the event by which we may measure the success of soils, it is the product of a multitude of partnerships that form the heaving, squirming mass of soil bodies. Soils are the site of huge amounts of metabolic work, which shapes the muck that decides where the ecosystems will thrive and ultimately produces the conditions that gives rise to cities. And here is where Persephone's challenges begin. Although this presentation began with a story, the project itself is real and fully intends to go beyond fiction proposing that the way of opening up new worlds is firstly through the imagination, where uncertainty is a driver for radical creativity in a probabilistic cosmic landscape, the black sky. Whatever the odds of Persephone's success in her endeavors, she is aware that she will not triumph because of the odds, but in spite of them, Indeed, the only way to guarantee her and our own extinction is simply to take our continued existence for granted and hand over control to the ants and cockroaches without trying anything new or daring at all. And now, the oddlings looked up to the sky under the green light reflected from their artificial moon, simply called Newman. Sometimes they could see the stars twinkling between the tracks in its reg regolith and asteroid shell. And at other times they wondered how things might change when the other Newmans came down to settle nostalgia's surface. But each night, little changed. The pinworms continued to swim brainlessly in the brimstone. The scoundrels floundered and the sentinels wrapped their long necks around their tri-legs as they settled down for ten long hours sleep before the dawn broke and all the metabolic slithering started again. They will not be a new story's beginning, rather the creation of a new chapter. Their expectations and hopes are already being created on earth today. Thank you. So we have about 10 minutes for questions. Do you want to take questions? Yeah, I'll take Ooh, questions. My gosh, there's a lot. Okay, we'll start right here. Right here, in the front. In that beautiful and poetic presentation, I notice you refer to Persephone uh, almost as a person. 
she will do such and such. And, and it, your worldship then is conceived not so much as machinery carrying people, but as a living organism itself. Am I not right about that? Yes, abs absolutely, yes. And, and, and living, living is right. I mean, I think there's been a lot of controversy with the whole history of Gaia, you know, as whether or not it's alive. Um, and, and I think there's a very, that, that livingness is, is a quality that we've actually neglected very much in terms of thinking about the origins of life. You know, something like a, a virus has livingness but may not necessarily be alive. And, and I think it's a, it's, it's a very interesting space for looking for new technologies. And w w what I mean by technology, so I use Heidegger's definition of technology, which essentially is a process of revealing that speaks about deeper truths in, uh, in the kind of the substrates that we're making interventions in. And therefore, technology is the way that the mind becomes embodied in the process of problem solving. So essentially, yes, a horse can be a technology, a technology for transport, um, but so can a car, so can a boat. Um, so, in, in other words, it's, it's getting away from a, 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 an object-centered view of, um, I guess, activity and, and looking at process-based um, uh, philosophies. You know, so centered on, there's something called process philosophy, you know, which, which originates you know, from Heraclitus, who believed that you know, the universe was, was constantly in flux. You know, and that has given rise to a whole series of uh, you know, philosophical texts that start to articulate process as a kind of technology. And of course, the biggest technology of process is nature herself. But we don't look at nature as a technological platform, even though we've had at least 30 years of biotechnology that have actually opened up this as a potential space. So that you know, if we can collapse the dichotomy between nature and machine, I think that creates a very interesting cultural, sociological, and technological context. And, and I guess for me, this is the space that, that I would like to explore. Again, it doesn't exist yet, but that doesn't mean that it, it's, it's, it's um, a fiction. Um, there are a number of different fields, um, defined as natural computing as a broad umbrella, um, and they're overlapping interests. So some things like um, unconventional computing, um, so the expert of that would be Andy Adamatsky at the University of West England, who's working with dynamic chemistries and slime molds. Um, there's also morphological computing, another one that I'm really interested in, and it's come from the field of robotics, where the body of the robot itself contributes to the computational solution. I mean, so these fields are just starting to emerge, and they're not really very clearly articulated, but they, they seem to me to be a very potent technology, particularly one if, that we potentially could take in a world ship where really the, the stuff of life is really um, you know, key to our existence. Hi, uh, you showed a picture on one of your slides that uh, had like a cave-like structure with like roots and stuff. You said it was like giving off smells. I guess I was wondering what uh, lab or this um, one, of, one of these and um, um, one of these some hylozoic ground. Or the, one of these things. Uh, it was one with like uh, root-like structures. You said were hanging down and uh, create smells like. Oh, this one. Oh, so, one. Yes. So, 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 so this is a. This was an installation for the Venice Biennale in, in uh, 2010. Um, a collaboration with Philip Beasley, and he asked me to design a set of chemical organs for this, um, uh, I guess, um, plastic jungle that he'd been um, creating, which is. Um, it's, it's a very, it's a very in interesting space. It has proximity sensors, so it is. Uh, I, I was going to say aware, but I kind of realised that the kind of whole consciousness thing can be a little bit confusing. So I mean, so so it it, it senses um, the presence of people, um, and what he wanted to do was to add a, a chemical complexity to that. So these these series of organs. I mean, uh, uh, so this was a, a, a sensor that literally. Um, uh, fixed carbon dioxide with a very simple um, inorganic chemical reaction. So, a, you know, a soluble carbonate turns into an insoluble carbonate and changes colour in the process. And because of um, smell and taste being based on the um, you know, detection of um, you know, s uh, substances in solution, um, you know, 
Lyrically, it was described as a smell and, and taste organ. But there were a number of different organs in here. These were um, hygroscopic islands here. This was very interesting because this starts to talk about the, the, the thing that the, uh, you know, the, the, the scoundrels are doing, you know, literally making that transition from an aqueous environment into the dry land. And in order to do that, you need to bring your sea with you. So how does the sea travel with you? And so these ideas of hygroscopic islands, islands that are actually absorbing and you know, curating flows of water within a space, you know, become very interesting, almost like proto-organs. Um, so in some ways, you know, whereas Arto, you know, has a BWO, which is the body without organs, in some ways that, you know, Persephone is a BWO, a body, um, you know, with organs, and an architecture with organs. These spaces are, you know, inviting um, metabolic exchanges, you know, engaging, I guess, in the, 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 the complexity of chemistry when it is separated through space and time. So, for example, these um, metabolic processes that you see in, the, um, in, in this very simple system here, which is, um, uh, there's an oil field. Uh, this is um, simply uh, uh, hydroxide, um, and they're making soap. So they make these little soap-like tails. But really, the, the system is incredibly complex. They have very lifelike behaviors. They move around their environment. They can sense it. They interact with each other in almost these, I'm, I'm going to anthropomorphize wildly, OK? So this is not scientific. This is, this is poetic. I mean, they, they form these almost social groupings. Um, and then when they're in these social groupings, they, they can interact further and undergo tipping points in which you get uh, morphological and behavioral transformations. Now, this is really interesting because all you've got is olive oil and you know, sodium hydroxide 3 molar. Try it at home. Look at it underneath the microscope. Um, so, I mean, just, just very, very simple um, chemical reactions when separated through space and time, have actually very different physical properties. And that, for me, is where the idea of soil as technology comes from. I mean, obviously, we've used soil as a technology, you know, since we were farming. You know, we've used soil as the technology to promote fertility, to feed ourselves in the agrarian revolution. Um, you know, so that just because it is you know, natural, because it happens spontaneously through the terrestrial process on Earth, does not mean that it doesn't have technological potential. And so in some ways, you know, we're revisiting the idea of, of what a soil is doing in order to promote fertility, in order to increase the probability of, of, these, of these tipping points in creative ways and tipping points in the other way. But really, you know, what exactly does it mean to design a field, a field of probability, rather than the object itself? And perhaps you know, that is a way of looking at how we might design experiments for um, testing and interrogating the origin of life. Perhaps it will help us you know, identify life on other planets because we're looking for fields of um, activity rather than very discrete things. I don't know, but these are, these, are, these are technologies that are starting to, you know, when you start to think of these chemical systems as being technological, you know, it raises another set of questions, um, and, and framing those appropriately may help us move into different spaces in terms of our own research and development in, in this, this particular field of interstellar exploration. We have time for one more question. Rachel, you pointed out that uh, Biosphere 2 sp failed spectacularly, and we would hope informatively. Uh, given that the challenge still exists to create a habitat and rise to that challenge, let me pose a thought experiment. Imagine we found a wealthy enough benefactor that we could actually proceed with a prototype, uh, building a prototype given existing technologies towards Persephone, and you were the project lead. How would we proceed with existing technologies, especially when it comes to that enclosure question? Yeah, I, I, I think this is a, a, a fantastic question. I, per, I personally would like to spend more time designing soils. And essentially, my, 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 my thoughts around this is that, you know, if you have a fertile soil, you can support a lot of people. If you have a very poor and spartan soil, like in deserts, you know, you can have a population of one, perhaps in, you know, like 30 square kilometers. You know, and that is really important when we're thinking about a world ship. You know, it, it will actually help dictate what the population population density could be. And I think it's really important for us to you know, appreciate that we are ecosystems and not simply you know, isolated bodies, you know, that we are connected to almost like you know, root-like systems you know, that do spread through bacteria. A tree is much of a, a breathing system as our lungs are. You know, without that oxygen, you know, we're going nowhere. 
Um, so, so maybe to reframe some of the questions and some of the challenges that were looked at with Biosphere 2, I'm certainly not someone to negate what has gone on before. I think the, the thing is to learn from you know, those experiments, and it's very important that we continue to have these kinds of experiments. Um, but I, I, I personally believe that you know, something to do with the, the chemistry of soil and the way that that invites us to think, think ecologically is really key to you know, developing a, 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 a productive project. Rachel, thank you very much. That was a wonderful talk. All right, guys. Well, now we have Ken Roy from the Ultimax Group. He's going to be speaking on shell worlds and approach to terraforming small rocky worlds. So please welcome to the stage, Ken. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. So no problems. I guess one comment I would make is uh, getting there is uh, half the battle, but you've also got to give thought to what do you do once you get there. Uh, one of the objectives of traveling to another star, and there are probably a lot of other objectives, but one of the objectives I'm, I'm going to be talking about is colonization. It's unlikely that once we get to a, an alien star system that we're going to have a uh, a world that we can move into, uh, so we're looking at terraforming. Terraforming is uh, the art or the practice uh, or the technology of converting uh, an inhospitable world into a, a world suitable for human life. And we're going to be talking about one approach to terraforming that my colleagues and I have termed uh, the shell world approach. Uh, this was first published in the JBIS in the January 2009 edition. Since then, we've submitted a second paper that has not yet been published that expands on the idea, and we'll be going over some of those ideas here. Uh, I've got a lot of material to cover. I'll go over it pretty quick. If uh, someone is, if, if there's questions or, or comments that uh, we can't get to, please feel free to talk to me afterwards. Okay, let's talk about uh, planets. Uh, the top planet here is, uh, is Earth, an artist's impression of Earth. We have exactly one of these in the entire uh, universe, and we should take very good care of it. Uh, the lower left, we have a, uh, a living world. Uh, I guess we call it a, a, an Earth 2. Uh, and that's kind of the gold standard of uh, exploration. Let's find a, uh, an Earth 2 and, and move into it. I, I would suggest that there's a couple of issues that uh, we need to consider before we do that. You know, one is, is of course, uh, ethics. By definition, a living world has uh, life on it, and if we interfere with it, we need to understand what we're doing. And the second issue is, is just safety. Uh, the alien life may not take kindly to us uh, invading their space. Uh, the world on the right is intended to represent uh, uh, an Earth-sized planet that is uh, barren. Uh, this is the kind of world that uh, traditional terraforming techniques would uh, work very well on. Marty Fogg and a number of other terraformers have uh, discussed about how to turn such a world uh, into uh, an Earth 2, uh, uh, you know, to, to terraform it, to change it. And it's going to take a long time, but we can make a, a second home for the human race. Uh, the shell world approach, which I'm going to be talking about, is really optimized for smaller worlds, like, uh, such as Mars. Uh, we have Mars on the, the left, and then a couple of uh, hypothetical worlds, you know, one larger, one smaller. And then we have Pluto. We're going to be talking about the Plutoids uh, a little bit. But all, all of these would be candidates for uh, uh, you know, terraforming from a, a shell world standpoint, with a, a shell world standpoint. Let's talk about Mars, not because you know, there's any particular you know, reason to terraform Mars. It's, it's close, and we can practice on it. but. Uh, keep in mind, we're, we're really talking about Mars-type worlds, not, not Mars in, in specific. 
uh, although uh, here we'll look at Mars. Uh, the gravity is about one-third that of Earth. Uh, the surface area of Mars is equal to the land area of Earth, uh, so it, it's fairly big. It has no magnetic field to speak of, uh, no indication of plate tectonics. Uh, it's geologically dead, which means that its uh, inner core has, uh, has frozen. But, you know, dead is not a bad thing. That means you don't have to deal with volcanoes and, and earthquakes. So I'd, I'd say that's a, a good thing. And, you know, some other information there. Here's what Mars would look like if we use a traditional terraforming approach on it. Again, the planetary, param planetary parameters have not changed. The uh, gravity's the same, uh, the day, the year, you know, they're pretty much what they were. We probably put large mirrors in space uh, reflecting sunlight onto uh, the planet in order to, to get to this point. We've imported lots of nitrogen uh, to create the atmosphere. Hopefully we can, uh, you know, get the oxygen from the soil. Um, we're probably doing something with the upper atmosphere to enhance the greenhouse effect. And if the atmosphere, uh, you know, provides Earth normal uh, conditions on the surface, you know, pressure, temperature, and, and composition, then the amount of uh, atmosphere that you will need to uh, provide an uncontained atmosphere on the, the planet Mars is you know, pretty much uh, about half of what the, the mass of the Earth's at atmosphere is. And also, because it's a small world, because it doesn't have a magnetic field, uh, it's going to bleed that atmosphere off uh, into space at, at some, some rate. And I haven't come across a good uh, quantification of how quickly that, uh, that gas goes. You know, maybe, maybe hundreds of years, thousands of years, you're going to have to replenish it to, to some extent. Okay, so what exactly is a shell world? Um, well, let's start with a, a natural world. Uh, we have an atmosphere on, on the surface, an uncontained uh, atmosphere that uh, we have on, on this world. And let's do a thought experiment. We go up uh, a particular distance, H, in, into the uh, atmosphere. And at that point, we create an, an imaginary shell that totally en encompasses the world. Um, that imaginary shell allows us to do two things. Uh, it divides the atmosphere into two parts, all the gas above, all the gas below. And it allows us to notice that uh, all the gas below this imaginary shell is pushing up on it uh, with a certain pressure. And all the atmosphere above is pushing down with an equal pressure. Now, to get to a shell world, let's do two things. Let's make the shell real give it mass, and let's take away all the atmosphere that's above the shell. Uh, we still have the uh, atmospheric pressure of the atmosphere below the shell pressing up, but now we have uh, mass and gravity uh, pulling down on the shell. If we're clever about the way we design the shell, we can, again, get these two forces to equalize. And as it turns out, the, the mass of the shell, if the mass of the shell equals the mass of the atmosphere we just got rid of, uh, the forces actually balance out uh, quite nicely. If you increase the mass of the shell a little bit, then the shell goes into uh, compression. If you remove some of the mass, then the shell goes into tension. But if you equalize the, the forces, uh, the shell is actually under uh, very, very little stress. And, and that's a good thing. Okay, if we were to construct a <coughs> shell on the planet Mars, what would it look like? Uh, here, we're going up uh, two kilometers, and the required mass loading is 25 metric tons per square meter. You know, that's fairly substantial. There's a lot of different ways to construct a shell. Here, we're proposing uh, a lower level of uh, Kevlar. Uh, this Kevlar layer is uh, a quarter of a meter thick, and on top of that, we're going to put a half a meter of uh, steel. The Kevlar needs to be airtight and watertight. Uh, the steel is there in order to distribute loads and also provide radiation shielding and uh, also to protect the, uh, the Kevlar layer from anybody who might be doing something on, on the surface. But that still doesn't get us up to our 25 metric tons. Uh, you know, we make up the balance by, by taking uh, dry dirt and piling it on top of the, the steel. And if you use the same density as dry soil here on Earth, this is roughly uh, what the shell will look like. 
And here's a, a guy on top of the shell to give you some idea of what the, the scale of this thing is. Uh, notice that the total amount of atmosphere we need under this shell is 6.6 percent .6 that of Earth. Uh, an uncontained atmosphere, remember, was 49 percent, so this is a substantial savings in uh, gases in order to uh, have a, a livable uh, world on the surface of Mars. Again, I'm, I'm assuming we have pressure, temperature, composition similar to what we have in, in, in this room. So that's two kilometers. Here we go to five kilometers. Uh, we need a little bit more gas to make up the atmosphere. The, uh, the pressure under the shell goes down and the, the shell itself gets a little smaller. 10 kilometers and 20 kilometers. At 20 kilometers, uh, the pressure under the shell is uh, low enough that humans can't really function without uh, supplemental O2. So, you know, that, that's an issue. We're pretty close to the 49% that we need for an uncontained atmosphere, but this is a contained atmosphere. Uh, on top of the shell, we have essentially a vacuum, and, you know, there are things that we can do with that. Okay, so that's what the shell looks like. Uh, this is what the shell world looks like. We have a central world, such as a, a planet like Mars. Uh, we put an atmosphere on it. Uh, composition, temperature, pressure of our choosing, let's assume that we want Earth normal. Uh, we put a shell around uh, the central world to contain this atmosphere. Uh, the atmosphere then exists between the shell and the central world. The outer part of the shell is essentially a, a vacuum. The surface of the planet then is pretty much Earth normal as far as uh, atmosphere, temperature, pressure, composition. Now you're standing in total darkness, and we'll talk about that in, in a minute. Uh, and the gravity is what the world provides you, but otherwise it could be very similar to uh, Earth conditions. Now one of the questions that comes up with a shell is, is the shell stable? Uh, you can't depend on the gravitational interaction of the shell and the, the central body because of Newton's shell theorem. But the atmosphere varies in pressure with uh, elevation, and that actually provides a restoring force, and we go into that in some detail in the second paper. So there is indeed a restoring force. The, the more you displace the shell, uh, the bigger the restoring force is. Uh, we talked about the fact that uh, the outside of the shell is uh, pretty much at vacuum, and that doesn't mean that you can't put industrial facilities on, on the shell if, if they're dirty or if they would benefit from having uh, access to, to vacuum. Uh, just, you know, you have to replace some of the dirt with an industrial facility and keep the mass loading pretty much the same. Uh, you'll need airlocks. Uh, the people will need to come and go. So there will be structures in the shell that uh, permit this. Uh, you won't be able to land big ships on the shell, but you should be able to land small shuttles. If the uh, shell is low enough, you can attach structures to the underside of the shell, and people can live and function in uh, those structures. If the shell is so high that the atmospheric pressure is not suitable for human habitation, then we can hang a structure or a city from the, the top of the shell. And here's what uh, one artist impression is of what such a, a structure would, would look like. If there are architects out there, you know, this might be an interesting challenge to, uh, to play with. Notice the uh, structural elements that we have uh, that support the, uh, the shell, uh, going up to the shell. And also notice the elevator, so you can you know, run materials and people up, up and down. So that's a possibility. Again, uh, you're dependent on artificial lighting, which is a good thing and, and a bad thing. Uh, windows won't work just because of the, the structural con uh, considerations. Um, the solar constant is uh, about 1,400 uh, watts per square meter, but it turns out plants aren't very efficient at using that light. They use about 18% uh, of that. And then the light's only available uh, part-time during the day. It turns out, if, if you work through the numbers, uh, all, all you need is 60 watts of light radiating at the right frequency uh, per square meter of the underside of the shell. Uh, you know, lit continuously in order to give plants enough light to, uh, to function well. Or you could turn it off for half the day and provide 120 watts. Now that's just for plants. Uh, humans would want more, so you would have to supplement that with uh, lights that uh, you know, make people happy. 
you wouldn't have to provide UV unless somehow the biosphere needs it. Uh, you might want to put UV over beaches. You know, that's part of the human experience, go to the beach and get sunburned. Well, people living on a shell world should have the same experience. Uh, IR, uh, you know, you provide that as heat, uh, that would be part of the way you would drive the, uh, the weather. And I would suggest that LED technology is getting, you know, pretty efficient, uh, and that's probably the way that we would provide lights. Uh, you, you, you can select your color. Uh, color and intensity inside the shell, completely independent of what the star provides you, and the day length is completely independent of the planet's uh, rotation. So a shell world is very much a designed world. Uh, designer biospheres, if it were up to me, I would be leaving out a lot of parasites, you know, fleas, ticks, mosquitoes, but, uh, you know, we'll have to see if we can actually do that. Designer skies, you can make the skies look like pretty much whatever you want. The lighting we talked about. Weather, uh, yeah, you can control the weather. Uh, that's certainly a possibility. Uh, you're going to need oceans. O oceans are a good place to wash the, uh, the salts of the land away. You've got to have some place to, to put that. Uh, Human-powered flight, because of the low gravity, that becomes a possibility. Hang the hanging city idea, you know, that, that's one of the things you might see. And then you have a choice. You want a single time zone for the whole world, or do you want uh, 24 time zones like we have now? Uh, need to mention low gravity. We know humans, you know, are optimized for 1G environments. Uh, we know that humans don't fare well in uh, microgravity, but we don't really know anything about how humans fare in low gravity environments. So this is a big open question that we're going to have to uh, find the answer to. If it turns out that humans have to have uh, 1G uh, in order to uh, survive and be healthy and reproduce, then we might have to put rotating structures on the surface of the, uh, the world in order to supplement the, uh, uh, the world's gravity. Or we modify humans. Uh, gamma ray burst. Um, these have been proposed as one solution to the Fermi paradox because, you know, if gamma ray bursts do what we think they do, uh, they, uh, you know, it turns out the galaxy could be essentially self-sterilizing. Uh, they come from a number of uh, causes that last from a fraction of a second to many months. Uh, but what's interesting is it's not the radiation that kills you, it's, it's your own sun. Uh, most of the energy absor is absorbed by the atmosphere. You break bonds, oxygen, nitrogen, that recombines into nitrous oxides. Uh, that chews up the uh, ozone layer that allows UVB to hit the, the surface of the world. And UVB is very destructive to human or, or to living tissue, not just humans. Uh, at the same time, it, it's reducing natural sunlight, you know, because of the dark clouds, and then the acid rain comes. Um, so, yeah, the biosphere takes a big hit. The atmosphere, we think, can regenerate in five or 10 years. The biosphere, you know, depending on how hard the hit, you know, could take hundreds of years. Any species that goes extinct is, is not coming back. And I mention this because although we're vulnerable on Earth, if you're on a shell world, you're pretty much immune. Uh, I talked about Pluto. You can take the same approach to uh, providing a, an environment around uh, you know, the Plutoids. The problem here is that when they formed, they incorporated a lot of uh, water ice. Uh, when they differentiated, all this ice flowed to the surface, froze. And we think on Pluto, although it's still kind of an open question, we're pretty confident that it has an ice layer 100 to 150 kilometers deep. So if you put a shell on it, uh, provide light, atmosphere, uh, you're going to have to live essentially with an ice world, or if you melt it, you're going to be living on an ocean world. So Pluto and, and its sisters, you know, they're very common. Uh, we can probably count on finding these no matter where we go, but uh, you're not going to be living on an Earth-like world. Paraterraforming, uh, who has heard of paraterraforming? Uh, it's another approach, okay, a few of you, another approach to uh, providing a, a contained uh, environment. Oh, okay. Uh, it's another approach to providing a contained environment uh, uh, by Dr. Uh, Richard Taylor. Uh, both have contained atmospheres, but I guess I would argue that the uh, approach is different, the outcomes are different. Uh, one is not a subset of, of the other. Uh, problems with the shell worlds, very energy intensive, 
very energy intensive, both to build and, and to operate. All, all these lights, artificial lights we were talking about, you're going to have to power them somehow. The heat, you know, that, that's going to be needed. Now, you could provide a shell world around uh, mercury, but there the problem is cooling, so you'll have to have active cooling systems. Uh, construction of the shell poses problems. I don't have time to uh, go into how we might do that. Biosphere construction. Uh, previous speakers have talked about the problems here. Um, that's going to be tough. Uh, to change a dead world into a living world is, is not easy. The shell and infrastructure uh, require continual maintenance. And then we have the problem that the uh, shell world is a, a project that requires commitment of vast time and, and resources and effort for a fairly distant uh, payoff. And then we have the low gravity question. Uh, the advantages of shell worlds. Uh, target worlds are common. And they're also uh, probably lifeless. We, we don't know if Mars is lifeless or not. Uh, if it is, then it would be, uh, there would be no ethical issues, at least that I can see, to uh, terraforming it. Uh, it allows for colonization of red dwarfs and brown dwarfs. And there's some question about whether red dwarfs have a habitable zone that is uh, really workable. But we don't care about a habitable zone. Uh, we can. You know, if we have a Mars-type world, we can put, put a shell around it and we can heat it or cool it um, without having to worry about what the sun's doing to us. Uh, we use less atmosphere than we would with an uncontained atmosphere. Uh, radiation protection, you know, the shell provides a fair amount of radiation protection. Uh, the inside of the uh, shell is completely independent of a uh, star's light and color. Uh, again, independent of the habitable zone, so you can, you know, find worlds uh, around red dwarfs, brown dwarfs. Red dwarfs are important because what, estimates are three quarters of all the uh, main sequence stars out there are red dwarfs. If uh, we you know, can include those in our list of colonization targets, we've really increased our odds. And also not affected by gamma ray events. You know, that, that could be very important. Uh, here's an artist's impression of what uh, life under a shell world might uh, look like. The uh, sky is going to be a little little funky, uh, hanging cities here and there. Um, again, low gravity so people can strap on wings and go flying. But, uh, you know, it, it could be a pretty nice place to live. doesn't have to be too grim. And the technology required to do this is, is not too exotic. Uh, we have most of the technology today. We're going to need vast amounts of energy, and we're going to need the ability to haul material around the solar system. In order to get the nitrogen, most likely, but uh, this is doable with the technology <coughs> we have today, except for energy and then the biosphere construction problem. So that's it. I, I want to live there right now. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, we have to, we have about two minutes for questions. Just a quick question about this compared to kind of another method of uh, creating worlds for people. Um, this is, as you say, a very energy intensive and very material intensive method, and that's, that's very fair. Um, but what does this give um, by comparison to something like a ring world ship, um, where we could induce gravity so we could deal with the gravity problem by spinning it? And you'd probably require less material than it would take to cover the surface of a small planet like Mars. A ring world ship. You're, you're talking about a, a, ge a generation ship? Um, so a, a Taurus. A Taurus. A, a space colony, I should clarify. A space colony. It's a large ring. It's self-enclosed. Oh, You're going to okay. induce the atmosphere and spin it to create gravity. A space colony, yeah, that's an option for uh, you know, the way people might want to live. Uh, you, you have to look at the, the radiation protection for space colonies, and, and I think uh, you know, that's pretty, pretty daunting. Also, the, the stresses of the materials in a space colony are going to be pretty, uh, pretty well challenged. One of the advantages here is that the shell again, if, if you design it properly, is under essentially no stress. And again, we, we go into the uh, uh, equations in uh, the papers. Uh, but yeah, here the materials are under very, very low stress with a uh, uh, paraterraformed world or a torus. The materials would be under fairly high stress. And metal fatigue uh, will get you in the end. So we actually are we're out of time for more questions. I see a lot of hands going up, but uh, well, grab them during our 10-minute break. You're going to be a busy guy on our break. Okay. Very good. Thank you. It's exciting to see.
must be all the questions that you guys want to ask. I'm sorry we don't have more time for it. I lost Cheryl's. Maybe that's it. Yeah, I think that's it. That's it. Okay. Thank you, Ken. That was very interesting. Um, okay, so now we're going to welcome a whole team to the stage. Um, speaking is Dr. Cheryl Bishop. She's from University of Texas Medical Branch, and we also have Michael Madsen from Magic Hour Films. They are speaking on Odyssey Global Personality Test for Generation Ship Crews. Please give them a warm welcome. Well, good afternoon. I've been a researcher into human performance in extreme environments as analogs for long duration and short duration space missions for about 25 years. And during that time, I've had the fortune of working in some very interesting environments with some extremely interesting people. They simply do not think the way the average person does. They can't in order to be effective in these environments. I've had the privilege of examining the inner life of desert survivalists deep cavers, Antarctic winter rovers, north and south polar trekkers, mountain climbers, a few astronauts here and there, and a host of individuals in various simulated environments of lesser or greater fidelity to a true extreme environment. Now, two years ago, I was contacted through a mutual friend and colleague, Dr. Gina Pelzis, by an extraordinary, innovative Danish documentary filmmaker, Mr. Michael Madston. He posed me an intriguing question. He asked, how would you pick the individuals to crew a one-way, multi-generational mission into deep space? Now, as a social psychologist working on the issue of how to select individuals for long-duration missions to Mars, I had a very short and frustrating answer because we don't know definitively how to do a good job to select the seven to 10 crew members for a three year round trip Mars mission. So the answer to selecting individuals for a one way mission into deep space was, we don't have a clue. Now that of course is the beginning of every journey of discovery. And so Odyssey was born. Let me take a very unscientific baseline poll right now. How many of you in this room would apply to be on a one way multi-generational mission into deep space right now. Raise your hands. All right, I want everybody to look around and remember which neighbor raised their hands. <laughs> okay, today we're going to tell you a little bit about Odyssey. We hope that you will find it as intriguing as we have found it over the last two years of discussion, designing, debating, revision, evolution, invention, and reinvention. The team consists of Dr. Regina Pelzes, if you'll raise your hand, Ms. Cecilia Valstead, and Mr. Michael Madston, and myself, plus a group of graphical designers we have been driving crazy for the last two weeks. To, talk, to start the story, I'm going to give you Mr. Michael Madston. documentary director and conceptual artist and I became interested in interstellar travel through my previous documentary Into Eternity which will be airing on American television next Sunday but has also been screened in, in the theaters around the world. Now Into Eternity explores the world's first attempt at creating a permanent solution to the nuclear waste problem, a self-contained 100,000 years bunker. Finland. The challenge to store um, nuclear waste safely over that span of time and protect this repository from accidental intrusion by humans in the distant future, that's what the task is for that facility. Um, and to try to protect that facility from people who may be unaware of, it, of its existence. My question was, by making that film, what does this facility tell me about the time that I live in? We have to build something that can operate without any human interference for 100,000 years 
and protect against human curiosity. In other words, the deepest question into eternity is if we humans can actually trust ourselves. The consensus of those interviewed in the film, and they're all the leading experts in the world, they're the ones who are actually responsible to creating this template, this first template for handling nuclear waste. Um, they all say that, no, we cannot trust ourselves across these generations and these vast time spans. Now, as we began to work on Odyssey, a parallel documentary project, The Visit, emerged and is in its final stages right now of being filmed. The Visit explores the speculative scenario, scenario of a visit to Earth by extraterrestrial intelligent life. And it asks another simple question, what would we actually do? What would it mean? What would we do on a practical level? The stakeholders in the visit includes the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, NASA, ESA, and the International Space University, among others. All the participant experts are the actual capacities who most likely would be contacted in case, in case of this scenario. A little bit about my background that was. Now, why the Odyssey project? Any Starship mission will literally also be a journey outside of time and space and it may so also tell us something about ourselves. And the question that Odyssey will ask is simple, but it's much more difficult to ask, uh, but it's much more difficult than any talk about propulsion systems. The question is who would qualify to actually crew a ship? The deepest question, um, that lies or hides in this question, or the deepest level of that, is how much would you be preferred, preferred, prepared to sacrifice? And one may add, add, can you actually remain human in such an attempt? So what is Odyssey? Now Odyssey is a worldwide personality assessment as well as a method for creating a database for scientists and a tool for personal reflection that functions as a stimulus for debate. A global two-way exploration to evolve the critical questions and issues on the nature of the qualification of those who compose a society of any worldship. What are the real questions that has to be asked? Now, Odyssey will be a highly visual, high-concept documentary film for cinema and television, but foremost, It'll be an app-based experience for anyone in the world to experience, to test him or herself up against the questions which must be asked if any such mission has to have any hope of success. Odyssey's realness will consist in its creation of a journey of a deep understanding through a profound exploration of the necessities of the closed loop environment and the unavoidable constraints any starship will constitute. It will be an odyssey through the predictable events any such mission will encounter, taking the audience full circle to a proto-society not experienced since the hunter-gatherer societies, but not as a result of some kind of science fictional gen degeneration, but because of the real, actual, inevitable necessities dictated by such a mission. Odyssey's closed loop environment constitutes a radical cancellation of modern Western civilization's belief in the individual self-realization, freedom, as the seat of all purpose. Odyssey is, in other words, a very interesting counter image to our time in which the good of the group triumphs the freedoms of the individual. This is what we will be up against when first venturing into the infinite. And this is what we must begin to try to understand now. The real question for interested of flight 
is not the ship in technical terms. It is the people to crew it, since it is their needs that will define the parameters of the world ship they must inhabit. Odyssey is a very practical approach. It is the foundation for such a travel. The film and its related online transmedia universe will allow us to tap and extract statistics, behavior, and central concerns from a worldwide audience. Furthermore, the human-related question seems to me to be central to the global issues this, contrast, this Congress is pursuing, namely the grand narrative, or a grand narrative, a common worldwide galvanization of the general public on why to travel to the stars. Yet, as Kim Stanley Robinson wrote concerning the colonization of Mars, you have to be sane to go and insane to want to. Intergenerational space flight is nothing but a series of firsts and unknowns, as we have no real simulations nor Earth analogs. But to give you a sample of the, un the unavoidable issues that we already have identified, I give you back Dr. Bishop. Here are some of our questions we're going to be addressing. All right, you've heard the raison d'etre for Odyssey. The film is, in essence, a personality evaluation in which you, the prospective applicant, are challenged to consider some fundamental questions that operationally define the world that will be Odyssey. To, quantify, to qualify as a crew member, you must fit. Unlike this world, accommodation to variability will be extremely limited. If at any point you find yourself saying, oh my God, no way, then that would be the time to stop viewing the film, to end the discussion that you will be immersed in. For you will have found your limits, the limits to what you will be willing to do in order to be a part of such a mission. And limits are what define any mission. So, to give you a fit sense of how profoundly different Odyssey will be, we've chosen a couple of questions in our personality assessment to present here today for you to think about. The first one, are you prepared to leave everything and everyone you have ever known behind forever? Now, before you dismiss this with a glib yes, and that is um, a familiar response I get when I pose this to different people, Consider the ramifications of this question. There are about 500 of us here at the conference and in the hotel premises at this time. Let's say you now are told the doors have been sealed. You will spend the rest of your life on these premises. You will not be allowed to leave. You may talk with those on the outside for a few, several years, but communication will become increasingly more difficult with the lag. All the windows would be blacked out, and at only one vantage will you be allowed to see a rapidly dwindling new view of Earth. You will never see a blue sky, a mountain, an ocean, the Dallas rush hour traffic, or a skyline again that isn't simulated. You will never experience weather or seasons. Day and night cycles will be maintained, predictable, and unchanging. You will live and die with the individuals sitting next to you or who you've passed in the hallway for the last several days. Your children will live and die with their children and so on for many generations to come. This is your world forever. Next question. Are you ready to put the needs of the many ahead of the few? Now. How many of you are here are Vulcan? <laughs> since we knew that the audience would be immediately appreciative of the realities of a closed loop system, since many of you are engineers, we knew we had to include one of the questions that addresses the pragmatics of such a system. What we will present to the audience in the film are the hard facts. A closed loop society, those individual freedoms that we take for granted, for instance, the right to choose our mate. 
the right to choose where we work, the right to move from one place to another, becomes secondary to the needs of the mission and the society that must fulfill that mission. You may choose the person you marry, but probably not the person with whom you will procreate, or even if and when you will pre procreate. Finite environments have to be tightly managed. Population is a resource, not a right. There will be functions that have to be fulfilled. Most are not glamorous or exciting. There needs to be plumbers and janitors and engineers. There need to be farmers and food service and astrophysicists. There must be those that provide for the care and growth of Odyssey's children and those that provide for the care and growth of the world of Odyssey. Choice in which capacity to serve will be very limited. Most will find themselves fitted to the needs of the society and there is no room for unproductive members. Now think of what that means. Each individual will contribute to the limit of their capacity. Young children will be given meaningful roles in maintaining the world as soon as possible. Throughout the lifespan, each individual will contribute as pay for their continued right to exist on Odyssey. What of those that can no longer contribute? Through age, infirmary, infirmary injury, the unforgiving pragmatics of a closed loop environment tells us that the cost of non-producing members cannot be borne. Our ancestors understood this hard reality and they practiced various forms of elder side and infant side to manage it. They winnowed the infirm, the ill, the aged, the members who represented a burden on the tribe. Odyssey will be faced with no less stringent demands. Are you sane enough to qualify, but crazy enough to actually go now? There will be no possibility of return. Not in three years, or 10 years, or 50 years, or 500 years. Never. I recently read a blog of a Mars One applicant who was um, rationalizing or justifying his decision to apply to go on this mission to colonize Mars and leave his two-year-old daughter behind. And he consoled himself with the thought that he was going there to create a society, a colony, in which his daughter, when she became an adult, could then join him. This is not going to be a possibility for a generationship. When you leave, you cut the cord. It is as if you died. Now, where Mars is in an entire planet full of infinite possibilities, you have to realize that Odyssey or any world ship will be completely known and tightly managed. Mars is essence is a prime example of one of the end goals for Odyssey, a planet forgiving enough to sustain human existence. Uh, a Neo-Earth, of course, would be extraordinary and, and uh, the most preferred. The road to those end goals will consume the forevers of many generations. Even when once found, these Neo-Earths are Earth-like worlds that we can terraform, it may be the mission of some to travel onward to the next Neo-Earth or the next world and leave a seed of humanity behind. So you must choose to go for the future, not for yourself. You are the vehicle by which the road to the future of our species is traversed. Is that enough? Now how many of you would go? Show of hands. A few less. There is much work to do. We need all of you in the greater community to join us in the exploration and identification of the qualifications of those to populate an interstellar one-way mission. It's a very different selection process than for Earth return missions, or even missions to Mars where there is still bi-directional communication and, and support. So go to our website, sign up as a beta founder, 
We need input from everybody. We have an entire world to build. Thank you. We have time for five questions. minutes for questions. Um, since I've been completely biased and I just keep pe picking people over here, I'm going to go Start over to this way. We become in about 100 million years from now, it will become very uncomfortable on the earth. There will be not more enough nitrogen. Trees cannot grow anymore, so we will be forced to leave. Of course, we still have quite a bit of time. And in that time, I'm quite certain we will have mastered relativistic space flight. And then, of course, you can come back. Because 100 million years is a long time from now. Well, Man was created from monkeys about a million, Euro, million years ago, okay? Now, one million year alone will give us plenty of time to develop this technology. So don't underestimate the intelligence of man with his inventions and ingenuity to make interstellar spaceflight possible in a short time. Alone with present technology, we can fly to Mars in about a week. Okay, you come and come back, of course, it will be very expensive. So I think in your discussion, you do not consider the uh, advancement of technology. No. Actually, <clears throat> I, was, uh, I was present for Dr. Vinovich's uh, paper the other day, and when I, I thought, oh, my goodness, we have to rewrite our whole talk. And the team got together and we talked about it, and we said, no, because, as he pointed out, if we come back, thousands of years will have passed on Earth, so returning is not returning back to the world that we left. Hi, thank you. I want to thank you for uh, bringing out uh, some of the sociological issues yeah. involved in this. I have two questions, and they're kind of interrelated. Uh, the, of course, the whole, everybody involved would be subservient to the mission, but the mission would be interpreted by humans. And so the question would be, one, who would make those decisions, and then who would decide who those deciders are? Right. The second question is, what if succeeding generations don't want to be bound to the original mission, what if they rebel and don't want to carry this out? You're, you're uh, delving into questions that we kept uh, coming to over and over again during the last two years, and we had to keep reminding ourselves that um, our purpose is not to design the, the society that it's going to evolve. Although we do hope that part of the conversation with the worldwide community will help us start addressing those issues. What our focus in is right now is on how do we select the initial founders to board that ship and start outward. And obviously it isn't going to start out as a blank slate. There'll be some kind of uh, governance in place. There'll be some kind of authority structure in place. Um, that's really beyond the scope of what four people can do. Uh, but what we hope is that as we have this conversation about what kind of person do you put on board, what kind of individuals do you construct the core, of those 500 individuals that are going to be the core of your society, that it will, in every single conversation I've been in, it automatically goes to like, well, in fact, one individual said, no, okay, now let me get this clear. You're not telling me who I can have sex with. You're just telling me I can't choose to have a child with, right? And I said, right. He says, no problem. <laughs> okay? The, these are things that, that, these are larger issues that are the next step. I mean, the part of this conversation we want to have through our web-based um, board or forum, however, whatever structure it's going to take is beyond selecting the people who are sane enough to go, you know, sane enough to qualify, but crazy enough to still want to go, then how do we envision the societal structure of this world that is still dictated to a certain extent by the closed loop system? You know, so you can't get away from that. And what we found is that many people have not even thought about those fundamental restrictions. So that's where the, the conversation has to start. We'd love to. We'll get there one step at a time. All right. Peter. Peter. 
And he was sitting there with his arm up, like, <laughs> while I was like, okay. That's right. One last one. So these are not necessarily bad assumptions, particularly for the near term, but, but mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of hidden assumptions in, in the, uh, the, the options that you paint. You know, first of all, it, it's sort of assumed that this is sort of a, a government or societal type of thing, and that they're, you know, you're starting with a, a population that uh, is largely fixed, and that there's a scarcity of flights. And depending on when these things might take place, you could imagine very, very different options, just like the colonizers uh, of our own New World or Australia, mm -hmm. with very different motivations and self-selection. That, uh, that might not impose this kind of uh, scarcity. Also, you know, depending on, you know, today when I take a long journey on a cruise ship, I, uh, I have lots of people serving me. And in a post-singularity world, if I'm, uh, that's the other thing, you're also assuming that, that we would be conscious for the journey. And to say that we might not see mountains or clouds assumes that you know, we wouldn't have the degree of virtual reality or the ability to live in a second life. Uh, that would provide uh, many of those things that would seem absent, or that we won't be able to design a, a habitat that is uh, beautiful and large enough as well in the long term. So while I think these are probably pretty good assumptions for our most conservative missions today, mm -hmm. I wouldn't assume, I wouldn't be comfortable that those are forever the assumptions. Or we actually have tried not to make any assumptions. <coughs> beyond the, fo the founding generation, because there, as a social, social, social psychologist, I can tell you that the next generation, the generation that's born on ship, that there will be a schism between that generation and the founders, because they will not have anything in, um, in their parents' background that will be familiar to them. It's a difference in seeing a picture of a mountain and actually to have climbed a mountain. And so there will be that struggle between the founder generation and all the generations to come because of that lack of common context. And these are, these are questions. I mean, we, ev we spent two years. We have more questions than we have answers for. So, yeah, I, I really hope that virtual reality s solves a lot of the problems. I hope that simulated um, environments uh, a holodeck would be wonderful if you engineers could get, you know, busy and build me one uh, that actually can make people feel like they really are climbing a mountain. That would be wonderful, and it's not beyond the realm of possibility. But what we have to do is start the conversation today and say, who would be the right kinds of people to select to go? So, but this is exactly the kind of conversation we want on our to contribute. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. That was a really awesome in-depth talk. Um, all right. We're going to break for about 10 minutes, and then we'll start back a little bit after 3 o'clock. So enjoy your break. It's Thomas Hare here. Where is he? Thomas Hare, come forward, please.
Miss Sarah's here. I got his PowerPoint slides. And we're ready. This is Haley Bright. Guys, we're gonna reconvene. If you wanna take a seat? Or not. <laughs> so we gotta change my bifocals here. going to kick off the rest of the afternoon with Dr. Thomas Hare from Florida Gulf Coast University. He's going to be speaking on radio transients and base rate bias, Bayesian argument for conservatism. That was a mouthful. <laughs> All right, please welcome to the stage, Thomas. Thank you very much. I'd just like to also thank uh, Paul Gilster and uh, Dr. Jim Benford. About three years ago, they uh, were the inspiration for this on CentauriDreams.org. Uh, most searches for alien radio transmissions have focused on finding omnidirectional or purposely Earth-directed beams of enduring duration. However, most of the interesting signals so far detected have been transient and non-repeatable in nature. These signals could very well be the first data points in an ever-growing database of such signals used to construct a probabilistic argument for the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence. This presentation examines the effect of base rate bias could have on deciding which signals to include in such an archive based upon the likely assumption that our ability to discern natural from artificial signals will be less than perfect. Imagine 1,000 years from now a vibrant human presence throughout the solar system, from the balmy shores of a warm wet earth to the frigid and arid plains of Mars to even more remote outposts like Ceres, Ganymede, and Titan and of 100 interplanetary ships that link them for travel and trade. Take this vision, let's say 10,000 years more, and imagine the solar system and quite possibly some nearby solar system completely subsumed in every meaningful way by the human presence. Nothing more than the aforementioned conservative scenario is required to detect extraterrestrial intelligence within several thousand light years of the Earth. No vast and supremely intelligent galaxy-spanning civilizations need apply. A humble group of dedicated extraterrestrial survivalists is all that is required for detection. Naysayers may point out that as we, as a civilization, go digital and line of sight in our modes of communication, that the window for detection of any nascent alien civilization will be very short, and thus the probability of detecting one of them will be very low, given the immense temporal spread that the age of the universe implies between us and any number of them. We may well be going radio communications quiet here on the surface of the Earth, but this improbable thesis of a radio quiet Earth fails the further we get from our primordial gravity well. At present, the powerful parabolic radar dish at Arecibo, Puerto Rico 
is used to track asteroids like Vesta tens of millions of miles from home, and the phased array Coberdane radar on Shimya Island, Alaska, and at least a half a dozen similar devices hammer megawatts of radar energy into deep space on a continual basis to track everything from potentially lethal NEO objects and incoming ICBMs to wayward space shuttle wrenches dropped in the 1980s. If humanity is to create a viable and complex solar society and a necessarily equally viable and complex internodal intrastellar communications and control network in the coming millennia, then how do we exploit this idea of a randomly noisy human-generated solar civilization to find another intelligence in the greater void? As James Benford points out, should we observe such activities by extraterrestrial intelligence, the signals would very likely appear to us as transient events, but such quick, powerful bursts would only be verifiable by a staring strategy with smaller dishes looking continuously at the skies, most probably at the galactic plane. Once such a burst appears, watching time can be focused on such possible sites, perhaps with some dishes linked so their effect could be coherent, raising the detection capacity of the network. This suggests that a new strategy of scanning the sky for powerful directed signals is advantageous, and that once a coherent signal is detected, that a strategy of long-term monitoring of that region of the sky be undertaken to detect more transient events at the same and other frequencies to build a probabilistic picture. Throughout SETI program history, several provocative radio transients have been detected, almost all of which never repeat, with the wow signal being uh, the most famous of these. Other less famous examples include Sullivan, which recorded intriguing, um, intriguing, excuse me, non-repeatable narrowband signals, apparently not of man-made origin, and with some degree of con concentration to the galactic plane. And similar such searches within which uh, detected one-time signals which were also not repeatable. Very few of these searches lasted more than an hour. But what if, as mentioned previously, a strategy of long-duration monitoring of a fixed position of the sky were initiated? How would we separate the enormous amounts of natural transients from their artificial counterparts using an imperfect algorithm? A somewhat recent example of this conundrum is the Galactic Center radio transient J1745 that you see pictured here. We simply don't know what the signal is. Many reasonable natural explanations have been proposed and are currently undergoing peer review. But the question remains, how does one definitively say that a seemingly coherent narrowband transient is natural or not? Given the possible kiloparsec distances from which the signal may emanate and the natural forces that distort it along a path to us, the answer is not certain and it, it demands that we apply a genuine skepticism when building this probabilistic case for extraterrestrial intelligence based upon the collection of a large number of transient signals. Base rate bias, also called base rate neglect or the base rate fallacy, is an error that occurs when the conditional probability of some hypothesis H, given some evidence E, is assessed without taking into account the a priori or base rate of H and the total probability of the evidence E. It happens when the values of sensitivity and specificity, which only depend on the test itself, are used in place of positive predictive value and negative predict predictive value. Base rate bias is also one of the cornerstones of Bayesian statistics, as it stems directly from Bayes' famous theorem shown here in equation one. And that's read, the probability of A given B has already occurred, and you can see on the right-hand side, that's what we have. Expanding the probability in the denominator for the set of all impossible mutually exclusive outcomes, we will get what you see in equation three. The combining of these two is, is generally much more useful, with the denominator being defined as the law of total prob probability or the law of total alternatives, where the summation can be interpreted as a weighted average and the marginal probability P of B interpreted as the average probability. As a thought experiment, let us suppose, for example, in a dedicated wide spectrum search of the galactic center, where 90% of the stars lie within just 9% of the sky from our perspective, a one-year long stair search yields one million radio transient signals of interest. If unknown to us, there are 10 actual artificial, that is extraterrestrial signals, and 999,990 ,990 natural signals, 
then the base rate probability of one random signal from the search being artificial is 0 0.00001. And the base rate probability of a random signal being a natural source is 0 0.99999. In an attempt to find these artificial signals within the much greater natural ones, a complex algorithm must recognize their artificialness. In this example, we can imagine an algorithm that has two failure rates of one-tenth of one percent. If the algorithm recognizes an artificial signal, it will correctly identify it with a probability of 0.999 and mistakenly fail to recognize it with a probability of 0 0.001. The false negative rate is 0.1 percent. If the algorithm recognizes a natural signal, it will correctly identify it with a probability of 0.999, but it will mistakenly misidentify the signal as artificial with a probability of 0 0.001. So the false positive rate is 0.1% in this story as well. Now suppose a radio transient is received and recognized by the algorithm as being artificial, uh, or, uh, of being a, of extraterrestrial origin. What is the chance it is actually artificial? Someone exhibiting base rate bias would incorrectly claim that there is a 99.9% .9 chance that this signal is extraterrestrial and pop the champagne because the failure rate of the algorithm is only one-tenth of one percent. Although this seems to make sense, it is actually faulty reasoning. The application of Bayes' theorem shows that the chance the signal is extraterrestrial is actually near one percent, not 99.9 percent. So let equation four right there, which is just the application of Bayes' theorem in that simple case from uh, before, we can rewrite it with the law of total probability on the bottom. So it's the probability that the signal is extraterrestrial given you have identified it as extraterrestrial. That's what we're working through here. And if we plug in the numbers that I just used, you can see that what happens is we came out with a probability of actually detecting an artificial signal, an extraterrestrial intelligence signal, is very low. And I'll explain why that happens here in just a second. So the actual probability that the, that the detection algorithm, uh, that the signal recognized by the detection algorithm is actually artificial is 1%. The fallacy arises from confusing two distinctly different failure rates. The first being the number of natural signals per algorithm recognition, and the second being the number of non-recognitions per artificial signal received. They are wholly unrelated quantities, and there's no reason one has to equal the other. They don't even have to be roughly equal. Here's a nice slide to explain it, but I'll just go ahead and read this to you. But going back to the original thought experiment, one can compute the rate at which natural signals are being algorithmically misidentified as artificial. Imagine that the search's entire population of one million radio transients passes through the algorithm. All 10 of the artificial signals will be recognized correctly by the algorithm, but so will about 1,000 of the natural signals, and they far outweigh the unnatural signals. Therefore, about 1,010 transient signals will be recognized as artificial by the algorithm, among which only about 10 will actually be artificial, or 1%. The base rate bias in this example is primary fallacious because there are so many more natural signals than artificial ones. If the algorithm were checking approximately as many artificial signals as natural ones, and the false positive rate and the false negative rate were nearly equal, which they are in our case, then the probability of mis misidentification would be about the same as the false positive rate of the algorithm. This graph, or this figure, shows that the false positive rate, the probability you ID it as extraterrestrial given that it is not extraterrestrial, would have to be significantly lowered for the probability of a correct detection to rise above even 10%. To reach this threshold of 90%, the algorithm would need a fidelity three orders of magnitude, uh, that's a thousand times, than the example provided, something that cannot be effectively shown in this figure. However, using a false positive, race, a false positive rate of 10 to the minus 6 and applying it to our formula from the first example, it would yield a correct detection rate of 92%. Okay, a little bit of math. We already had a little bit, but a little more. The large-scale sifting of these provocative radio transients and the search for ones emanating from extraterrestrial civilizations can be thought of as a series of binomial trials where the probability of X successfully recognized artificial signals collected within N trials with the probability of success P on each trial is given by the 
binomial distribution shown here where Q is simply the complement of P and N choose X is the binomial coefficient where N represents the total number of signals collected. If uh, no valid artificial signal is correctly identified in N independent trials, then X is simply zero. The probability of at least one valid signal becomes being detected then becomes one minus the binomial of N, P, and zero for all values of both N and P. However, when N is very large and P is very small, as in the case that we just examined in our thought experiment, binomial probabilities are often approximated by means of a Poisson distribution, which is shown there at the bottom. And lambda is just equal to the product of N times P. The measurement of these radio transients can thus be thought of as a random physical process that is in part controlled by some sort of chance mechanism, that being the uh, detection algorithm. What characterizes such a Poisson process is its time dependence, namely the fact that certain events do or do not take place, depending upon chance, at regular intervals of time. Therefore, in order to find the probability of X successful detections during a time interval of length T, <laughs> Excuse me. We divide the interval into n equal parts of length delta t, so that t is n times delta t, and make the following assumptions. And uh, I'll just leave those up there. I'm getting ready to run out of time here in a minute. But uh, to make a long story short, this means that the assumption underlying the binomial distribution is satisfied. And the probability of x successes in the time interval t is given by the binomial probability seen at the bottom. More never ending math, right? <laughs> Lastly, we find that when n approaches infinity, the probability of x successes during a time interval t is given by the corresponding Poisson probability with the parameter lambda, which I spoke about before. Since lambda is the mean of the Poisson distribution, it should be noted that, the, that alpha is the average number of successes per time unit. The long stare. Returning to the original thought experiment. If sometime in the not too distant future a large radio telescope like the upcoming square kilometer array is set to the task of a long stare as previously described, it would take, for example, T equals 2.74 years to collect 1 million provocative radio transients at a rate of 1,000 per day. If it is assumed that there are 10 artificial signals within the total radio transients, something which obviously wouldn't be known, then the probability any given radio transient is artificial is 0.00001. In fact, the mean number of radio transients that must be processed oops. Let's see. 16, missing something here. processed by the algorithm until the first artificial one is received follows the geometric distribution. That, that geometric distribution tells you uh, the probability of the first uh, success. In this scenario, it would not be until the 100th day of this observation process just mentioned into the 2.74 year survey that the first artificial radio transient would be received. As SETI techniques begin to turn away from the search for purposely earth-directed signals of enduring duration and more towards finding the ephemeral leakage associated with complex business of maintaining an interstellar civilization, large or small, then we must come to terms with the fact that most, if not all, of our detections will be one of a kind, never to repeat with exactly the same parametric characteristics or in the same position in the sky. With this in mind, it becomes particularly important to collect a large data set of provocative, possibly indicative of extraterrestrial intelligence, radio transients, through this long stare strategy in order to build up a compelling case that they cannot all be explained by natural phenomena. In consideration of this, it is important to realize that the finest mathematical seed will always gather up far more straw from the haystack than it does those very special needles. Thank you. Hi, as you know, I'm Jim Benford. Thank you for recounting my uh, views on this at the beginning. Uh, a comment about it. There is such a database. It already exists. There are hundreds of them okay. in the SETI at Home database, which are unexplained, unrevisited, unexplored. The, I think a staring strategy is the only way to look for repeats, and that means yep. an array around the globe, that each antenna uh, or pairs of antennas devoted to a segment of the sky, 
and just keep looking and then wait for repeats. I think that's the only way we're ever going to find that. What's more, leakage, second comment, leakage radiation is such a transient and so unlikely that I think our Earth is, in fact, unobserved, not just unobservable, but unobserved, uh, and I will say, describe why tomorrow morning. Working? Okay. Yes. Uh, Bayesian techniques are, are very powerful for extracting uh, information when you've when you've got a large set of data. I was wondering if you've looked at um, other techniques such as Dempster Schaefer or um, things that use belief functions, because it, it might be quite a powerful technique to use with the kind of data you've got. I haven't uh, looked at that, but uh, that is interesting. I'd like to talk yeah. to you about that. Afterwards. It's it's a very powerful technique. We okay. Can, we can chat about that. All right. Very good. There's one back there. I was just wondering, you mentioned the bringing the probability uh, or the failure rate down um, on your algorithm in order to uh, in order to bring your probability of detecting a true signal up. Uh -huh. What about multiple C's with different failure, uh, with different reasons for failure to achieve that? Yes, that seems very reasonable. I was just trying to keep the paper and the presentation very straightforward so that uh, if, if I made it multi-layered, obviously, yes, it would, it, would, uh, it would probably pull those out. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Come on up. All right, please welcome Dr. Al Jackson. He's going to be speaking on extreme SETI. Well, I wanted to uh, give you uh, all uh, <coughs> some different reasons for studying interstellar flight. Um, and that is that uh, other civilizations may have investigated ways of doing it that we can't do right now. So <clears throat> the question is, are there other wow signals inside uh, other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum being generated by uh, ultra starships? So, <clears throat> first uh, guys to look at this there were, that I know of back in 1977 were viewing Horswell and Palmer and JBIS and they they looked at what they call innocuous ships which would be like world ships and then they had a category of energetic fission fusion antimatter um, funny thing about that paper is that uh, they don't give any particular uh, results. I think there's a couple of things that say if, if something was within a few hundred AU that we could see it. Uh, but as it turns out, Robert Zubrin in 95 looked at uh, energetic systems and uh, uh, here's uh, some of the classes. Uh, there's fission electric fusion plasma, antimatter, antimatter photon, his favorites, mag sales, mag sales, uh, fusion plasma photon. Uh, not going to explain what the, all those are. And uh, you can see that he looked at different parameters for <coughs> uh, the uh, fractions of speed of light that you could um, attain and uh, the accelerations. He, uh, he picked out a particular example 
of a ship. And uh, then the rest of the paper, he sort of abandoned <laughs> the thing. And I, I, I had to interpret what he was um, uh, trying to, to say. But uh, anyway, here's the kind of thing. If you break it down, uh, then uh, there's radio, visible x-rays, gamma rays. Uh, he was particularly happy with uh, things like mag sails that he thinks could be observed. Uh, down at the bottom there are gamma rays. I don't think that he's right about those being detected because we have uh, detectors in orbit now. And so there may be transient signals there. So there's also the possibility of beamed waste heat. Uh, <coughs> I, I just put up a few equations. effect. In fact, it'll be what's called Doppler boosted. And so just taking a model, a ship of 50 meters in radius and 1,000 meters in length and giving it a really ridiculous Lorentz factor of 500, you find out that you've got about 11,000 terawatts in the rest frame <coughs> and that's Doppler boosted to uh, 10 to the 8 terawatts in in uh, an observer's frame. And uh, wavelengths are shifted from uh, visible into soft x-rays. Uh, the fluxes are very small at our, our at, uh, I, well, I can't think of what I did here, several, <laughs> at, a, at quite a few hundreds of, of light years. Uh, one thing to note is that uh, the solid angle into which it beams has got to be divided by um, the uh, four pi star radians to get the probability. And so the probability is very small of seeing it. Although uh, back in 1979, when I wrote this letter to JBIS, I figured out that from the Vela uh, observations that there was a fleet of 8,000 interstellar ships bearing down on us. Luckily, there's been a lot better study of gamma ray bursters since that time. Uh, another thing to look for would be beaming stations. I pulled this from Andrews, and uh, the thing to look for there is the total energy in the beam. Uh, that's it could be, this is for lasers, but now it could be for microwaves too. And uh, I didn't go through the calculation of finding out what you'd need to use as a detector here. Once again, these are things are small probability. All this stuff is probably out in the tail of the distribution. But <clears throat> if we're thinking of doing it, then somebody else may have thought of doing it. Of course, they'd have to be pointed at us. So where to look? Uh, so <coughs> I'm going to follow uh, the lead of Freeman Dyson and uh, Kudershov. Uh, um, I will take the civilization to be K Kardashev 2, K2. In other words, they can build starships and they can run hot. They can uh, support Lorentz factors up to 500, maybe 1,000. That means that they have structural and material strengths, temperature that, anyway, doing a, a, the usual uh, crazy extrapolation, they can overcome all of the, uh, the uh, 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 problems that are inherent in interstellar flight. So uh, what are some of the things? Uh, Dyson thought of this in 1962. Uh, if you look at, uh, well, this one has got a, a black hole and a, and a white dwarf, 
but it could be any kind of pears. They could be bi uh, white dwarfs, neutron star, neutron star, black hole pairs, and the gain in velocity is about two times the circular velocity. Uh, it's sort of bad news for the speeds that you get when they're only like a thousand kilometers of separation, the gains are only that much in C. The only trouble is, is that the lifetimes against gravitational loss of energy are 30, 18, and a tenth of a year. So you're probably not going to see those kind of things. Uh, other things, one would be that you use the property that inside of 10 Schwarzschild radii that you uh, ha have non-Newtonian motion. And uh, an extraterrestrial civilization uh, going from one place to the other might be able to use that to uh, change direction or to break an ultra-relativistic ship. Uh, I showed on there that you can make, unlike in Newtonian mechanics, you can make a whole lot of loops uh, around a uh, Schwarzschild black hole if you uh, time, if you make your uh, impact parameter uh, correctly out. Uh, same thing is true for rotating black holes, but it is. I don't know that the calculation that's, has ever been done. Uh, Kerr black holes are just horrendously awful to uh, to work with. Uh, <coughs> other things are relativistic impacts on the material shield, shock charge particles, uh, synchrotron Bremsstrahlung uh, radiation, uh, bow shocks. Uh, your brother has a a nice story about that. I've got a picture here in a minute. Uh, gravitational lensing of relativistic ships, and uh, there's the Kerr-Penrose effect. Uh, note that the rotational energy of within you know, the ergosphere of a Kerr black hole is 10 to the 52 to 10 to the 54 ergs. So that's a lot of energy to let go waste. Um, the only trouble with using the, the, see the Penrose process is that you inject a mass into uh, a rotating black hole and you send part of it down the hole, then the outgoing mass will carry away angular momentum. Uh, one problem with this is that the incoming uh, ship has to have a speed of about 0.5 C already. so. A civilization that can already do that may not be interested in picking up uh, uh, or doing a, a very dangerous maneuver. Because remember, these kind of things, rotating black holes, are probably the natural ones in the in the uh, galaxy, and they most of them have accretion disks around them. Uh, then you have things that are could be like jet riders. There's relativistic jets off of, uh, of binaries like SS-433. Um, and the, uh, the, I, I'm, uh, the jet speed is like a quarter of the speed of light. And uh, the number density off of that guy is known. So if you just put a one meter mag sail there, uh, it would attain 24 Gs in just a little bit of time. I gotta admit that the, uh, the, the jets off of these things corkscrew around, so <clears throat> I'm going to suppose that a K2 civilization has guidance and navigation and control up in the, uh, the K2 range. <laughs> uh, here's a picture of the mouse, uh, Greg sent this to me to let make it let me know that you know you could possibly use this is actually a pulsar that's moving through a plasma but if you were trying to break a uh, an interstellar ship 
at relative speeds, then you would be producing, uh, well, this is in the visible, but you may be wanting to look at other, uh, and this is only 0.002C. Uh, the other thing would be that uh, the waste heat are from a uh, hot relativistic ship uh, orbiting a uh, short shield black hole would uh, have its beam well, have the have the its uh, isotropic radiation beamed and gravitational lensing. Um, there's a possibility of placing a source uh, from a either non-rotating or rotating black hole and using gravitational lensing. Now here I'm talking about I talking about strong gravitational fields, not the weak field approximation. But even in the weak field approximation for a solar mass black hole, the magnification is like 10 to the seventh. And uh, for a Kerr, it's horrible. Uh, the uh, things not are, are not focused to a point. They are caustics. And in fact, on Kerr holes, they are sheets of caustics that come off. And doing the calculation for that is yet to be done. <laughs> uh, finally, uh, there's <coughs> was discovered back when in the mid 70s that um, uh, when you scatter electromagnetic radiation off of a spinning black hole that it can be uh, amplified and uh, this is called super radiance what you do is you, you you scatter a wave and there's a condition for this the frequency of the wave has to be less than the rotational frequency of the black hole. And for a uh, one solar mass black hole, which you wouldn't find, it's about 16 kilohertz or a wavelength of about 18 kilometers. The e-folding time, let me see if I have that on here, is about six tenths of a second. So in about uh, oh, I think it's like uh, 13 seconds. If you put in one watt, you get back 100 terawatts. So then I had thought that maybe you build a mirror. I'm sorry, the only reason this works is we have to put a mirror around the, the spinning black hole and uh, maybe a civilization would build, uh, have a, well, actually, maybe have a factory nearby that built these mirrors that could be uh, possibly say, composed of ships, uh, like the truncated isohedron that I have down there. And uh, then when the uh, radiation pressure exceeds the yield strength of whatever's holding it together, they take off. Or you can open up a hole and send a signal out of the thing. Um, so are there any wow signals in these guys? So there's a whole bunch of satellites up there, and uh, they look in all parts of the electromagnetic spectrum but I don't know of anybody who's searching for anomalous signals in those things. So there might be other ultra set SETI observables. Um, that's a rationale for more starship designs. Uh, this cannot exhaust all the options for a K2. I didn't even talk about a K3 civilization. Uh, hard to know how to make hot starships. What about other uses of high energy astrophysical objects? So there might be a lot of wow signals hidden in the uh,
spectra of, uh, of our observational uh, instruments, and uh, we not know about them. So thank you. All right, we have about five minutes for questions. If you have a question, can you please come up? Because we only have a wired mic. <laughs> Here's one. Well, uh, Al, um, uh, let me just say I favor the idea of a bow shock because in contrast to uh, the extraordinary measures, especially in the second half of the talk, any starship propelled through the interstellar medium, even if it's just coasting, is going to have a bow shock. And that produces synchrotron radiation, which is observable, and you can calculate both the frequency and the uh, um, power of such radiations uh, from just the velocity of the ship and the interstellar medium density. So I think that's more of a general observable because it doesn't relate to the specific type of ship you have. It re requires only that it be a starship, only that it be going fast, only that it be going much faster than the mouse, which is, after all, only 600 kilometers a second. Uh, of course, that's more than order of magnitude, more than anything we've done. <laughs> Any comment? You know, that's right. And, and, and of course, uh, people come uh, have objected to me before that if you're just going like a tenth the speed of light that you may be just disintegrate because of the uh, interaction with the interstellar medium. And my only answer to that is that here I'm considering K2 civilizations that can do anything. So anybody that approaches me with that question, I'm going to tell them it's a K2 and they've got your beat already. that uh, you guys are tired, like after lunch, died down with the questions. <laughs> All right, cool. Thank you so much. All right, so our, ooh, that was loud. Our last speaker for this session, um, we have two speakers, Giorgio Gavaragi and Andre Kemenoa from Unispace. They're going to be talking about the code of ethics for alien encounters, which I'm very excited to hear about. I know there was a code of ethics for alien <laughs> encounters. No. Thank you. Thank you. A code of ethics for alien encounters. I think it's uh, it's an important issue because. Uh, it's, uh, it's how can we deal with um, alien uh, societies or civilization or beings. So uh, we want to start uh, looking back at our uh, uh, human experience, at our history. Why we are going to the stars? We are going to the stars because we always in history wanted to go uh, over the horizon. We wanted to go over the hill. We wanted to go over and discover. And now we have the technological means to go uh, over uh, our planet. We already know our planet. and uh, we, we can start going out, going to the first neighboring worlds, the moon, Mars, and further on. The ultimately uh, challenge is to go to the stars. It's probably uh, an endless uh, journey because uh, there are um, uh, billions of galaxies, leave alone billions of stars. So this is our, uh, this is our first step out of uh, our planet of origin. And uh, we, may really, uh, we are really starting uh, an adventure which uh, will change completely our, uh, our lives, our uh, lifestyles, our history. Now, if we are talking about uh, alien encounters, we have a very, very bad record. Uh, we are not really much qualified to talk about uh, alien civilization. Uh, we have uh, most of our experiences based in uh, uh, conquering, colonizing, destroying uh, 
uh, civilization or societies which were a little technological backward from ours. Uh, and I'm not even mentioning the fact that we are still breeding, killing, and eating animals, which uh, with what right, I don't know, because of course we are more advanced than they are. So we are not really uh, the most uh, suitable uh, uh, society to, to deal about this, but we have to deal it. I mean, this is something which uh, we have to deal because it's very important. And possibly uh, we may have, uh, uh, I hope, that uh, a more advanced civilization than ours also can have a code of ethics uh, when they must have to deal with us. Now, some of the uh, reasons for our expansion, we have many motivations, but some of them, uh, and we can just summarize some of them, we want to create a new economy, we, we want to find new wealth possibilities, uh, expand our society, uh, preserve and multiply humanity. These are some of the basic motivations, and we're also some motivation which, uh, especially the economical one, which uh, allow to expand our population, uh, we uh, favor the immigration to, to new continents like in the last two, three hundred years. Now, what uh, can we do in an alien world? The alien world can be like Earth, so we probably uh, would like to populate it, but probably it will also be full of life. So uh, this, this is an entirely new uh, issue that we will uh, speak later. But what basically uh, action we can do in a hostile world, hostile from the point of view of um, uh, uh, um, environment, uh, climate, atmosphere, chemical condition, gravity. We may want to terraform, transform the planetary environment, climate, and atmosphere, and others to match our terrestrial ecosystem. Maybe we cannot match the gravity, but we can match uh, all the other conditions. This will be the most extreme intervention that we can do in, a, in an alien world. Then we can do a smoother activity, underground terraforming, which is the same, uh, recreating the terrestrial ecosystem condition, but on a much smaller scale, on, on a step-by-step -step activity, and maybe we can even conceal, in this case, our presence, if there is any reason for that, and we are not altering the general condition. This can be uh, achieved like uh, in, in a very fast mission. It can be a very reasonable activity. And of course, can be the, the, the most uh, convenient activity for uh, moon, the moon, Mars, and other, and other uh, planets around us. Then we can consider unmanned intervention. We can send AI, we can send robotics, we can uh, send other automatic system. Uh, to develop a, a selection body without our, our physical presence. And then we can have a space-only activity. I mean, we can be in a planetary system. We don't have to occupy uh, a body, any type of selection body. We can create, uh, let's say, space settlements. We can live in uh, planetary space settlements in, in, a, in another planet, planetary system without interfering at all with any existing type of uh, society or, uh, or life. Now, what are the terraforming conditions? The world must be stable. If a given planet, moon, asteroid, lacks any sort of ecosystem, and then it is fair game for raw material extra extraction, colonization, and terraforming. I mean, terraforming is so extreme uh, that we can't uh, say we can terraform uh, any, any place. Any type of, uh, of life, uh, of existing life, even microbial life, bacterial life, will be totally uh, destroyed if we attempt uh, a terraforming activity in any type of body with this kind of life. As much hostile it can be to us. In fact, if a world has life, we face several alternatives, depending on the type of life that we can find. We must be very careful about contaminating such a world with terrestrial organism in the course of studying its ecosystem. We have proto protocols, we have many, many policies on that, on that issue. Now, what are the possible conditions? We can 
can find microbial and non-intelligent life. In this case, we must consider partial colonization, but preserving the alien life, if not hostile for humans. In other words, if we find animals, are we entitled to go and maybe eat them? I don't know. This is, uh, this is something, uh, we do it normally in, in our planet. I mean, we, any, any animal uh, which moves, it can be eaten by us. I don't know, again, if this is really fair, if this is very ethic. And if, the if we apply the same ethic to other worlds, it may happen the same as uh, happened here. Or then we can find animal and plant life, well, animal uh, with limited intelligence, plant life, plant life. Kardashian zero uh, type of society, I mean, an advanced society, not uh, maybe at our level, but uh, still uh, a society. Let's say the, the, the Aztecs, the American Indians, uh, uh, a society with a lesser degree of development than ours. If intelligent life with primitive culture, here we can covertly study that culture because any type of contact may be a, a cultural shock that may destroy them. And this was, uh, this is our past record. First contact is postponed indefinitely to avoid, uh, to avoid uh, contamination, I mean uh, cultural contamination. Cortez and the Aztecs or similar type of scenarios, which our history is full of them. When the culture is suitable advance, we can consider first contact, but that must be always on a case-by-case -case, uh, uh, situation and must really be carefully considered. Now, what we want to establish, uh, these are possible conditions. We want to establish like a, a sort of classification of, uh, of uh, worlds where we can uh, act and how we can act. Now, uh, and this is uh, important because uh, uh, these are decisions. These are decisions which, uh, like uh, to contact or not uh, an alien civilization, are decisions which can really change not only their course of history, but also ours. And I want just to make two examples from our history. In the 15th century, there were uh, two major decisions were made. Uh, one in the West, which was in Spain in this case, they allow Columbus, they give the money, they finance Columbus to, to go to America. With a very, very limited technology, they were small boats, uh, basically, and they risk uh, uh, the adventure. At the same time, two years before, the Chinese had a, a major fleet uh, with ships which were like 10, 20 times larger than Columbus, which were much more technologically advanced than uh, the Western civilization. And this fleet was going slowly going uh, around Asia and, and Southeast Asia. They were going to, to cross the Indian Ocean. They were probably going to, to go to Africa and maybe they, they had the capability to go to reach Europe and of course even to cross the Atlantic and, and discover America. What happened? They were stopped. They were stopped by a decision. Well, the emperor, he said, no, you come back and he stopped totally the, that possibility. And you see what happened to, to China. China for, for centuries was practically dominated by other uh, powers and they lost uh, uh, most of their uh, potential. So these kind of uh, decisions are basic. Should we contact, should we not contact? Motivation, we have several motivations. They can be scientific and technology motivation, social reasons, economically related reasons, defense related reasons. Maybe we need, uh, uh, I mean, to protect uh, our planet from some uh, alien uh, threats. And so we have to develop technology to, to allow us to defend ourselves. Then we have survival-related uh, reasons. We have uh, uh, to preserve our, our civilization, our culture, our species. And here again, uh, we are just uh, recalling the Kardashev scale for uh, when we meet uh, uh, some other civilization. And we can see that uh, we are at uh, 0 0.8 at the moment. We may be further uh, uh, above uh, by the time that we achieve uh, interstellar, um, interstellar
interstellar uh, travel capability, and of course, if we deal with uh, lesser civilization, we have to have a precise code of ethics. Now, what can be the scenarios for alien contact? If they are intelligent and willing to cooperate, we could establish alliances and negotiate our presence in the planet if totally developed. But this, again, is a case-by-case -case situation. It's we go back to the major decision which we may or may not take. In case territories are not populated nor owned by any society, we can consider the possibility to develop them, but only without hurting the existing population. If we meet uh, an intelligent and hostile, uh, openly hostile uh, society, we don't have to interfere. We may leave a robotic hidden monitoring present for future contact. Other scenarios, uh, high-tech civilization compared to ours. First contact probably unavoidable since they have the technology to detect our presence in their planetary system. So what can we do? We can try to establish mutually profitable alliances to have access to the planetary system resources if they are at a K2 level, or we may have other type of, uh, of decision. If we meet high-tech civilization well beyond our technology level, we should act as above, but much uh, greater care because probably uh, they will have discovered us before. So uh, we, uh, we, we could be in the same uh, situation as the Aztecs uh, when uh, the Spanish arrived. And here uh, we can see that, uh, uh, again recalling the Kardashev line, we can have uh, a certain type of growth of our society and uh, we can have, uh, uh, when we have singularities, we can have uh, uh, a, an extremely accelerated uh, uh, progress. And this is what can happen when two uh, civilizations meet at a different, a different uh, level of progress. I mean, maybe the, the more advanced one may not have uh, uh, an accelerated uh, rate of uh, progress, but certainly the other one, the less advanced ones will have because the contact will either destroy one of them or the, the less advanced will immediately try to, to get the technology, the advanced technology from the other one. Let's say, let's make an example in medicine. I mean, if we have antibiotics and the other civilizations don't have antibiotics, the first thing that uh, they would try to do is to get our, our type of, uh, of medicine for, for their own use. Now, we have also some index uh, for planet habitability. Uh, some of them were developed by uh, Dirk Schultz-Mazouk, which is also part of our Star Voyager group, the ESI, Air Similarity Index, and the PHI, which is the Planetary Habitability Index. They are based, the ESI is based on data available, or potentially available, for most exoplanets, such as bulk density, escape velocity, surface temperature, and chemistry while the PHI is based on the presence of uh, stable substrate, available energy, appropriate chemistry, and the potential to hold the liquid solvent. Just to make an example, uh, we have two planets in the uh, Gliese 581 system, Gliese 581 C and D, with an AZ, uh, which is an air similarity index, comparable to that uh, of Mars and the PHI between that of Europa and Enceladus. So it means that they have some similarity with uh, uh, our solar system planet, at least as far as habitability is concerned. So if there is no life, we, we, ca we can treat them in a certain way. Now, at the end of this, what we really wanted to, to have is some sort of uh, classification on how we can act when uh, we find uh, uh, societies or uh, planets with uh, some sort of alien uh, life. We have a zero, 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 not approachable for hostile alien presence. I mean, we just don't touch them. Zero, zero, difficult approaches for alien presence. I mean, the, the alien can be there, they may like it or not, they may be hostile, but we don't know because they can be called hostile after that we meet them. They can get our technology, and then they can even use it against us. I mean, there are different, uh, several different scenarios. So we must really be very extremely careful. 
Don't, never forgetting that any type of contact can create uh, singularities, can create uh, really situations which are totally unexpected. Zero, not approachable for gravity condition, for natural condition, I mean gravity, chemical composition, radiation, and other. So we can only send a robotic flow, let's say, example, Jupiter. Approachable, but without terraforming possibilities. Uh, man probes for short term stays, no settlement possibilities. Example, Io. Io, I don't think even underground terraforming should be uh, possible in, in such a, a, a condition. Settlement possibilities only. And here again, we, we, we can talk about underground terraforming, the moon. Terraforming condition for non optical, for an optimal condition known in the solar system. None of them has optimal condition for us. Because optimal means, uh, a, a, apart from the atmospheric and climate, means gravity. Except from Venus, uh, which I don't think is optimal, at least at, uh, at the present uh, technological level that we have. So, uh, what we have, the optimum terraforming possibilities which we have uh, in our solar system as far as now with our uh, expected uh, technology is Mars. And, of course, as like, uh, we don't need to terraform them, and planets similar to Earth are the best candidates for uh, our expansion. But again, uh, are the best from the point of view of habitability, but maybe the worst from the point of view of the presence of alien uh, beings. So, what are the potential situations? We can abandon the system, but leave a probe in space to follow society's evolution. This is a science fiction uh, motive that uh, somebody say, why, where are they? The Fermi paradox, where are they? They are there, checking on us. Leave an uh, uh, AI to enter the society and deliver information. Enter alien society member for information purposes. Occupy the ecosystem. Create segregated underground terraforming ecosystem. We can be there but they don't know, and create a space ecosystem. We can be uh, in, the, in the same planetary system, in a space uh, settlement, and, and we can check and we can control, and, and they don't know about us. This can be probably possible even in our solar system. Code of ethics. So, what are the conclusions? Uh, no first approach to a living ecosystem should be made by a manned mission strictly robotic, if, if we have to do it, and without any cross-contamination possibility and inte with intelligent collection as the only goal. No first contact to a living ecosystem with intelligent beings without previous adequate preparation and risk evaluation, possibly with covert individual encounter first. This is the UFO, UFOs uh, hypothesis. First contact only with societies considered non-hostile with friendly and cooperative intention. But again, on a on a step by step uh, uh, and on a single uh, analysis of the situation. Code of ethics again. Not terraforming in bodies where it could damage an existing ecosystem, even if hostile. Uh, consider possibility of underground terraforming in in some cases without interference with local society. What do we mean by terraforming? To change the atmospheric condition, composition, climate, weather, and other existing condition of a celestial body to allow safe occupation by a terrestrial ecosystem. So underground terraforming is just the same, only on a minimum scale, a non-invasive scale, and without, uh, let's say, interfering with the atmosphere of the planet. No first contact, if not yet detected, with more advanced civilization, at least till we reach or supersede their technological level. I mean, if we contact a, a, a more advanced civilization, I think uh, we have m much more risk than if we uh, contact the less advanced one. So probably they will uh, contact us or they will check on us. We don't know. Maybe if they have a similar code of ethics as we are proposing, they may do the same. I mean, they can be just controlling us, see how we develop, uh, see what are our values, and they may consider or not uh, the possibility of, uh, of contacting. And maybe they, they did it already. They, they, they occupy or, or, or they have some contact without uh, uh, 
uh, that we know about. Oh, and of course, leave observation equipment to perform continuous control and monitoring of life forms development. Exception. Again, we can have situations uh, which are unexpected. Uh, to be defined in a case by case uh, situation. Let's say we are more advanced and we, we, can, we can notice that a society uh, can be threatened by, by wars, by epidemic, by an asteroid impact or some other, uh, let's say, uh, accident which we may prevent. Are we entitled to do it? Are we entitled to, to deflect an asteroid which may impact uh, and destroy an entire civilization? So these are questions which uh, we have to, to ask ourselves. Um, so this is one of the other important uh, uh, part of the Code of Ethics. And again, define life forms, define case of intervention, association, unavoidable possibility to reach our key level, define if friendly or unfriendly. I mean, every type of contact can, can result in all this type of, of uh, events. Now, the conventional approach, I'm recalling a little bit yesterday for a second. We have uh, the conventional approaches, we are sending, we are sending uh, humans to another uh, planetary system. But uh, we may have uh, a different uh, uh, approach. We may not send humans, we may send uh, mind uploaded uh, vessels. What do you mean by mind uploaders? Uh, we have, uh, we store uh, the mind uh, uh, in an artificial vessel. And of course, uh, during this process, we may advance because we are storing a file. And we can advance the file, we can improve the file, we can even reach, as you can see at the end, that universal intelligence. We can add all, the, uh, all our population files in, in a single one. In a, a normal single one, and even artificial intelligence file can be added. So we are creating a, a, a mind which uh, is totally out of our comprehension. And of course, what we can do, we can send the mind uploaded, and we may even send the embryos, and they can be developed in the other planet, but uh, we, are, we are sending uh, our mind uh, somewhere else with a vessel, in this case, an AI robot. And the final one, and the most dangerous is we can send files. We can send files uh, without uh, humans, without uh, any vessel, uh, mind uploaded files, and we can occupy. We can occupy aliens. This is like an avatar type of situation where uh, we, are, uh, we are sending uh, our, our mind, in this case, our, our culture, our civilization, our goals, our everything, uh, and we are utilizing other aliens. This would be the, the, the less ethical alternative Conclusion, conclusion. We have to define potential association when we have to deal with the first contact because it will end up always in some sort of association. A code of ethics will not stop nor deter humanity goals. Uh, we're not going to be stopped by that. We, we've never been stopped. Uh, all our history is, uh, is pointing to that. Its handling must allow a controlled situation in any event. We should always wish ourselves how it would be like to be considered by a more advanced society that may find out first. Meaning that uh, if, if it happened to us, how would we like it to, to happen? We would like to be there and be eaten by, by some, some aliens? I don't think so. And the same may happen to them. So several different alternatives may be possible, but not part of the study, such as adapting our biology to uh, any new ecosystem. Uh, like uh, some uh, scientific uh, science fiction uh, um, tales. Now, this, I believe, is uh, in effect uh, the Code of Ethics. is one of the most important uh, um, tools, instruments, and policy uh, opi um, and, and opinions that we have to, to, to discuss and to deal about. Thank you. We have, about, we have about two minutes for questions. Any questions? Oh. If you guys have a question, come up here because the mic has a cord now. Hi. So 
just just a comment. You you mentioned that Venus is not viable but, uh, for for well for terraformation, uh, but it there, it's. Uh, uh, Dr. Geoffrey Landis proposed a few years ago to use, uh, since the um, buoyancy of the atm uh, uh, the, our atmosphere is is higher than the carbon dioxide atmosphere of Venus, you could have floating uh, cities on the higher atmosphere where the range of temperatures is very, uh, uh, very uh, about 20 centigrade. Cent Centigrade uh, Celsius, uh, great. So, that's uh, well, uh, we are talking. Yes, I, I, I understand your question. I think we are talking about uh, terraforming. Uh, in this case, in the in the solar system, we are talking about terraforming uh, Mars, and we are also talking about terraforming planets which don't have any presence. Of course, I I, I believe that 99.99% uh, .99 Venus don't have any. Uh, living uh, presence, uh, but uh, uh, terraforming in this case doesn't mean uh, to have uh, like a floating uh, uh, cities or uh, presence in Venus. It means to change uh, uh, Venus atmosphere uh, and and adapt it to to terrestrial atmosphere. So it's a different type of uh, 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 of terraforming. It's uh, one is uh, do we have the possibility to be there. Uh, physically, we may have in the atmosphere, in the upper atmosphere, or if we find a way to send probe. I mean, uh, unmanned, certainly we can be in the surface of Venus with the proper equipment. Uh, and of course, maybe with uh, also in the atmosphere with some buoyancy, buoyant type of, uh, of structures. But this is not really terraforming. This is uh, the possibility to be in a, in a certain environment which is extremely hostile in our case. Um, the, my f first impression to your presentation was that your argument is too idealistic. So my question is, uh, how do you implement this code of ethics in this world? Uh, because the, there are so many counterexamples uh, that uh, we, uh, we will do anything what we want to do. Suppose that there could be very precious materials in the, some foreign uh, planet uh, that is very valuable to uh, efficiently generate uh, antimatter or some e uh, some energy sources, then we will be going there. In reality, uh, some petroleum companies are going to the uh, Papua New Guinea or the less advanced uh, country without any uh, uh <laughs> <laughs> Reason, uh, uh, without following any reasonable uh, international laws. So there should be some kind of mechanism to en uh, encourage uh, many people to follow this code of ethics. Otherwise, uh, I, don't, I don't say anything about uh, in other cases anyway. Okay, well, uh, I was, uh, when, when I was speaking, I was asking myself, what could have happened if uh, uh, we would have uh, had, uh, at that time, a code of ethics while discovering America, would we be here right now? Would we, uh, would we uh, if we didn't have uh, any type of uh, uh, actions, if we, if we would have lived the Aztec like they were, the American Indians like they were, the Incas like they were, what would have happened today? Would we have reached the same level of development that we have today, or will we still be a little bit more advanced in the Middle Ages? I mean, we didn't use any code of ethics. We just occupy and we, and we went over them. Now, if we talk about uh, uh, another alien civilization, we may do the same, I don't know. Uh, I mean, we may have a code of ethics. We may go in goodwill, but uh, we, we are billions of people. There can be reason for somebody to, to do to, to break the code of ethics. I mean, they can sell uh, medicine, for instance, or either for compassion or for greed, or they can do some other activities which may hurt uh, the other civilization. In fact, you see, there were people in the American West that were selling uh, weapons to the Indians or were selling alcohol. So you cannot stop uh, a single person, but you need to have a code of ethics. 
I mean, you need to have some sort uh, of way to deal with uh, other civilizations. And I hope that a, a more advanced civilization than our has a code, a code of ethics at the time that we have to deal with us. Thanks for all the questions, you guys. All right, so we're going to break for a couple of minutes till 4.30, and then if you guys want to, come join us back for the uh, General Assembly. We're going to talk about long-term questions that we have. Um, and then if you guys are also interested, tonight we're going to have a keynote speaker, Peter Gerritsen, and then um, that's at 8 o'clock. He's going to speak for 45 minutes, and then we're going to have a cocktail hour, so it should be really fun. You guys should come back at 8 o'clock. All right, that's it. We're going to go ahead and break.
take a seat if you would like to hang out here. Started with our General Assembly. Um, Anu Bowman is going to be leading this today. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Haley. So um, let's start by sending out an all points bulletin for Joe Ritter, please. Um, and while, while Joe finds his way in here, um, <laughs> so um, we have a, a, uh, a little bit of a panel shift today. Rather than read everybody's name again, I'm just going to point out that Giorgio Gavaraghi is, is sitting in for uh, Armand Papazian uh, for Star Voyager this evening. So it'll be good to get Giorgio's comments and views. And I'm going to jump right in with today. We're, this, is, this is our wrap-up day, and we're going to talk about the far future, 50 years out. So in order to prep us for that, let me, uh, let me do as I did yesterday and a little bit of a recap. What did we hear yesterday? With regard to the human condition question, oh, you know, I did the same mistake yesterday. Let me get my reading glasses. Sorry. question on human condition. Um, we heard about the slums of Cordova. Um, it was pointed out that money sent to space is not wasted in space, um, that we actually need frontiers for people to conquer, otherwise they'll continue to conquer frontiers on Earth, um, that commonly understood ROI for, for money spent on space, that is that when every, each, dollar return, each dollar spent returns seven dollars. Um, we, <laughs> we heard that going to the stars is like being born. Um, so there was the, the embryonic reference. And of course, dual use technology is important. There's a continuing dual use technology theme running through a lot of this actually. Um, with regard to the question about artificial intelligence, um, we, um, we heard that, uh, that we shouldn't actually send humans into space until the risks were, were very well understood. Um, we also heard that we don't want to send octopuses to space. We want to send humans. Um, can you say Skynet? And cybernetics. And the comment wasn't made after somebody mentioned cybernetics, but I don't know about you guys, I was thinking about the Borg. So with regard to the uh, question on extraterrestrial life, uh, Vostok, Vostok Lake, I'm saying that wrong, aren't I? Vostok, Vostok? Yeah. Um, which, of course, I think, you know, that, that, that brings up certain images. Um, we heard about the uh, three general orders. Um, we, um, it was observed that we should propagate into the universe with benevolence, but be pro-human. Um, we, somebody raised the, the comment that we currently have the issue of groups of humans um, have, have trouble, you know, the humans right now have, have trouble treating other groups of humans with respect. So, you know, we should, we should think about that with regard to, to space. Um, and we heard about, uh, of course, the prime directive was mentioned. And it was um, not said directly, but of course, how do you enforce the prime directive and how would you enforce the general orders? Um, so that's something that I took away from that. Um, ah, we have a full panel. That's good. Just in time. So let's go right to question one. Um, oh, you know, let me, let me, like I did the last two days, let me encourage everyone to scooch in. This is a, an interactive dialogue. We want as much in audience um, interaction and participation as possible. So question one for the, for, for the future, looking out 50 years beyond. Um, general topic is evolution. Human beings have evolved on planet Earth over millions of years. It is this evolution driven by a process of natural selection which has resulted in our form. 
As we move out into deep space, become acclimatized to different levels of gravity, atmospheres, etc., this may begin to have a gradual impact on the biological evolution of humankind, changing our very appearance and calling into question what it means to be Homo sapiens. Indeed, it may be possible to artificially accelerate our biological adaptation through technology. In the exploration of the cosmos, should we strive to preserve our current human form, or should we embrace the notion of adapting ourselves to new environments, either naturally or artificially? Jim? Well, we certainly aren't going to preserve our current form. The very definition of intelligence is the ability to adapt, and we're very good at it. In a matter of a few thousand years, we have spread across the entire ecosystem of Earth, including venturing into, into uh, the space, uh, and the deepest parts of the ocean. We do this through technology, starting from clothing, which gets us around most of the globe, uh, all the way to submersibles and aircraft and spacecraft. Attempting to preserve our current human form will be a hopeless goal. At the end of the cent this century, biotechnology will be in the bodies of every living individual. It's in the bodies of some of us already. We will have replaceable parts, augmented me mental faculties, improvements, upgrades, enhancements that we don't even imagine yet. And we will adapt to new environments by changing our bodies in very, very big ways um, uh, and on other parts, in other parts of the solar system so as to be able to live in lower G, to be live with lower pressure, to live in higher radiation environments. That we will do through, through technology and if you, th and uh, the, the human beings that will result will be much more varied than we are now. If you think race is an issue, think about what it's going to be like to have really different types of human beings. Uh, we'll do that through deliberate engineering of ourselves, not through the slow pace of evolution, far too slow in fact, and so we will not be the same even in the near future. Well, I'm afraid our answer from the Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshop is going to be very brief because, uh, like Jim, I believe we are continuing to evolve. Uh, just to divert a moment, um, how many people wear glasses, have had, uh, uh, had their vision corrected by lasers, have taken vaccinations, uh, where we've, we've engineered things to trigger our immune systems. My daughter is uh, insulin dependent, has insulin dependent diabetes, wears an insulin pump and a continuous glucose monitor, and we're very close to having a closed loop endocrine pancreatic system for that. So I, I think uh, in terms of medical devices and medical technology, we are already augmenting what it means to be human. We're repairing things as they go wrong, and that will continue to happen. And uh, it is our opinion when the ability to travel to the stars is at hand, whoever we are at that time will be who goes, and that it will be probably impossible on a planet-wide scale to direct or, or control these kinds of augmentations or evolutionary changes, whether they're accelerated by us or, uh, or otherwise. It'll be whoever we are at the time. So I'm going to go ahead and read this statement again, which was agreed by the Institute for Interstellar Studies. The enhancement of human beings has led to many benefits and continues to do so. There are clear discoveries and inventions on the horizon through utilizing technologies such as gene manipulation, DNA mapping, nanotechnology, artificial limbs. In the future, it may be possible that we can cure all current diseases and we can replace any part of the human body, including the brain. This would effectively allow for a form of immortality. The continued advancement of science and the development of technology should continue, but filters and mechanisms should be developed in parallel to ensure we remain fundamentally human in character, whatever that means. To answer this question first, we must try to define what humanity is and what parts of our humanity we feel are most important. Is it our bodies, our minds, our ability to build communities, to love, to hate, to show friendships or create spirit, our emotional expressions through the arts, our ability to perceive plausible futures from our imagination? It is an almost impossible question, and different human cultures will have different ideas about what is acceptable. As humanity disperses among the stars, evolution will begin to work its magic and isolated colonies of humans will eventually evolve into different species. But there will be a touchstone that unites all of us. We will all have the same origin, the same ancestors. We will all have come from Earth. It is our hope that today more people will come to realize that and see that we are in fact one species, inspirational images such as the Voyager Deep Space Mission, the Power Blue Dot as Carl Sagan called it, 
or the recent Cassini images of Saturn from the distant Earth-Moon system may help to stir this realization in the consciousness of our society. In summary, we believe that the human species will inevitably continue to evolve, especially when dispersed on an interstellar scale, but all of our descendant species will share a current origin, which is Earth. Okay, it's just further evidence that this is happening already. I mean, we do modifications to our body strictly for cosmetic purposes, uh, tattoos, piercing, <coughs> breast implants. Um, the, and also too, I, I mean, when we've been thinking about future starships, I, I, uh, I keep hearing, you know, kind of an underlying assumption that there'll be like the one followed by the other. But I kind of think once we reach out ability, there might be a number of them and having different flavors of how they do it and, and even people with different degrees of evolution, um, uh, modified evolution. Uh, oh, just as a segue, I don't know how many of you are going to have to face this at some time soon in your life, but imagine your daughter or son coming home and go, but mom, can I have an iPhone brain implant too? Sally got one. <clears throat> yeah, deal with that one. Um, but, you know, and these things will probably happen at different degrees depending upon, uh, you know, kind of social norms, you know, people trying to cluster to be a little bit. But you'll probably have people that, um, if it can be done, might re-engineer themselves, say, to have uh, uh, vacuum-tolerant, rad-hard exoskeletons with targeting computers and eyes in the back of their head um, and weapons at their extremities, you know, just for the fun. Who knows? I think that the idea, the notion um, of artificially accelerated uh, evolution, it's fascinating. It's nascent with the promise um, of an improved human 2.0. Um, I should start by saying that when I was speaking to the Icarus Interstellar team, uh, I found broad support for this artificial um, evolution. But you know, when I think about it, there's genetic evidence that the human race, human beings, in our history, came to the brink of extinction. And we brought it back from virtually the dead. Uh, and I think we've come too far to hand the mantle of success in propagation and our propagation to the universe to human beings 2.0. So I support the strict preservation of our current form, with the exception being that the evolution um, occurs naturally. We are human beings. As far as we know, the only creatures in the known universe that have the potential to colonize and to migrate to other solar systems. I see a future of abundance, an abundance of wealth, an abundance of power, an abundance of resources. So nature should bend to us, not the other way around. So I'm wary of, ad of adapting for two reasons. One, when you have different species, you're going to have different loyalties, and I think that dramatically increases the possibility um, of war. We have difficulty getting on with ourselves. What luck are we going to have with man 2.0, a creature 14 feet tall, lungs five times the size of ours, a shrunken cranium, and a purple hint to his skin? What is the chance for peace? I also think, and this is the second reason I'm worried, that it invites misuse when we start talking about human being 2.0. It invites misuse ideologically and militarily. The term superior human being come to mind and fill me with dread. Yeah. <laughs> consensus. I, I believe that uh, we are already in, a, um, in an evolution uh, direction, very fast. We are accelerating our evolution. We are already talking seriously about immortality. Not immortality as an endless uh, uh, body, but immortality as the possibility to eliminate the cause of death. Which are the cause of death, natural cause of death? Which are the cause of death today? Disease. Why we still have disease? Because we are backwards in our scientific uh, knowledge of our bodies, of our diseases, of our environment, all the causes, and so on. But we are on that way. We are already talking about uh, rejuvenation. Uh, uh, possibilities to, to change your cha your cells to which basically uh, what are the reasons for um, diseases and um, old age uh, if we consider old age a, a possible disease our alteration of our cells at atomic level and this alteration keeps going keep moving it uh, it improves it enlarges and then it gives uh, it gives the 
uh, it reached the disease level. Now, if we can uh, control this, if we can monitor that in real time, and we can intervene in real time, then we can stop any type of disease at the moment, the right moment that this disease is started. Now, these people who who will uh, our future uh, we, our future children, our our uh, descendants, and the people who will probably um, travel in the spaceships will be totally different from we are. They may be virtually immortal. They may have uh, uh, artificial uh, improvements in the, in the brain, in, in their physical uh, capabilities and so on. I mean, I'm sure that uh, we will reach a stage where human uh, Homo sapiens 2 or Homo galacticus uh, can be the, the real, uh, the real um, future um, um, man, human. What I would like to, to avoid, what I fear, is that uh, since our body is dependent from uh, our environment, uh, the fact that uh, we may have uh, people living on Mars, living on, uh, on the moon, growing on the moon, born in there, it may, uh, these people will not be able to come back to the Earth and, and live like we do, because they will have different uh, body uh, possibilities. So what I fear is that uh, uh, by going in any direction without uh, a certain ethic, uh, ethical control of our uh, humanity, we may, we, may, we may end up uh, creating uh, uh, several species, several mutants. And this is the main, uh, the main uh, problem we may face. We may keep uh, uh, the same type of humanity. Hi, it's a pleasure to be up here again. I, I'm kind of interested in hearing what you guys want to say about this, but I was asked, so I'll, I'll tell you my opinion. Uh, I've already signed up for uh, my Google Spin Glass Matrix implant with the Spooky Action at a Distance upgrade. So, um, uh, so seriously, are, are, uh, there's a lot of rocket science here, there's a lot of engineering here. Are there any molecular geneticists in the audience? Does anybody know what epigenetics is? Yes, great, great. Okay, so it turns out that uh, DNA uh, and how it, it changes and how it gets expressed are uh, really controlled a lot by environmental factors. And so DNA changes and what, what codons get expressed and more complex things get expressed uh, is controlled by a lot of things in our environment. So we're talking about a very different environment here. Let me restate the question. Do we choose to preserve our current form or embrace adapting naturally or artificially? Uh, I'll address all of them. Uh, embracing adapting naturally, well, if, if that's happening, then there's really no choice here. So I'm not sure why, why we would discuss that. Uh, but this is barring uh, miraculous technology that we don't know how to do yet. It's probably a long trip. And clearly, we must artificially mitigate uh, effects from microgravity for health reasons, radiation, uh, as I was talking about yesterday, one of the significant problems, that's a serious concern, uh, and, and do all kinds of other things for health reasons if we're going serious about going, right? There's a lot of tech that has to be developed. It's not just propulsion. And so uh, I think uh, the answer is, well, we have to if it's going to be a long trip. And by the time humans can do interstellar travel, though, Probably machine intelligence will be so developed that we may be cyborgs already. Uh, anu, can can you say Borg? Um, right. Uh, so uh, and you know, GMOs. I, I'm I'm not really into eating them, but and do I want to change a lot? Uh, no, but uh, I think people who are going to go are, are going to have to change some. Is it required? Uh, if it's a long trip, probably yes. Will we change? Uh, I think so. Audience, over here. So the comment I wanted to make here is, um, it is very important to keep in mind that um, one way or another, a uh, good choice or bad choice or, or whatever, 
Um, it is a choice which direction we humans take. It's not something that's going to happen inevitably. And I do think it's important to um, have a bit of a reality check about not, uh, the people outside this room who are maybe a little bit less up on some of these subjects. Um, there's, if, if, we, if there really is a serious move towards um, wholesale genetic engineering of people, you're going to see very widespread opposition. Just the very concept of engineering our food is enough to provoke uh, enormous political opposition. Um, people remember uh, what happened during the eugenics movement and will be very, very reluctant to go down that road again. So I think, I think that needs to be borne in mind as we're thinking about which direction we may go and, and the kind of choices that we make. Anyone on the panel want to comment on that one? Kevin. I'll just make a brief comment um, to give the opposite view, which is that, of course, um, around the world every day there are millions of children that die, and they die of horrific diseases or limbs sort of um, not being properly grown or you know, not having the right medication and so forth. So science has the power to essentially um, save a lot of those kids and therefore billions of human lifetimes um, forward. And so you're correct to point out there is a balance um, and as a society, we have to decide where that balance is. But I think um, I just wanted to give the opposite view that science has the, the power to liberate people of um, these horrific constraints on our lives. Mark? Um, one thing I wanted to add to, I, I really do echo that um, it is a matter of choice. And to some degree, I mean, I kind of think it's arrogant of myself and maybe the rest of us on our panel to even pontificate on something like this uh, that's beyond our future and beyond our authority to dictate. Um, I think the choices will be individual choices and they will be made um, at least the way humans, at whenever that point is reached, make their choices. So at this point, there's a lot that, you know, why argue about it now? I, I, I second that. The uh, uh, choices should be made by free individuals, not by governments, not by pressure groups, and not by law. Uh, it's an it's a individual matter, as, for example, you have uh, chosen to wear 17th century technology uh, glasses, and our friend at the end there is trying to get into the 21st century glasses, right? And, uh, and in fact, I, uh, I have 21st century lenses as well. These are synthetic lenses. I chose to buy them and have them installed because they're better than the originals. I just want to quickly respond to what um, Mark said. Um, I, f I don't think it's arrogant to discuss this because I think that how else do you decide what is ethical and what is moral in society? by discussing things. by I talked in my talk about science fiction and its role of describing plausible futures. It is essentially our toy, our play toy of the universe before we go out there to describe how we want to han handle things like interactions with ET and, and technology and, and space and time. And so talking about these things I think is the most healthiest thing you can do. And as a society we find a consensus on the way forward. Joe? I wanted to make a clear with that that my comment about the arrogance is in the fact of us actually being able to reach conclusions about this. Raising the questions and toying about it is something else, but I was kind of even sensing a tone uh, with this and maybe even one of the presentations earlier that it was more authoritative than warranted. Joe, please. Yeah, just really quickly, I, I, I don't think anyone here is trying to make a choice for humanity. I think healthy debate, especially about controversial things that people will get very excited about, is a very good thing. This is one of the reasons I, I love living in the United States, uh, that we can do these things. And, uh, you know, frankly, we're, we're not making any choices here. I think there is this very emotional thing that's getting stirred up because it's just like yesterday. Well, I want to raise my kids a certain way. I want to be human. I, you know, are people trying to change us? And, and so I don't think anyone up here is suggesting that. I think the discussion is really among us about what is required to do interstellar travel, uh, not setting policy. So let me, um, let me weigh in. We, we, um, we're having a conversation, and we agreed in advance to this particular conversation with these questions. So let's focus on the conversation the content of the questions and not whether we should actually be doing having the dialogue, because we already agreed to have the dialogue. So the gentleman there with the sweatshirt, um, Yeah, 
Yeah, uh, in science fiction, it's often come up with the social implications. Like, it seems like it's an individual choice, but as more and more people get implants and things like that, they can make others around them feel like they're pulling their punches in terms of their potential. And uh, just like with lifting jobs, if people start getting implants for lifting so they can lift more and more efficiently, it's harder for other people in the same sort of situation, but at the same time, everything will adapt around that. It's just a point that comes up. So back there in the red. Just as we do uh, keep back seed stock, do you see us going down the road where it might be we have islands of seed stock that we keep original and we choose not to have those people change. That would be a different ethical question. Rich, you want to take that one? I'm not, sure, I'm not really sure what you're asking. I mean, that doesn't bother me at all if it, if it stops people from going hungry, if it stops people from starving. I'm, I'm all for that. So you would be okay with two different tiers of people? One tier that goes on to I thought your question was asking about whether we're happy eating No, 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 food. no. <laughs> seed stock, I'm not seed sure. Seed stock as far as oh, seed. original seed. biological human beings. You're, you're talking about keeping a reserve of humanity exactly. without modification. Exactly. Yeah. Running yeah. around oh, okay. on an island somewhere so I, they can I, keep original. I'd have to think about that. It doesn't appeal to me on first, first I, You don't see that, that happening? No. We do it to plants. You know, I, I, plants I, aren't humans. So. This, this whole thing is going to sneak up on us. Uh, I'll tell you right now, there's an area of research for that to cure diabetes, which my daughter has, which would trick the human liver into producing insulin, which it doesn't do currently. And I'll tell you, if they ban it in the United States, I'll go to whatever country is willing to do that to help cure my daughter. So, um, you know, be it known that I'll be a lawbreaker if that happens, right? So I, I think this is going to sneak up on us. I think it's going to sneak up on us like our dependence on computers, like our, our dependence on glasses. I think over time, these little changes are going to happen to improve the human condition. And we're going to wake up 150 years ago uh, from now and realize that we're fundamentally different from where we are today. And, and I don't know that it's going to be a series of deliberate actions to improve people or to change people. I think it's just going to happen. We're already different. That's uh, right. Uh, Andreas? Thank you. The conversation we're having is about interstellar travel and how it relates to the, to the evolution of mankind, though, not just the general evolution of the species. So the, the I want to pose a, a uh, theoretical situation. So let's say that uh, genetic modifications or bio enhancements or our technological enhancements are, are up to the individual as is probably going to be the most likely. What if there's a select uh, group of people who believe they're destined to be humanity's, uh, humanity's ap ap apostles to the stars and deliberately bio-enhance themselves over perhaps even over generations so that their family is better attuned to interstellar travel to survive, survive a flight. Then the selection of the crew for the first interstellar ship is made, is, is already distilled through that generation. Like, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I don't, I don't see a problem with it. I mean, people compete to enhance the skills of their children already in lots and lots of ways, like getting extra tennis playing, getting better education. It's going to happen. So I, I, standing against it would be like standing against an avalanche. Joe? Um, one, one risk uh, that I see in all this uh, uh, possible situation is the fact uh, that we may, since uh, we are talking about uh, access to improve the technologies and and uh, expensive technology, that we may create a, a, a two-speed type of, uh, of humanity. Those who can afford certain improvements, uh, like rejuvenation and, and others, and those who will not be able to access. So we may create, a, we may put the seeds for a, a possible uh, uh, 
not saying civil war, but a possible a very dangerous situation between ourselves, between our species. Cavemen bonded together. I'm going to go to this theme again. And certain groups would survive. And, and so what is different is evil and bad. And this is this age-old thing that's built into us. And, and we're hearing it in a very modern way now. And, well, if they're different, that would be bad. And we must preserve what we are because, you know, something different would be bad. And, and I'm not sure that's really true. And I think that's what's be behind this emotional reaction that we're getting. And I'm not saying it's a bad reaction. I think it's a very natural reaction to have to these things. Ultimately, uh, I think what we're talking about is change in our spirit and in our knowledge and discovery here. And we want that fundamental change. The question is what we will do to have it, not should we regulate it or not. We're talking about enlightenment and knowledge and discovery in the universe. And if this is the change that we're talking about, then I, I sure hope we have it. Okay, one more and then we'll we'll wrap it up. Gentlemen, um, here on the end, so right there. Right, go ahead and keep your hand up so I can find you. I'm Philippe Lewis, and I was just, uh, I'm not a scientist or anything, but I'm very interested in ultra high tech stuff and ultra ancient stuff. So I'm kind of like in the middle between both spectrums. And from what I'm hearing, it sounds like there's a lot of emphasis more so on the external aspects with what's going on outside of us versus more so the internal with regards to calibrating our own sensors and going out as far as we would externally, going as far in internally. Uh, are y'all interested in that internal aspect just as much as the external aspect? Well, well, sure, and the first aspect you think of is, is intelligence or IQ. I remember half the population is below average. <laughs> it, if we could improve that, it might improve a whole lot of things in civilization. And who would, who would resist it after all? If you could get another 10 points in IQ, Think of the time you'd save in education. Think of how much time you'd save on crossword puzzles. <laughs> Joe? Uh, if it's Gaussian, half will always be below average. But, uh, you know, thank, thank you for your question, Philip. And, and I think I was just starting to touch on it about enlightenment and knowledge and discovery. So I, I won't go through that again. But ultimately, this is what this is all about, at least for me. Um, I'd just like to respond to um, the, the question, what Jim said about raising intelligence and IQ. So I once uh, tried to test myself on IQ, and I, I came up with the equivalent intelligence of a, a squirrel or something. <laughs> um, so um, I think that the IQ system is a completely flawed way of measuring intelligence, and um, I think our society grabs onto it, and people aspire to be more intelligent. There are many other ways of being intelligent. You only have to look at the animal kingdom to see how some of the things they do, like crows who can put a stick and pull out a grub from a hole, that's intelligence. Um, I don't think we understand what intelligence is, and I think we need to um, understand that before we say we want to be more intelligent, because um, there are people that solve fundamental problems in life, life problems, um, that aren't necessarily what you would call academic problems, but they are fundamental problems of life, and some of them are geniuses for getting around those problems, and that is a form of intelligence. Um, but education, raising educational standards, absolutely, that solves a lot of problems. So um, we're going to move on to the next to next question, um, but I want to point out that we deliberately saved the harder questions, if you will, for the last day. They've been getting progressively a little more more contemplative. So um, I, it's good. It's good that we're getting a lot of discussion. It's good that maybe this is causing our heads to hurt a little bit. Um, it, it, so just throw that out there, and, 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 and please just try and enjoy the conversation. So question two, interstellar drivers. The space race was dominated by Project Apollo. One of the misunderstandings about this project is that people interpret it to be a, a scientifically based set of missions, when in fact it was a geopolitically driven, driven, brought about by the threat of war or technological superiority of one nation over another. The other two drivers for space missions are economic ones and exploration for the pursuit of knowledge. Of these three drivers, political, economic, and discovery, what should be the dominant one for the first human mission to another star? Jim. Well, I think there are really two 
possible objectives for a human mission to another star. As I've said before, I think you want to send robotic missions as long as you can until you reach a point where you have to send humans because it's a, a much bigger matter. Now, the first reason would be to undertake complex investigations, typically, I hope, because we have discovered life or even civilization on exoplanets. Investigating such possibilities, of course, in these categories is called discovery. But in fact, I think these three categories are too limited. There is a meta category, which is probably a greater motivation, at least in my opinion. It would be to seed an Earth ecosystem on a planet beyond this star. Transferring life's, uh, life elsewhere could be considered a political objective, but it's really a, a much bigger category than that. Many in this community feel, I think as I do, that humans have uh, a, I hate to use this word, moral imperative uh, to expand the life of Earth because we're the only species that can actually do that or has any hope of doing that. Nothing else can get outside of this gravity well, and of course we'll take the rest of the ecosystem with us. Therefore, I would put this objective in a category, neither strategic, uh, you might call it strategic, you might call it moral, but you might call it, I would call it a meta category. It's above the objectives in this list. Yeah, we, we believe that the most likely answer to this question is probably discovery and exploration, perhaps aided by political reasons. Within the known laws of physics, any such voyage will require enormous resources and long time frames. Without faster than light travel, there will be, in our opinion, no possible economic reward or political reward except perhaps prestige for whoever commits to launching the mission. The trip will actually likely be a major burden to the senders. So the initial motive will likely be discovery, exploration, and we would have to agree with the point Jim made, survival of life as we know it and getting it out of the cradle of the solar system. The achievements of Project Apollo were astounding and will surely be remembered for many generations to come as one of the greatest accomplishments of our species and our struggle to escape from the apparent earthbound limits to growth. However, Although we must not detract from the magnificent of the achievement, it is a matter of history that Project Apollo was not a scientifically driven mission, but purely a political one, although it had scientific benefits to its fruition. This is something not realized by many members of the public when they fail to understand why we did not continue our journey to the red planet Mars and beyond. Post-Apollo, human beings haven't left Earth orbit, and this achievement did not lead to a sustainable space-based economy or to human beings exploring the rest of the solar system. Politics and economics is what led to the end of Project Apollo, because the economic justification for continuing was not made, given competing resource requirements for government money. It is clear, therefore, that in order to create a sustainable space-based society, all three of the above drivers must be in place. The proposals and missions should have political support across the political divide, with minimum intervention from the political elite once a program of work has been set out. The economic arguments for embarking on the mission should be clear, justifying the spending through commercial benefit and social benefit and the creation of new industries or educational value. The discovery driver is a part of the core of what it means to be human. Although the economic and political drivers may differ from one nation to another, the discovery element is something that we can all share and we all benefit from. It tells us about our history, our origin, our current capabilities and potential today, and our future trajectory on Earth and in space. The creation of human civilization in space requires a cross-section of stakeholder support, and all of the above will be critical elements to that. It is possible that society will need to engage in vast projects, such as the construction of starships, in order to fill its growing production capacity, and whose idleness could otherwise lead to social disorder. This will clearly require an approach which includes political, economic, and scientific elements. As a society, Aspiring for nobility among the stars, we cannot neglect any of these drivers if we hope to succeed in our long-term ambitions. In summary, on a large-scale project, many different drivers need to work together, including political, economic, and scientific elements. Okay, um, one thing, I have an objection with the question, or the word should, on that question, because it makes it like we are supposed to make a recommendation. Um, there's a difference between what should we do and what might happen. Um, 
also i have to disagree with one of the other things that you know considering the uh not likelihood i mean if we constrain ourselves to the laws of physics as we know it i mean come on we're talking possibly two centuries before we can even send a probe by then there might be unforeseen breakthroughs that even go beyond the kind of stuff that myself and my colleagues are thinking of and those methods whatever those will be will sharply affect uh what the choices will be um you know that said when i look at humanity on the what should be the driver well obviously it comes down to human survival uh, but what could be a driver well you know two centuries from now who knows whether it will take a huge investment to send out uh, colony ships or world ships and how many people there might be on them uh, it might be uh, small fragments of humanity wanting to get away from all the rest of the crazies uh, as they define on the planet um, and it could be several of them doing precisely that. So what should it be? Okay, human survival. What could it be? Anything. Um, I find it hard to imagine uh, a future where economics uh, is, the, is the driver for an interstellar mission. Uh, and the question specifically asked about the first human uh, mission to another star. And I, I would imagine if economics, if a return on investment was the crux of the mission, then, then the humans would be replaced by robots. And then couple that to uh, the fact that our own solar system has quadrillions of dollars of wealth in the form of metal um, and materials. It, it's difficult for me to imagine anything that would compel us to go to another solar system and then come back again. I can't, I can't imagine anything other than some unobtainium. Um, so from the political side of things, you know, politics implies governments backing things, which implies prone shifts, uh, being prone to shifts in policy, uh, which leads to council programs. I can't see, see that being you know, a compelling driver either. I think a compelling reason um, to explore solar systems beyond our own is that it should be considered um, an end into itself, um, an undertaking which doesn't see any, serve any deep political purpose economic or even survival purpose. Um, I think it should be the expression of a curious um, and energetic species looking to expand our grasp of the universe in which we inhabit. And I believe that a civilization worthy indeed of interstellar exploration um, with an abundance of wealth and resources at our command, I think that it would be naturally inclined to interstellar exploration. I'm a little bit more uh, pessimistic uh, in the sense that uh, we are unable to send uh, a manned mission to Mars, which is feasible. It's uh, relatively uh, inexpensive. We're talking a few billion dollars. And we are not able to do it. <coughs> so a mission, an interstellar mission is uh, uh, much, much more uh, expensive. Uh, it's uh, much more ambitious. And um, unless uh, there are um, uh, reasons beyond our control, like uh, alien invasion or uh, human survival, which is still difficult because who will be, who will go? A uh, hundred people, a thousand people, and uh, what about the other ten billion? Or uh, asteroid impact or some other type of uh, situation? I don't think that. Uh, I think that the only one which can make uh, some reasonable. Uh, uh, can be reasonable is uh, economic uh, profitable business plan, which is the, the way which I also see the possible uh, manned mission to Mars or, um, or a return to the moon and so on. <coughs> which driver, not for going to the stars, but for sending humans to the stars? Uh, so my choices are political, economic, discovery, um, I, I can't pick uh, something like survival or something like that, I guess. Well, all right, I'll take these sort of in order. Uh, political. The ever-present optimist in me says, by the time we have interstellar capability, I certainly hope that there's no Cold War to spur us on, like Apollo did. We, and that was certainly about human discovery and the human spirit. But, but we all know why it happened when it happened. And, and that was purely political and, and, and confluence of, of various scientific effects and, and technologies coming together. To solve the enormous, can I say enormous twice? Enormous 
three times. Check technical challenges for going to stars. We must cooperate to do this. And so uh, that sort of removes the possibility of political bias. Uh, I, I think we either are going to be very political and, and fighting about things, or we're going to cooperate and make it to the stars. Uh, the uh, economic driver, I think, is powerful. And yes, it takes enormous resources to go to the stars, to use up resources. So is that good for economics? Well, it's good for trade. And certainly, and, and I'm going to say it again, dual use technology, developing technology that is useful for starships is good for humanity, it's good for the economy, it's good for making money and profit. Okay, so that, that's certainly going to happen. Um, discovery. Well, I, I wonder why am I curious? I'm curious why I'm curious. There is something built into me genetically that makes me curious. Why do humans have this need to explore? Well, that's it for me. I mean, we have an inherent need to explore. Uh, is it because we are von Neumann machines that are pre-programmed to go on to another planet? Maybe, I don't know. I mean, one could certainly consider that, that we, are, we are already the space probes. I don't know if that's true, um, but we, we can talk about it. What was not mentioned, so I, I think for me the compelling reason is the knowledge, the discovery, but not mentioned was survival, extinction level events. We know that there are periodic mass extinctions on the earth every 26 million years. Uh, I, I work on uh, telescope things for detecting asteroids and comets that, that could collide with earth. Uh, it's very likely that we will have, it, it's, it's not a possibility that there will be a major extinction level event. It is a certainty. The question is when, and I'm not talking in our lifetimes necessarily, but these things happen. We know this from the geological record. So uh, maybe it's mandatory to do this for that reason. Jim, go ahead. Uh, well, let me, let me give you an answer to the question. Why do we explore? Uh, well, there, because there's our Darwinian selection advantage to having a species with a larger territory. Consider if the primates, the original way back primates, clustered around the base of a volcano and uh, were happy there and didn't go anywhere else and it blew up and blew them away, right? They're, they're not here now, so there's a selection advantage to moving out through territory. Now, I, that's why I mentioned clothing early, earlier. It's a big adaptation and it's artificial. It's allowed us to live all over the world, including places like Dallas. And the, uh, I, I wish, we, I don't think we'd be doing too well here if it weren't for the, especially in the winters, I, I used to live here. So I'm a scientist, not an economic um, person. So I don't know much about economics, um, but I wanted to respond to um, interpretation of what is an economic driver. A very good friend of mine, when I was once talking to him about money, um, he kindly sent me a book um, to explain to me about the value of money, and it was a very interesting book. And one of the things he said to me was, Kelvin, money enables you to do things and get stuff, like build space shuttles. And I think that was a really good argument. Um, so Columbus went to the New World, and he didn't go because um, Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand said, go and find new fossils and new minerals, and just go there and um, bring back wealth, put, plant the flags, okay, that's how history worked. But as a result, you make discoveries along the way, you find new things, and you create new resources, new, new territory. And so um, economics is a driver for discovery. They are deeply coupled together, and ultimately, the starship itself, um, all of the concepts we think about, whether it's gyms, microwave beams, or Daedalus, or any of these concepts, they require enormous velocity, which means enormous energy, which means money, which means economy. You cannot build a starship, especially a human starship, if you do not have a, a sustainable space-based economy in place. So economics has to be a fundamental driver. Um, I just wanted to make that point. Rich? Um, a comment and then a, a question, actually, for, for Joe. Um, so talking about um, trade, I think fundamentally if you trade something, you're trading um, either something that's physical or something that's intangible, like an experience or like information. Um, and so, you know, I can't envision anything that, that's physically worth going to another star system and bringing back. And for the more intangible things, I mean, we can transmit signals at the speed of light very, very cheaply. So I could envision that between two star, star systems, what could not just simply be 3D printed at the other end or sent 
as, as information. So I want to try and understand, uh, Joe, what you think, just try and understand what you think might actually be physically traded between two solar systems. Yeah, I, I don't think I was trying to say that. And Rich, I, I completely agree. Uh, let's beam photons back and forth and get information. If there are resources, I mean, get what you need in the Oort cloud or asteroids or uh, there are a lot easier ways to go. And, and, and you know, in a minute we're going to talk about other civilizations. I don't think they're going to spend the energy to get stuff from us to go back. So, yeah, let's let's uh, send photons that, that may be some correlated pairs, some nice information. Um, I, I don't think we're going to be trading partners there. I meant trade on Earth and developing ecosystems of companies here. Yeah, not 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 with uh, other other stars. And and I'm not limiting colonization, but with current technology, uh, I and the long times involved and the huge energies involved with anything that I see foreseeable uh, in the next couple of centuries. Uh, yeah, we're I'm, I'm not talking about trade between stars. So let's um, invite the audience into into this conversation. This relates to uh, the previous question, um, that one of the laws of physics is the conservation of energy. And that flows into all physical, social, and biological systems. The most efficient system prevails. You know, the cavemen started using fire and then tools to harvest their, their prey, and that was technology then. And, uh, we're never not going to use technology. The person that used the most technology, that civilization will prevail, as Jim pointed out lucidly. So I, I uh, with regards to exploration, that's a social aspect of running out of room. At the end of this century, we're going to probably run out of room in, uh, on this planet uh, as it keeps on growing. So uh, technology is our way out. Whether that precipitates stellar missions, it's tough to predict if um, if uh, Sunny White's warp drive works. We you know we may uh, Elon Musk will take it over and start selling trips out of here if it gets too crowded. I, um, if I, I don't think of running in, in, I don't think that running out of room is um, a good excuse or a good reason to leave the Earth. I think if you look at the growth rate, you know, how many human beings are being born each year, you know, you look at the 7 billion population, the growth rate is, is, is 1 or 2 percent, and then you calculate how many human beings per second would need to be lifted off the planet, I mean, it's hundreds of thousands per second just to maintain equilibrium, so I'm not sure that um, running out of room on Earth is a, is a good, in what sense? I don't think a starship people, is going to solve the population people like, problem. People like uh, uh, Musk will not just want to go to Mars. He'll say, Let, if the technology or and physics allows it, he'll go to the next habitable stellar system. And if the uh, Webb telescope ever gets built, we'll be able to define and see which planets have uh, life on them. Calvin. So just, just very quickly, I agree with what Richard's saying, but I think I understand your point. I think fundamentally it goes back to what Gerard O'Neill did in the 1970s with space habitat work, which is the argument is that space has much more volume and there's much more resources in space, and if we want to expand as a liberty, free, democratic society, let's get into space and we can have as many babies as we want and continue expanding. But obviously on Earth, you, there's, there is a finite limit because the Earth has a finite amount of water and a finite amount of and resources, and so um, th that is that is in that way a driver for pushing space exploration. Um, but I, I do agree. I do see what Richard's saying. I agree with that. Mark, uh, you know, this whole conversation uh, made me realize that we're overlooking uh, something. Um, 
one, if we're going to be advanced enough to where we can support human life in space, then we have, you know, uh, self-sustainable systems or whatever. If you have self-sustainable systems, you don't have to pay for your living. I mean, none of the animals on Earth have to give us dollars so that they can live on the Earth. Uh, so this notion of that even we're going to be uh, judging this, these decisions by finances or whatever, well, will that even be quite there. Now the idea too, there's the issue of power and wanting to have control over more people, which is, is part of our instinct. Um, but if it becomes possible that uh, there are sustainable ways of uh, supporting yourself and that these can spread through the solar system as we even increase to become more proficient for um, interstellar flight, I mean, who pulls together the resources and stuff to make things happen? I'm not sure if it's going to be like a single cultural thing or even an economic thing. It might just be which pockets of humanity or whatever thing they might be, um, can they collect enough uh, material from the solar system to do what they think is cool, regardless of what the other folks are doing. Dr. Vandenberg? I think there's a common denominator for all mankind for this desire to go to the stars. In all, practically all cultures and religions, we believe the gods are up there in heaven. And now starflight means we would like to go to heaven and really see what is there going on in heaven and what kind of experiences we might have to go into heaven. So there is a common denominator if you go to American, Native Americans, to Christian, wherever. They always believed the gods are somewhere in heaven. And then, of course, there is a famous philosopher, Schopenhauer. He said, the world, he wrote a book, the world is will and perception. So we have the will to go itself. Everybody has a certain perception of the world, but there is a common perception, and that perception is we have all a will to do something. And of course, that is something which unites us. Why are we here? Why are we interested? Why are you interested in the interstellar space flight and so on? We are for subconscious reasons, which may have some religious prejudices. It's the gods up there. We would like to go to heaven. Even though our telescopes so far haven't seen heaven, they are more like hell. Most of the planets we have seen, there are storms which come supersonic speed, but we are interested in a second Earth. Which is something like heaven. Thank you. Last. Yeah, I guess just a, a comment I'd like to make is that if, if I were asked this question as to why I personally want to go, it's because I want to go explore, I want to see what's there. And I also think there's a moral imperative for the survival of the species in the long term. That is not necessarily what I'm going to tell the people who have the money to finance it. <laughs> okay? And if you look back at the history of space exploration, uh, you know, with, it, just look at Von Braun, right? He went with who was going to pay him the money to develop rockets. And you, and, and you look at uh, Columbus. He went to the people who had the money to finance the voyage. So I think there are going to be motivations for us, which may be very different from the motivations of the people who fund us to go do this. And that's that just what I want to throw out. I think there will be varied motivations. But on a personal level, I just want to see, even if it looks like hell, I want to see what it looks like. Okay? So we only have time for one more quick comment. I'm going to throw it to the gentleman in the orange right there. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering, I guess uh, with, we know there's lots of resources in space, um, whether it be for discovery or tourism. I feel like there's a sneaking suspicion that economic is going to get us there initially as a baby step. And another sneaking su suspicion is that it's going to be some kind of mining company. Now, what kind of thing can we convince these mining companies, other than metal, which we have here enough of, I feel like, maybe nuclear material. Is there anything that we can convince specifically mining companies or other companies to get there? So that comment actually very nicely ties back to, I believe, something that Rich talked about a day or two ago with regard to, to incentivizing a, a uh, profit uh, a angle to exploration. So um, let me I can, I, go I ahead, Mark. Go ahead. 
Okay, you know, and two, about uh, fooling your uh, funding sources, if you convince them that there is a zero calorie aphrodisiac out there, I think you could fund that. I'll give you a one word answer unobtainium, something we can't get here. What is it? We don't know because it's not here. On, 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 those, um, on that note, we're going to move to the last question of the, uh, the General Assembly session on the topic of extraterrestrial contact. Given the vast number of stars in our galaxy, it is, it is in, in principle feasible that the intelligent civilizations may already exist. In the future, contact may be made with spacefaring societies which roam between the stars, allowing both technological and cultural exchange of information. From studies of historical interactions between civilizations here on Earth, the outcome of such interactions has led to various resu results, ranging from peaceful, productive coexistence to war, destruction, and genocide. In the event that humans encounter intelligent civilizations, and given the risk of cultural, technological influence, or even possible warfare, should we seek to minimize or maximize our chances of contact? Jim. I would say that we need to maximize it, but only after having a proper conversation with ourselves. Because uh, a strong, our strong curiosity has made a search for alien civilizations. However, I feel that the people of Earth should undertake a communications with alien civilizations only after extensive consideration of the possible consequences. Uh, perhaps through our governmental representatives, but more, I would like a, a broader uh, consensus among many intellectual and political uh, factors. Uh, that's because there are potential risks, and it's our risk, not the government's risk or the scientist's risk. It's the gov It's our risk. Although the entertainment industry emphasizes warfare and colonization aggression uh, as the risk, because it's more dramatic, a lot more likely scenario, as I said yesterday, is simple, simply culture shock. Much of the destruction of the non-European civilizations a during and after the age of uh, exploration uh, had as a large component of their decline, not just the guns, germs, and steel, but the shock, the shock of finding an advanced civilization that it could exceed their capabilities in every sphere of human achievement, that shock left many of what are now called third world cultures stunned some still to the present day. Therefore, contact with alien civilization should be carefully monitored. Transfers of information or technologies that would follow from that should be taken cautiously, allowing time to consider the impacts on human society. That debate is underway now and not well recognized. I will talk about it in tomorrow's talk about the METI debate, where METI stands for Messaging to Extraterrestrial Intelligence. An unambiguous signal from an extraterrestrial civilization may be a motivator, depending on what they have to say. And your actions are going to depend on your outlook and the situation at hand, whatever that reality may be. If superior we meet inferior them, then I'm going to refer you back to the general orders that we talked about yesterday. If it's the other way around, then we need to cross our fingers and hope that they have a version of the prime directive that is similar to our own. The chances of running into someone of about the same level of development as we is remote. And in fact, I would be darn suspicious if it happened. <laughs> uh, given the energies and time required to mount an interstellar expedition and the time scales involved, and, and for this I want to refer to deep time, think how long the Earth has been here, four and a half billion years in a 13 billion year old universe, and the time scale that we humans have been around is, is an incredibly small part of that, and even smaller still is the time period where we've even thought about going to the stars or might have the capability to go to the stars. And if we don't mount this mission for another 10,000 years, I would argue that that is still an incredibly small fraction of time. And the likelihood of us overlapping with someone with a civilization that we might even recognize as similar to our own is near zero. Therefore, even though we believe it is a highly unlikely probability, yet fun to think about, uh, I, I don't think we need to worry about it because I don't, think, I don't think the likelihood of us encountering a civilization even close to our own is, is even possible. The discovery of life in the universe, especially intelligence, will be a tremendous and enriching experience which should thrill us with excitement. That said, 
It should not be expected that any intelligent culture we discover in deep space should either look like us or behave like us. The evolution of an independent species in space will naturally lead to incredible biological forms due to the existence of fundamentally different atmosphere, gravitational well, or risk factors such as radiation environments. Similarly, it is unlikely that these independent societies will necessarily share all of our cultural, ethical, and moral values, and some of them will be so different from ours so as to appear abhorrent to us. Even within the animal kingdom of Earth, we can find examples of behavior that makes us wince, such as female insects eating a mouse spider in the act of mating. So too, our culture may seem strange to others. For example, the domestication and eating of other animals in our culture may be intolerable in their own cultures. In contrast, we may also be an irresistible <coughs> delicacy to the aliens. On the other hand, we may learn and grow through encountering a civilized alien who may be friendly and willing to share their personal and societal experiences and knowledge with us, although one often wonders whether humans would afford a similar courtesy. Their variation on cultures and behaviors is likely to be much greater with species that derive from entirely different planetary systems. How do we handle the integration of the human culture, even partial, with that of an alien culture in this context? We can seek learning experiences from our own species as analogs for plausible scenarios, but many of the cultural interactions in human history have resulted in cultural dominance or even annihilation rather than cultural harmonization. The continued pursuit of peace on Earth among humans is likely to ultimately give us the tools and the maturity we need to know how to handle these encounters. We must also be aware that ideas that can do just as much damage as war, if extraterrestrial ideas or knowledge are absorbing, absorbed by our culture, could it destroy some of the things we value most? Where will it leave our religions? Where will it leave science if all of our questions are answered? Will it make us feel part of something greater, or will it make us feel inferior and set our culture and civilization back? That said, isolation stagnates while innovation stimulates, and both the pros and cons have to be discussed and understood fairly. There's going to be risk, but if we have taken the time to better understand contact, to appreciate what the problems can be, and have plans in place to deal with them, then we can manage that risk. Furthermore, by understanding the history of contact better, we will have understood ourselves better. The second thing we must do is reconnaissance. Is anybody out there? We don't know, so let's find out. But do so quietly until we know what we're getting ourselves into. Caution is advised in the pursuit of the stars. Since alien civilizations, if they exist, will be older and more capable than ours in likelihood, they are vastly more likely to encounter us than we are to con contact them. And this implies whether or not we continue to explore. But the more we explore, the better prepared we will be. I want to start by echoing what Les said about the probability that we're going to uh, meet some species at our same level is extremely rare. Um, if we meet someone who's inferior, okay, then we're in control of the situation. Except that makes them maybe want what we got. And granted, they might be inferior, but they're clever enough to take it. Uh, and the same way the other things reversed. If we meet someone who's superior to us, do they really have any strong interest in us? Maybe other than uh, if they have curiosity, but we would, oh, damn, that's a cool ship. I want that. I wonder if I can finagle how to get that. So, you know, we are, in a sense, a threat. Um, as far as if I had my own starship and I was out there, I would proceed stealthily. I would try and find out as much about what's out there and what the civilization is like before I even hopefully reveal that I exist and then make my decision on what kind of thing I see. Well, that said, and granted, I imagine that I'm going to be scared. Um, but that said, after, you know, if it looks like this is an approachable situation, my curiosity would probably be overwhelming and after that sense of, okay, familiar enough with the situation, I'd probably make contact then. Oh, and one thing too, we gotta remember that at least right now, we're pretty easy to kill. And for all we know, we could taste good with ketchup. Um, if you'd asked me three years ago, I would have embraced the idea of two-way contact um, and us just going out there and trying to um, connect with, with other civilizations, but this is a a really interesting question. So I think it forces us to um, realize that as we grow older and as we uh, mature, life-changing events force us to readdress um, our values. 
Um, since I became a father, I've become a lot more conservative. And upon thinking about this, I feel that seeking out two-way contact between civilizations um, is a reckless act. I think it opens up the possibility of the absolute and complete obliteration of the human race. Um, so 100% of the technological species that we know about today, the intelligent technological species, um, can be aggressive. So I think until we have a lot more information, um, a lot more data, um, we should be more conservative. Um, Non-humans, extraterrestrials, look, they're either going to be one of three things. They're going to be bene benevolent, indifferent, or they're going to be malevolent. And I think that while the benefits of meeting a benevolent civilization might be alluring, I think the risk of meeting an advanced malevolent culture um, outweighs the other possibilities, and I believe it should be avoided. If uh, we analyze um, uh, the time frame of uh, our civilization, our society, uh, we can say that uh, life appeared on Earth about four billion years ago, and our society is only, if we, if we consider our society not just Homo sapiens, but we consider the moment that we started uh, to have some sort of, uh, of culture, the moment we start uh, writing, we started uh, having a history, we are talking of five, six, maybe we can say 10,000 years. Okay, uh, I believe that uh, if uh, we uh, don't uh, develop uh, uh, interstellar travel, if we stay in our planet, it may be extinct much sooner than if we go the other way. And I believe that this may have happened to endless uh, societies, or not even societies, life system which uh, uh, are in other planets or in other, uh, in other uh, star planetary systems. They may have been uh, uh, endless type of, uh, of life and we will never be aware of it because they didn't achieve, uh, uh, in this case, interstellar travel. So interstellar travel is important because it allows us to have this possibility to, to spread uh, our, um, our species and not to become extinct. Now, uh, if we meet uh, other uh, uh, societies, we have other contacts. Uh, of course, we have a, a broad range, uh, as I spoke before on in uh, the paper, we have a broad range of possibilities, uh, depending on their level of uh, development, uh, depending on our goals, and depending on other circumstances. I believe that we should maximize this possibility but uh, in an intelligent way, without interfering with them, uh, by keeping control of them, by monitoring them, in a, maybe in a concealed way, but we should. Uh, we should maximize the knowledge of other uh, possible civilization, other possible partners, because at the end, uh, what could be the best uh, solution for, for everybody, for both, to, to be partners, to be together, not to be enemies, not to be rivals, and so on. So uh, this is my, my thought. I mean, uh, let's maximize this possibility, but with all the care that we may, we may take. Extraterrestrials, minimize or maximize contact? Wow, if we only had that choice, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't that be something just to start with if we could even, yeah. Uh, so uh, the, the question is a bit open-ended because it doesn't say whether we're talking about remote or in-situ contact. So uh, I'll address both briefly. Uh, I mean, yesterday I described, uh, uh, I gave a talk that taught how to increase imaging resolution by a factor of a million and potentially what physics needs to be studied to increase it by a trillion. Uh, Bill Lupin uh, gave a talk on how to do extraterrestrial communication with uh, low power lasers, you know, and we have very efficient uh, uh, single photon counters and things like this. So I, I, I have to say that I, I bet I'm not the only life form that has figured out how to do this. So, you know, we could likely communicate with each other. They likely could image or do these things now if we're just figuring out how to do it. So, um, you know, it's 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 
contact, yes. Now, if we're talking about face-to-face uh, -face contact, here people are, are worried about safety. Um, but we have to wonder why no contact has happened yet. And so before seriously answering the question, I'm just going to put it out there. Maybe it's worth studying what bounds the Fermi paradox. Maybe we should be building some large imaging devices or, or large telescopes, ground-based, space-based, whatever, so that we can at least put a boundary on the Fermi paradox and, and say, well, should we even take time and, and debate this? Uh, I guess last, uh, should we be afraid of what is different? In, in this case, I might say yes. Uh, if and, and we were having an interesting conversation yesterday if, if uh, the Icarus was a good fraction of light speed and, and hadn't decelerated and was coming right towards Earth, I would be very afraid. Uh, this, this would be an extinction level event, right? So uh, if there is, and, and, and so maybe we should be looking at planetary defense with things we can do now and, and at least have it ready for asteroids and things like this. This is all very feasible. But if there is a very advanced civilization that can come the distance it's very likely that they'll be setting the terms of the contact, not future humanoids. Uh, so shall we worry about being curious or fearful? Uh, I, I'd love to talk to them. Calvin? So I just wanted to make a comment about the Fermi paradox, because I think it's incredibly important for so many reasons I, I haven't got time to go into today. Um, the Drake equation is the main vehicle that we use to really assess the solutions to the Fermi paradox, and it's a wonderful tool um, for allowing us to think about the problem. But fundamentally, we cannot use the Drake equation as existing form as a way of bounding the problem, and simply for two reasons. The first is that it completely neglects the possibility that life evolves from a, a planet and moves on and colonizes other planets. Um, you're just really considering um, life that's evolved on one planet around a, a star. Um, and there are other bodies in the universe um, free-floating planets and other objects, perhaps, which it maybe doesn't take account of. Um, and secondly, um, the definition of life itself. Um, only when I was a child, I remember studying biology at school and telling us about the importance of photosynthesis and um, how um, plants did not lead, absolutely needed um, sunlight in order to get their energy. And of course, we've now discovered all these uh, extremophiles and other things in environments where they don't necessarily get solar energy, they get energy from other means. So the definition of what life is um, needs to be really debated and considered. And only when you've done thought about that a little bit can you really properly bound the problem. But the Drake equation currently is very limited. And I think the SETI community needs to really think about how to advance, move on from the, that wonderful tool that does the Drake equation to the next level. Jim? Uh, one, one quick response to, to Jim, the other Jim at the other end. The uh, max minimize or maximize? Are you sure, there's a way to maximize it for sure. Build big beacons. Uh, now it's not beacons are not cheap. They cost billions of dollars, but it can be done. And I'll point this out tomorrow. Uh, it, it can be done with present technology, but it hasn't been done yet. The leakage radiation from Earth is really not detectable in a serious sense. But we could make ourselves very detectable if we wished. That's how we would maximize it. To minimize it, you prohibit beacons. Rich? Uh, I, I figured since we're here in Dallas, uh, there's a nice analogy to make. I've lived in Texas for a number of years, and we like to play poker, specifically Texas Hold'em. And I think that ET contact is the equivalent of going all in. I'm not going to go all in with toupee. You better be damn sure you've got a raw flush. <laughs> and I mean that from a technological perspective, a military, uh, military perspective, and a reconnaissance perspective, and, and everything else. Um, when he mentioned flush, um, I imagined if we were talking about Captain Kirk's motivations, we'd have a certain other motivation to talk about. <laughs> so let's throw this out to the audience. Jerry, did you want to make a comment? I think the whole panel is uh, really about 5% uh, uh, right on, uh, on, on all three subjects. So I was going to say on, uh, quickly, on, uh, very quickly on, on the uh, evolution, don't bother to talk about uh, uh, genetic evolution because man will be living in the solar system long before it goes into stellar. So the, that whatever space colonies exist in the solar system uh, 
will have cultures, cultural and political evolutions, and those, will, those that are suitable will go into stellar, those that, that are not won't. And then quickly on interstellar drivers, simplistic to think of government drivers once again, what, what government where, the government will probably be on Titan or possibly in the asteroid belts. Uh, the, and there will be several governments because the, you know, when anybody is sitting on independent resources, the United States knows this, they can declare independence from whatever founding body there was. So uh, they, they will all be uh, independent. So there will not be, uh, there will be different governments doing different things. And as I pointed out, the only way governments could fund interstellar flight is pointless projects, something to focus people's attention when I was going on yesterday. And the, the, uh, the other motivations uh, have all been missed. Uh, the, oh, well, no, not the one about the, uh, as the cultures evolve, there will be religious dissidents and people like that, and that is good, good drivers for getting away from people. You mentioned that, things like that. Uh, on the uh, inter extraterrestrial contact, even during the Daedalus study, Tony, Tony Martin pointed out that uh, I think with starships capable, well, certainly during the world ship uh, uh, papers, the, the, even the first world ship paper by Bond and Martin pointed out the acuteness of the Fermi paradox, assuming world ships capable of only 0.5% the speed of light because you colonize, assuming the colonization wave travels at about 10% of the uh, the actual velocity of the starships involved, you therefore, I think, get across the galaxy in about 200 million years. And as you quite rightly point out, that's a fraction of the... Uh, so uh, that's why, uh, Les, I'm totally on you and your colleagues who said that. Uh, the, the, uh, the Fermi paradox is very acute indeed, and frankly, that's all we need to study. And I don't know what came over you, Calvin, because I thought you said that uh, the mere existence of a starship made Fermi paradox acute and so uh, uh, I think that's about it and the only other thing is that uh, uh, Alan Bond wrote a paper also in the BIS journal uh, which is a nice independent look uh, at uh, our particular evolution it's quite right there may be a fault in the not a fault but uh, the, the terms haven't been considered in the Drake equation quite well it was called on the absence of intelligent extraterrestrials and it's quite clear uh, I think, to me at least, that we're either the first, which is very messianic, but, uh, you know, one of those things we, we'll have to cope with, or uh, technical civilization is impossible uh, and we, we, we're never going to make it. There's only two answers. So, uh, sorry about that, folks. I think we're all doing... And Bob, Jim, I'm, I've got the tie on. I love your tie. Thank you. And it, look, well, I don't have the red one. I, I have, I have, I have Marvin. And I have Winnie. The that, thank, thank you, Jerry. Yeah, let's go. So, can, so can, I, I, can we get back to the question? I, I would like to actually comment. Yeah, that is, Joe. except my mic is cut off. Yeah. Um, I. The Fermi paradox does not bode well for what we're trying to do. I agree. Joe. Yeah. So I was making the Fermi paradox point, and and your, what you said was was ninety five percent of that. Uh, I, I agreed with, and there was something right at the end of what you said, and then with the interchange here, I lost what I was thinking. Uh, the microphone getting cut. Uh, Pete's got his hand up there for a while. Let's let's get him in the back, please. And I'd like to throw out to the audience that so this is our last little bit, our last question and, and answer and discussion session. So feel free to to pipe up with whatever comment. It doesn't have to be just on this. So in the process of hearing Joe uh, talk about the Fermi paradox, uh, a possibility occurred to me that had actually never occurred to me before, which is, and it relates also to the idea of the great filter. Uh, it may be the case uh, that the great filter is an ethical leap and that the nearly mathematical formulaic correct answer to this question is that contact cannot be made because by the same logic that causes us to look up and perceive the Fermi paradox, we have to come to the conclusion that if our, if our greatest aspirations are true, and indeed the universe is teeming with advanced life, then by that same logic, by the time we reach it, we won't be able to communicate with them either for the same reason. Does this make sense to anyone, what I'm getting at? 
Are there any nods at all? Would anyone want to say anything Go ahead, about Raj. it? Okay. Go ahead. Uh, actually, um, this is more to Jerry, and I think that you're only 2% right on your response to the Fermi paradox. Um, if, you, if you look at the, the War of the Worlds, um, why did the, the, the Martians come to Earth? They came for our resources. And think about the era when that book was written. It was written during the industrial era, and, and, and people had a desire for resources. And so they projected their own desires into the desires, um, uh, into the desires of the Martians. Um, you know, arguably, we may be heading towards um, a technological singularity, a kind of technological, um, transcend uh, technological transcendence. And the things that motivate us today, like the desire for exploration, expansion, colonization, and trade, which you are projecting onto the motivations of an ET civilization, I, th I, th I don't think that's going to be the, the motivations in the future. I, I But I don't think I don't think it's scary for the Fermi paradox. I, th I think that, that the only reason that they haven't come here is because there are more interesting things for them to do. If you can sense, if you can talk to every living being simultaneously through technological transcendence, if you can experience 27 senses instead of five human senses, then uh, you, your your motivations for interstellar exploration. Well, I guess what I'm saying is. Um, um, don't put those same motives no, 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 on ET I'll, 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 I'll uh, as we currently have. Okay, okay over here in the, in the L. So I, I have my own theory about the Fermi paradox. And the mere fact that we're talking about taking an interstellar leap shows that we're about to make that transformation. And the reason that nobody's come to visit is that the singularity is too easy. A couple of centuries of technological civilization, and we transcend, leave this universe for a more interesting universe, and that's why there's nobody to talk to. Those that have created a civilization like our own, immediately, in the span of galaxies, go somewhere else. Comments? Okay, so I, I'm going to try to address all three of these, but in just a couple of sentences. And yeah, they're, they're, yeah I, I, I'm afraid I must have derailed things by even bringing up the fairy pa Fermi paradox here. But apparently this is an important discussion. And, and there's a third alternative, whether it's from singularity but not going somewhere else and we become machines or whatever. It may be that life is very fragile. It may be that you turn into machines. I don't know, but for some reason it may be fragile, in which case looking and bounding the problem is a fundamental and important thing for humans. If we could build telescopes that could bound the problem, I showed you one design for this, then and find out that you know it really is very rare, maybe that could be the most important thing that we get out of this. That if we find life is fragile, we go, gee, maybe we should be a little more careful about things. Now, we may have no choice. There may be a, a, a technological singularity. And, and all of a sudden, uh, biological life goes out. And I don't know. But, but maybe, if it's fragile, we need to find that out. And that may be as important as anything else that we've talked about here this week. Calvin? I think it was two or three years ago, I gave up on the Fermi paradox, because to me it's irrelevant. Uh, and it's unknowable, because we're arguing about something for that you can't connect to really data. So. I don't even worry about that now. Calvin? So actually, I, I kind of agree with what Mark just said. Um, and I really want to sort of address the Fermi paradox a little bit. Um, in physics, um, or in science in general, when there's an inconsistency, it means something's generally wrong with one of the, the assumptions. Um, for example, there was something, I think it was called the ultraviolet problem or something back in the day, yeah, which, the, the, which led to the discovery of the black body spectrum. Okay, so the way I, I like to see the Fermi paradox okay, in inverted commas, literally, is I see it as a contradiction between our theoretical expectations for intelligent life in the universe and our observations that there isn't any. The fact that those don't match tells me that something's wrong. Going back to the theoretical expectation, it goes back to the limitations of what, how we frame it, which currently is the Drake equation in my earlier comment. The observations goes back to the advancement of our astronomical technology, which is obviously coming on leaps and bounds so that's going to really converge to, I think, getting results soon um, for the near neighborhood anyway. 
um, reconnaissance, let's get those starships out there so we can actually see. And third, as I mentioned earlier, the definition of life. We need to tick those boxes and understand uh, what is a proper uh, model of how life evolves and what is life. Um, and that will really help us to understand the balance between the observation and the theory. And only when you've done all that work can, can you really address the Fermi paradox in the way that it's been framed. Thank you. Jim. Uh, I think uh, uh, many of these comments don't understand the profound nature of the paradox. You see, you can, in, you can invent a reason why this civilization won't do that and the other one will do the other and there's this and that. But the thing is, if you think that there's, as you know, there's about 10 billion planets probably in the, in the galaxy and uh, perhaps a million, who knows, civilizations, and interstellar migration is possible, interstellar travel is possible, then your explanations have to apply to every one of them to explain that kind of paradox. That's the problem. It has to explain all the complete absence. David Brin points out this in his great essay, which is available online, called The Great Silence. Think about that as his title, The Great Silence. You're not just silent lately, silent always, silent for all. That's where the paradox is. It says, and David thinks, that it may be because one doesn't shout in the jungle. So we're already over time. So um, as the Secretary General, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, take the last word. And I'd like to use that to thank Sherik Andretti, who's the one who's actually kept us all on time and kept things moving through the three sessions with pace. So if we could please acknowledge him and thank him. I'd like to thank the panelists. For, for sharing their thoughts with us, for answering questions, for engaging debate. And I'd especially like to th thank you in the audience for participating. Um, I've really enjoyed these three sessions. I hope you have as well. Um, the uh, responses will be compiled and they'll be published in JBiz. And we look forward to doing this again at the next, um, at the next Starship Congress. Thank you so much. Uh, and we, we, um, we reconvene here at eight o'clock for the evening.
have a business, you have a story. And of course, every story needs an audience. So.
time so far? Well, I, I'm pretty excited. Uh, you know, for me, this is a, uh, an opportunity for me to give back to a community that I've certainly drawn a lot on. And although uh, this is my first actual direct experience with uh, Icarus Interstellar, many of the folks uh, uh, who are here and, and the core of that organization and its allied organizations are folks who mentored me, and, and you'll see some of their ideas reflected in what I'm going to uh, tell you. Uh, there are a couple of things that I'm sort of obligated to, to say up front. The first is that, as you can see, I'm, I'm wearing a uniform, and I am in, in, the, in the employee of the United States and the Air Force, uh, but, but none of the remarks I'm going to make today constitute in any way an opinion or policy or position of the United States government. What it does represent is, what is the state of thinking of one strategic thinker within that community that has had an opportunity to, to look at these things. And hopefully I'll show well uh, for my service in that uh, there, are, there are a range of very, very innovative thinkers across the Department of Defense and the Air Force. Um, and I, I was very fortunate to have this fantastic job. I, for four years, I was basically the, the chief futurist and tech scout for Air Force strategic planning in the Pentagon. And I had the, the amazingly wonderful uh, uh, job directive that I was supposed to be looking 30 to 50 years out in the future and trying to look at what would be disruptive um, that we either had to worry about or, or try to make happen in order to, uh, uh, to keep alive our values. And so unlike some of many of the, the other uh, thinkers that you've heard along the way, I'm coming from a very different perspective. I'm coming from a, a, a typically pretty conservative part of society. Uh, a guardian part of society, a part of society that starts from the perspective of uh, security and, and defense thinking. And so because my, my job at that time and, and my job continues to be as a strategist, a strategist has to always think in context and what is the larger context. And certainly if you, if you get in the habit of thinking forward about things, you start wondering, well, how far out can I start thinking about events that I need to plan for? And there, there are things, and, and uh, this talk that I'm going to give, you can also find in an online essay on Kurzweil's blog. And in there, I, I talk about a significant effect, or a significant event. And a significant event is one that really upsets your typical planning assumptions, that, that prior, you know, after that event, things are really going to be different than they, they were before. And I'm going to talk about a few of those things that, that we need to think about. I also want to just say thanks to everybody because what you're doing and attending and, and being part of this is really significant because ultimately the time that you've spent over the past three days is really about the long-term survival and flourishing of humanity. And I think that's a pretty worthy way to, to spend a few days. So I first uh, got into this this whole realm of thinking out and thinking about space. Uh, when I came to my job at the Pentagon in 2004, and we just had a quadrennial defense review that had asked us to, to shift a bit of our thinking and resourcing from just traditional kinds of warfare to irregular warfare and to catastrophic things. And so when I started thinking about catastrophic uh, things, it, it's not long before you sort of, particularly in aerospace, happen on particular existential threats. And there was a beautiful amount of literature that preceded me. There were some really, really forward thinkers in the Air Force that published three studies, uh, Air Force uh, or Spacecast 2020, Air Force 2025, and Toward New Horizons that I was able to draw upon and start to develop a, a starting floor for my own thinking. As I started uh, thinking about strategy and strategy within the context of what the Air Force was doing, it, it clearly became apparent to me that the Air Force didn't really hold most of the cards that were important and that we were part of a much, much larger strategic ecosystem. And so I started to think about what was meaningful in terms of strategy for the nation and then what is meaningful in terms of strategy for the Earth and strategy for life and the values that we, that we hold dear in life. So, the title of this talk is Space, a Billionaire Plan for Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. And it was originally given at the ISDC, I, I think in 2008 or 9, when I was asked about how, how space could serve humanity. So first of all, I, I want to start by saying that space is not about space. 
Space has to serve our fundamental ends and interests. And those of us who are in uniform or public servants in the United States take an oath to our Constitution, which enshrines certain key things that we think are important. Of those, to provide for the common defense, to promote the general welfare, and to secure the, the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. And space has to fundamentally extend our values. It's the tapestry of our deepest values, the, the truths that we hold to be self-evident. And these particular things I'm going to talk about, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So a friend of mine is the author Howard Bloom. And I'm not going to read this quote for obvious reasons, but I think it really, really brings home the, the reality that we face out there. And you know, Howard, in his beautiful essay uh, on this, uh, uh, which is also uh, titled creatively, uh, makes the point that Mother Nature really likes those that attempt to conquer her. And she really rewards those who attempt to stay on top and don't just sit complacently. So I think it's sort of my starting point, my starting belief, that we are destined to become a space-faring civilization. And more than that, we're destined to be the life carriers of our entire ecosystem and the clan of life that started from the very beginning. But honestly, there are a lot of things that could go wrong. And we could do it ourselves. We could do it into ourselves. We could kill our host, poisoning our biosphere. We could wait until all the resources are gone and, and we don't have the necessary energetic resources to, to get off the planet in any meaningful way. Or we could just wait so long that complacency kills us or becomes stunted uh, in, our, in our cultural mandate to go do these things. So I think there's a general imperative that we have to, we will and must understand ourselves. Our entire world, its weather, its climate, all forms of human activity in exquisite detail and all in real time. And we are each nodes in a vast global intelligence network with intelligent feedback loops that ultimately are in an adolescent phase of, uh, of a planetary consciousness slowly bringing ourself under control and deciding how we want to propagate to the great beyond. Now, Earth is the cradle of mankind, but we, we can't stay in the cradle forever, and unless we leave the Earth, we will surely die. And the, the most critical and, and easy reason for this is that we are, at least so far as we know right now, uh, entirely dependent on the sun or sun-like uh, energetic processes which themselves would be fuel limited. So if we want to live beyond the life of our star, we really have to be doing what this conference is all about and thinking about how we get to other stars. But on our way to getting there, there are some near-term threats that we need to think about. And the one that I've spent or been privileged to think a lot about actually is on asteroids. Uh, in, in late 2009, I held the first ever interagency uh, tabletop exercise looking at what we would do if we really had an asteroid coming at us, how we as the government would react, and, and that report is, is public. But what's amazing is how different our view of the solar system is now than probably when any of, uh, except for the youngest folks here in the audience. When I grew up, what we were taught is that basically the solar system was empty and pristine. You had planets, and you had the asteroid belt, and basically nothing in between. And, we, and really starting right about 1994, we started uh, looking for these asteroids and finding them at an amazing rate. And just this month, we passed our 10,000 uh, 10, in terms of how many near-Earth asteroids we've detected. Of course, we've detected many more in the asteroid belt itself. And of those 10,085, over uh, 861 are larger than a kilometer. And of those that we know about, um, a little, little uh, about 14%, or 1,416, are known to be in potentially hazardous orbits, meaning that they come so close that we need to watch and monitor them because they would have some chance of running into us. Now, the ones that are, are civilization killers are, uh, are in this category of larger than one kilometer. But there are a lot of smaller ones that could wreak a lot of havoc. And, uh, and asteroids as small as 40 meters are basically city killers. And there are on the order of 500 to a million of those, of which we've only found 1%. And I'll talk a little bit about what the opportunity of these are a little bit later. But it's only because we're looking out that we even know about these threats. 
Had we not had a space program, had we not had the curiosity to look behind, we would not have, have seen these. And asteroids are really the smaller, easier problem that we can go after. The larger problem for which we require a significant leap in technology is being able to divert a comet. So if, in fact, it was a comet, as many think, that uh, caused our last major extinction, we know these are typically uh, on the order of maybe six months' warning time before they come plunging in uh, toward us. And there's not a lot of warning, and we don't have a deployed uh, space situational awareness system to be able to know about these reliably. And there's a huge number of bodies, perhaps a thousand planetary size bodies, some larger than the Earth, perhaps a trillion comets out there. Then it, it's a, the way uh, our galaxy works is we circle around the center, and as we come uh, through the plane of the galaxy, we come through cosmic dust storms. And we have a fairly near-term uh, threat where perhaps in as few as 2,500 years, we may pass through some dust that could have some adverse effects on our atmosphere. And that's something that's worth uh, thinking about. I, uh, a, another friend of mine, Joel Barker, he has an, uh, uh, several wonderful quotes about the future, but this is one that I really like, that no one's got to thank you for taking care of the present if you've neglected the future. Then you never know when something's going to go wrong with yours or a neighboring galaxy and have some supermassive black hole decide to spit out and fry uh, a huge portion of your galaxy. But using space to protect civilization, providing an environment in which it's able to collectively thrive and grow to its limitless potential, that's part of what our space program needs to be about. But fundamentally, at least in, in my perspective, our space program really is not about curiosity. It's about survival. It's fundamentally about survival. And what we know is that this planet is probably only good in its current form for us for about another billion years. Once, that, once about a billion years, the sun will start expanding. It'll boil off the oceans. And so we better have a plan for what we're going to do then, unless we just don't care about our posterity. But, but at least in my view, having taken an oath to a constitution that says that that's exactly what we're supposed to be thinking about, that's kind of an unacceptable answer. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what we can do to make sure that we can lock in the full warranty of the Earth and at least make sure that we are good for the next billion years. Then you never know when there's going to be a supernova or a gamma ray burst. And they can be pretty far away, uh, as far as 6,500 light years away, and they would have obviously happened a while ago, that could strip away our ozone layer and cause a mass extinction. Um, and I guess there's a known concern within about 8,000 light years. Now, you may not be able to do a whole lot about that, but that's, that is not room for pessimism. And the, the farther you spread, the more independent places you have, more likely you are to survive an eventuality. So you've got a number, a range of threats that we need to be thinking about proactively because the solutions to all these require time. And there's a, just like with, uh, uh, with an interest on your either positive or negative, the sooner you start investing, the time compound value of knowledge and research helps get you to these places. And so we can use time as a lever if we start early. Then there's another problem that I became very interested in when I first came to Future Concepts, and that was what a stress energy was likely to be, particularly the fossil fuel regime that we were under. And so I, I uh, searched far and wide trying to find uh, a solution that I thought would be elegant and sort of fit the, the total function, uh, value function that I was looking for in energy, something that would be green, would be infinitely scalable to global demand and demand beyond global uh, demand so that everyone could have a first world lifestyle, uh, something that would be technologically within our boundaries and our control as opposed uh, to in unstable regions. And I, I really think this quote by JFK nicely sums up uh, how we should be thinking about energy in the long run, which is that there are risks and costs to any program of action, but they are far less than the long-range costs of comfortable inaction. And there are always skeptics out there that don't believe that we'll see a, a peaking in fossil fuels because, of course, we've been able to extend uh, our ability to, to get more and more pretty well. But just a thought experiment on its limit, if the entire internal volume of the Earth was nothing but a giant gas tank, if you kept burning it, eventually it would all be gone. 
So we have this amazing resource out there, the sun. It's a, it's a working fusion reactor. Uh, it's, it's got a different principle than most of the fusion reactors. It's a gravitational confinement fusion reactor. And it puts out this amazing number that's so far in excess of the 15 or 17 terawatts we need now, or the 30 terawatts we'll need in a few decades, or perhaps the 55 terawatts we'd need for a fully developed civilization. So why not go where the energy resource is huge and constant? If you were to draw an imaginary band around uh, geostationary orbit and, and make that uh, approximately one kilometer wide, in a year, more energy flux passes through that little band than all of the oil in the ground. And the beauty is, is that it really does scale. So if we were going to provide all forms of energy, all of it, in the form of, uh, of electricity, and we were going to give everybody, we were going to let the population of the Earth grow where it thinks it's going to go to about 10 billion, we were going to give everybody the lifestyle we're enjoying here today, we'd need about 55 terawatts. And the numbers show that there are easily between 177 and 332 terawatts in geo alone. So this is a totally renewable 24-hour energy source that is only seeking the creativity of folks out there to tap it economically. And I really think that this is the Stellar app. This is the Stellar app because of all the potential goals that a space program could have, the competencies that it takes to get to a space solar power satellite really enable e any and everything else you would want to be able to do um, in the inner solar system and, in fact, the industrial base that you would need to be able to go to the stars as well as grow the economy. So to give you an idea of how significant a, uh, a move to this kind of power would be, if you're able to put 55 terawatts in orbit, you grow the global GDP tenfold. So imagine a world that is 10 times richer, and imagine a, a, uh, a, an economy that is completely self-sustaining. Now, let's talk for a minute about the scale about this, because the scale is both incredibly massive and at the same time minuscule compared to other human activity. So 50 terawatts, assuming, uh, uh, as Professor Lubin had mentioned, that we may eventually get to one kilogram per kilowatt, that gets you to about 50 million metric tons total. And if you wanted to deploy that in 10 years, that would be about 5 million metric tons, or about 14,000 metric tons today. Well, on an annual basis, that is, or that is roughly about a level of effort that is 10 times what we did in the Berlin airlift, or, tw or approximately twice the traffic of uh, LAX in airplanes, but it is a hundredth the annual activity of, uh, of what a port like Singapore or Shanghai sees. And the, rev the revenues would be absolutely astounding. It also puts you on a path to do a lot of exciting things, because if you're going to build a space solar power satellite, you're going to have to develop massive uh, launch from Earth of hypermodular systems that can self-assemble on orbit. You're going to have to have the ability to build things on orbit and of course, if you can do that, then you can build other ambitious things on orbit. You've also got gigawatts, terawatts of power on orbit in which you can do de uh, orbital debris clearing, in-space mobility. Uh, you, can, you can do your laser light craft to the stars eventually, it, as well as many, many uh, desirable things here on Earth. And of course, asteroid defense, the ability uh, to stop dangerous weather patterns. And of course, along the way, there's, there's many, many other markets that would get developed. And it's hard to believe that once you started with that infrastructure that you wouldn't want to transition to space-based resources as opposed to bringing them up the gravity well. So when I was a, when I was a kid, I was introduced to this marvelous uh, uh, book, um, Don Quixote. And I'm sorry, it was Man and Superman. And there's this amazing quote in it, and I'm going to read this because I think it's just so beautiful. This is the life force speaking. I have done a thousand wonderful things unconsciously by merely willing to live and following the line of least resistance. Now I want to know myself and my destination, to choose my path, to be able to choose the line of greatest advantage instead of yielding to the direction of least resistance. To be in hell is to drift, to be in heaven is to steer. 
So I, I think that fundamentally we are a frontier people and we like the idea of expansion and learning from ourselves and moving forward. And I think that there's, you know, the idea that we would want to cap our population 10 billion, I think is a terrible idea. Why would we want to limit the growth and expression of humanity when we don't have to? So a couple of people have mentioned these, uh, these uh, idea of free-flying space colonies, and I think this really is the destiny of mankind. And there's this amazing quote by Jim Zimora, and he says, I'm not interested in things getting better. What I want is more. More human beings, more dreams, more history, more consciousness, more suffering, more joy, more disease, more agony, more rapture, more evolution, more life. And I am squarely in this guy's camp. I think that's where we need to go. And the, the carrying capacity is astounding. If you look at what is available in the inner solar system, it's just amazing. And let me, uh, I want to come back to this. I want to just sh use this chart to, to talk about this for a second. So I want to sensitize you guys to a bit of the, of the wealth that's out there because um, we, uh, I showed that initial slide as a joke about these space expedi expeditions being too expensive. But let me start off with this. There is today uh, a proposal from NASA to study a asteroid capture and return mission of something very small, seven meters, nothing that you'd have to worry about. You've got to be above uh, 30 or 40 meters to be able to e enter the atmosphere and survive reentry. That's about 500 tons. The cost to bring that back, to bring back the first one, is about $2.6 billion to bring back the mass of the International Space Station. Now, if I needed to launch that same amount of mass into orbit, the launch cost alone would be on the order of $20 billion. The recurring, and I get a 28 to 1 mass advantage in what I have to launch up to get that back. The next subsequent mission, after you've done the non-recurring uh, uh, capital, is $1 billion. And so that's a 20-fold cost return uh, to go out there. Now, if I develop that technology and I start going after something a little bit bigger, a 50-meter L-class asteroid, the one, like the one that recently flew by with great fanfare on the same day that the Russians got uh, bombed by a different asteroid, in, in 2014, uh, 2014 DA-14 is estimated that it would uh, be worth somewhere in the neighborhood of $130 billion in metals and $55 billion in water, not counting the cost of getting it up there. Now, how many of those are up there? In that class, there are 500,000 to a million near-Earth objects of that size. Now, if you go a little bigger to 120-meter C-type, you're talking about 2 million tons. Now, what can you do with 2 million tons in Earth vicinity? you could build a rotating, permanent, Earth normal gravity space colony for 8,000 people, 8,000 people, and still have enough leftover material to build 12 5 gigawatt solar power satellites that each annually return 2.2 billion in revenue for a total of 26 billion, now, note that NASA's annual budget right now is $16 billion. And that is enough mass to build 34 Daedalus class starships. That's a 120 meter single one. Now, the other asteroid that you've probably heard about, Apophis, which is about 270 meters, would allow you to build 155 gigawatt solar power satellites with an annual return of $375 billion in revenue each, assuming uh, they were made of 25,000 tons of steel and silicon, as well as a Kalpana 1 style habitat that could house 100,000 off-Earth citizens. Now the next thing I have to put a bit in perspective. The GDP of the United States right now is about $15 trillion, $15 trillion. For the world it's 70, but for the US it's 15. Our debt is $16 trillion. Our annual tax revenues are $2.5 trillion. Our deficit is $1 trillion. 
The largest market capitalization of any company right now is Apple at one half trillion. Now, a single 500 meter asteroid has been valued by USGS at five trillion dollars. And that, that half a kilometer across asteroid would yield 174 times the annual output of all platinum group metals and 1.5 times the total global reserves. The smallest known uh, metallic asteroid, of which there are, uh, uh, there's a certain percentage, I want to say it's about 10, don't, don't quote me on that, but the, the number is, there's a total of about 60,000 of them in the asteroid belt. But the smallest of them, 1986 DA and 353, 350, 3553 a moon, are valued at 25, 22 to 25 trillion dollars. Now, whenever you talk to folks about this, they, wi they wisely come back and say, well, but if you dumped it on the market, it wouldn't be worth that much, right? But, but this misses the point also about what real wealth is. And so I want to point out to you that in 1880s, the most valuable metal on Earth was what? Aluminum. aluminum. And aluminum now is dirt cheap, but are we less wealthy as a society? Because, and keep in mind that aluminum was so expensive that we put it on the top of the Washington Monument, we decorated the ceiling of the Library of Congress to be showy with it, and when foreign heads of state came, that was what they were served on instead of gold. We literally have cities made of gold something more valuable than gold. We have aluminum structures, aluminum airplanes, aluminum cans. Are we less wealthy because we have that? No. We are incredibly wealthy because we can essentially have cities made of something better than gold. The most valuable uh, asteroid right now on Osterank is $36.36 billion. And keep in mind, there are 60,000 of these. Now, when you think about the carrying capacity here, there are two different estimates that come out of NASA studies. One is that if you gave every single human being on the order of 13 kilometers, square kilometers per person, you can still build a habitable surface area of like 3,000 Earths, 3,000 Earths. And the other carrying capacity is that the carrying capacity of the asteroid belt alone is 10 to 100 trillion people. That is 10 to 100,000 times what we currently have on Earth. So just imagine what kind of a civilization we could have just here in our own solar system. And I want to tarry there for a moment because I thought this last discussion on the panel was very interesting because if you believe that a stellar mission is going to be funded on the basis of curiosity, and keep in mind that we fund curiosity many, or a, an order of magnitude plus less than we fund fear, if you look at the NASA versus the DOD budget. But if you, if you think about this, right, uh, NASA, our curiosity budget, is about a thousandth of US GDP. And if we can build something that's ambitious, like an ISS that's, uh, you know, that's uh, roughly 500 tons, and a Daedalus class mission would be 54,000 tons, that means that proportionally you'd need a civilization that was about a hundred times more wealthy than we are today. But of course, if you've got on the order of 10 to 100 tri trillion citizens, your tax revenues are going to be just fine. But of course, free flying, you know, is not the only option. There's no reason to waste a good Goldilocks zone, and we certainly should be thinking about creative ways to transform Mars. And we, we need to, first of all, make sure that Earth does not look like that and we're able to positively manage our own climate. But then there's no reason why we should uh, let either, uh, either of our nearby planets continue to look the way they are, and we should aim to have something that looks more like that. So the pursuit. So in the pursuit of, health, of happiness, the pursuit of wealth, we are seeing an amazing explosion that as our society gets wealthy, as we individually have more energy available to us, as there are wealthy citizens that have higher concentrations of wealth and as we collectively can share our wealth in ways like Kickstarter uh, to do the things we want, we are building for ourselves ever-increasing access. And those who say it can't be done are usually er interrupted by others doing it. So how long is it going to be till we're going to have a completely commercial uh, 
cislunar system that's going to be a real railroad as opposed to something that's just built for the government and by the government. And as I said, there is a tremendous amount of wealth out there. In fact, and this is an old statistic, but if you were going to try to divide the, the wealth of our inner solar system among all of us, the NASA study said that basically if you divided it a hundred uh, if you divided it among all six billion people that they had at the time, uh, the, ast the wealth of the asteroid belt would mean that each of us would have a hundred billion. I, I could think of a few things I could do with a hundred billion. But when you think about what's going to drive you here, it's really important you pick your goals right and right from the start. And it's not necessarily the intuitive way. I would argue that if you really want to colonize and terraform Mars and get to another uh, uh, a stellar system, you don't start by sending human beings to Mars. You start by building space solar power satellites. Take a look at this. This is a logarithmic scale. And these are all the different potential drivers of space launch. This is courtesy of Ivan Becky. But this line right here, space solar power satellites, and the amount of uplift that is required and what it delivers back down to you, that's what's really going to turn us into a space-faring civilization, into a space industrial society that can do great things. And eventually, you know, after the initial non-recurring cost, it's going to go up and we'll be able to build these beautiful internal volumes. Luckily, you know, when you poll the public, they're, they're ahead of where our actual policy is. If you look over two different administrations, building solar power satellites and developing planetary defense was the top. So it's kind of curious that they're not part of our program right now. But the reason is, of course, that we have a vision for space exploration, but we have no vision for space development. Nor do we have a funding line in any of our organizations for that. So eventually, we're going to have a continuous Earth to space infrastructure that's going to be able to let us come and go at relatively low expense. There are a lot of potential candidates out there. We heard a couple to, uh, in the past couple days. And we have got a bright future, you know, a future that's going to, you know, have all these different characteristics. You're going to have free-flying colonies. You're going to have uh, the ability to divert stuff. You're going to be doing terraforming. You're, you're, you've got a stellar probe up there. By the way, this is a graphic from the uh, 2007 uh, Pentagon Space Solar Power Study, which I would recommend to you. Then there's this. The, the stewardship, the, abil the ability to protect and buffer the Earth from the awesome winds of change. And here again, if you've never read Jim Oberg's fantastic essay, um, he has this amazing line. He says, the universe threatens us, we resist. To refrain from taking action in defense of Earth's biosphere, using the fear of our ignorance as an excuse is, I argue, an abdication of our responsibility to our planet and to our nation and to our children. And eventually, you know, we, uh, we may outgrow this particular form. Our children may be children of the mind. Maybe we will transcend as something you're just like Kurzweil talk about in the singularity. Maybe we'll choose to live in a second life in some kind of a solar server farm. But we may still want to grow our creativity. And if we do, then we'll want to think about how we co-opt larger amounts of resources to do very ambitious things. We may want to create world ships because we value our biology and our heritage and our ecosystem and we want to send that on. And of course, there's what we're here to talk about today, the extrasolar planets, the HAB stars. And I would argue that we don't necessarily care in, in this paradigm whether or not there are planets that are Earth-like. We care about whether or not there are rocky materials that we can make into large internal volumes and harvest the solar energy in order to continue our, uh, our flow of life. And there's a whole galaxy that's our first stepping stone to explore. And even if we were going to go slow at 0.1c and take 500 uh, years at each location, the numbers show that we could basically people the or get to the entire galaxy within like a half million years. So while a billion years is certainly what we have to be planning for, and what I think we may unfortunately be planning for, because I think that the, the nature of our uh, of our society is to sort of wait until the threat is imminent and proximate to do anything about it, there is no reason we need to. And I think that we cannot help but go in different and creative, interesting directions. And Bruce Sterling, if you've never read Schismatrix, a wonderful book, he's got this great line that a successful species always bursts into a joyous wave 
of daughter species of hopeful monsters that render their ancestors obsolete. Denying change meant denying life. And I think this is something to be celebrated ultimately, that we will have children that will be tremendous in their diversity. Think about how sad it would have been if any of our ancestors had said, hey, microbe, why don't you stay in the pool here? You know, fish, don't, don't walk up on land. You might change. You might grow legs. You know, don't leave Old Divide Gorge. We might look different in a few millennia. But I think that we're learning to draw our circle of inclusion larger and to learn that that diversity uh, uh, makes us more interesting. So to learn about other stars and planets is to learn about our own, and we need to be reaching for those farther destinations. And I personally think that there are handles yet on the universe undiscovered that will allow us to do this with greater ease. So I think that we either need to find a way or make one. And so the mantra that I think is very important is, uh, and feel free to repeat after me, this is uh, Lee Valentine's tagline, but this is fantastic. Mind the sky. Protect the earth. Settle the universe. And so that, I, th I think with that, I'm out of time. I could talk for more time, but I'm not going to. If you want to read the full essay, it's on Kurzweil, and, and here is a site where there's some other writings there. Uh, but the basic, basic plan is lock in the full warranty of the earth, solve our energy and asteroid problems that will let us prosper for another billion years, in that time frame, grow the inner solar system to a much larger civilization, build out the infrastructure that we need to do more ambitious things, taking us to the stars, and then settle the universe. That's it. All right, we are going to take a short break because we actually need to set up a few things for the second part of the evening, so you guys can feel free to stretch your legs for a little bit.
right, guys. Um, thanks for taking a little mini break. When everyone wants to come hang out inside, settle back in, we'll get started. Wow, I just got really quiet. Okay, well, welcome to Dreaming of Starships with Haley Bright, myself. This is actually a really fun time. We figured it's the end of the conference. We've been learning about stuff all week long, so uh, let's have a little fun. So, um, since you guys have been learning so much about interstellar space exploration, I figured, why not learn about the scientists that are bringing it to you? So, we're going to have a little challenge this evening, where um, I'm going to, I sent them a list of questions over the last couple days. They answered them for me. And um, I'm going to read their answers, and if you know who it is that gave that answer, run up to this microphone, shout out their name, and I'm going to give you a beer. That's how this works. So, <laughs> it might get a little dangerous. I'm not, I'm not responsible for your safety, but if you would like to win a free beer, you run up to that microphone. Some people should maybe get better seats right now. <laughs> they get a free beer. Yeah, please no one under 21 play this game. <laughs> Can you run to the beer? Wait, you're, no, you cannot run to the beer. <laughs> but you guys can have a beer because you are on my panel, so feel free to. Oh, I didn't bring you a bottle opener. <laughs> um, does anyone have a bottle opener? Oh, Richard does. Richard, way to, way to be prepared. We'll, we'll get you on. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, your guilty pleasure movie, and the answer is Battle Los Angeles. Anyone know who would have picked Battle Los Angeles for their favorite guilty movie? All right, I'm waiting for someone to run to this microphone. Oh, we got to take her. O'Neal. That's right. Awesome. Come grab a beer. Um, and I bought you good beer, too, not a bunch of crappy beers. Where's Rich? Yeah, he's with the ball over there. Uh, he's back there. He's hiding it out. All right, let's move on. We need beer. <laughs> if you could do any job in the world other than your current job, what would it be? A movie director. <laughs> Anyone know who would have said that? Or you can raise your hand. If no one likes this running the microphone thing, you can raise your hand. That's fine, too. Any ideas? You guys are really shy. Come on. Kelvin. It was Kelvin. All right. Come on down. <laughs> you guys are really good at this. All right. Most embarrassing moment ever. I was late for a bus. I was running to, in my flight suit at full speed with a briefcase. My, sh my shoelace came loose. I did fine until I got right in front of the bus and an entire audience. Wait, was someone guessing over here? Oh, yeah, come on up. <laughs> All right, weirdest thing that no one knows about you. I have a 100% success rate of sexing baby bunnies correctly. I have five, five white rabbits, four girls, and one boy that I've reared from birth. It's not Rachel. <laughs> Any other guesses? Uh, yes, one of the guys is a bunny lover. It is Ian. <laughs> All right, let's see. What is your best physical trait? This one I was actually like, really? This is awesome. I have a pulse. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Wait, didn't you you're just racking up, man? Uh, oh wait, is that your current beer that we, Oh, I thought never mind. Oh, you need Oh, you need beer. What? Hey Richard, where's that opener? Where is Richard? He left. Oh, maybe he went to find it and he's coming back. All right. Oh, do you have one? Are you bringing it up here? No. 
All right, I think Richard's on his way back. Let's see. I gotta like keep going through you guys. Strangest thing you would do for money? Gopher wrangling. I had a Caddyshack moment with a gopher in my front yard earlier this year. Managed to remove the gopher, no lives lost. I consider myself qualified to be a gopher wrangler. It's <laughs> Ian. Come on up. You guys, are, you guys know your scientists really well. I like it. All right. Most embarrassing moment again. I was giving a BIS lecture and playing 2001 Space Odyssey theme tune, but instead, oh yeah, <laughs> okay, multiple people can come up. <laughs> How did you know that? Obvious, it was obvious. Tell the rest of the story. Oh yeah, it's pretty funny. Okay, I'll tell the rest of this. I was giving a BIS lecture and playing 2001 Space Odyssey theme tune. But instead, 1940s Carly Drake comedy theme tune came on instead, and I couldn't turn it off. That's pretty terrible. Nobody probably knows who Charlie Drake is in this room, right? So, okay. You, Google, Google Charlie Drake. <laughs> who is he? Ah, okay. All right. Um, Yeah, yeah, come do it. <laughs> All right. Um, if you could do any job in the world other than your own, what would it be? I would run an institute or policy strategy think tank to advance. Wait, yeah, but I got to keep reading because it it's really funny. Uh, to advance space, space faring and space industrial development. In case the idea catches on, if the president is hiring right now, I would like to be Caesar for an, for an organization in charge of planetary defense against asteroids. Or to develop space solar power to solve solar blah, 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 blah. This is a really long answer you sent me. <laughs> be honest, but not too honest. Okay, weirdest thing that you guys don't know about me. I helped a guy get a third ear implanted on his arm. Yes. Come on up. And whoever said it over there. Oh, do you guys want to hear the story? Okay. Okay. When I, um, uh, when I first left medicine, um, I started to work with performance artists that were doing extreme body modifications. Um, so one of the people I was working with was um, Orlan, who's a French performance artist, who was undergoing extreme cosmetic surgery. Um, and the other one was um, Stellark, um, who uh, was hybridizing his body with robotics and the internet. So essentially he was kind of crowdsourcing an electromuscular nerve um, sti st stimulator, which could be accessed over the internet. And these turned into kind of elaborate performances. Um, and so Stellark decided he wanted a soft technology and he wanted an ear implanted on his face. Um, and I told him that that was a, uh, a very dangerous anatomical place to put it because he looked like he'd had a stroke because it was right over the facial nerve. So um, I agreed to introduce him to a plastic surgeon from Oxford. And it's even, uh, essentially, it was a seven-year journey then before he had um, an ear implanted um, underneath his left forearm using bioscaffolding um, and uh, also had a Bluetooth implant. Um, and uh, the plan was to have a tooth implant so that when you dialed his ear and you opened your mouth, that somebody standing next to you would hear him speak with your voice. That's pretty awesome. Uh, I hate to inform you guys, we we're having kind of fun with this, but um, we just got notified by the hotel that we can't actually be handing out beer. So, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that might cut our evening a little short, since everything else involved more things like that. Uh, but maybe we should just all go hang out in the lobby and just call it a night. No? Oh carry on with this? Okay, we'll do a little bit more. <laughs> I don't think I can do that. Uh, okay, we'll do a little bit more. We were actually going to have a beer taste test with uh, everyone toast the winner. Huh? I 
think we just can't bring it in because it's from the outside. Okay, that's fine. Well, never mind, we'll keep going. All right, if you win, go see that bar back there. Um, <laughs> all right, let's see. What were you doing on August 7th? Writing Fortran code for Project Icarus Starship Design. <laughs> uh, whoever said that first, please go to the back. <laughs> What's the weirdest thing no one knows about you? I was an ex-paratrooper in the British Army. Yeah! <laughs> Can you tell this story? That's really crazy. What is, what is that to tell? Four and a half years, airborne. Same as uh, man over there, airborne time. No crazy stories? Oh, loads of crazy stories, but you know, what can I say? It's all, it's all classified, yeah. So. I don't know about that. I've heard your stories before when we were drinking. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> do you sing in the shower or in the car? Uh, most definitely, I just sing everywhere. Everything from Neil Diamond to the Bee Gees. Peter. <laughs> Favorite part about your job? I work from home, but seriously, I get to report on anything from black holes to rocket launches to interstellar travel. I get paid to be a geek. <laughs> about me uh, you can ask me anything you want it's, uh, you can look on my YouTube channel there's a lot of weird things on there <laughs> uh, your favorite guilty pleasure movie Zoolander wait what what was the guess it is Rachel oh you got it good job um, your best physical feature, my eyes. I have excellent eyesight. Peter. Nope, but that, that's a good guess. Nope. Kelvin. <laughs> I'm sorry, Kelvin. <laughs> Your best physical feature again. I've been told I have a charming smile or intense mischievous eyes. <laughs> it was Peter. <laughs> when you sent me that, I was like, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, favorite beer or cocktail? Stone IPA. It's Ian, whoever said that first. Head back there. All right, I'm almost through these. Let's see. Head back there, buy a beer. Most embarrassing moment. I was on vacation in Spain with friends when I was 18. I was in the hotel pool, and I had my swimming shorts pulled off by one of my quote-unquote friends. Wait, who then threw them onto the balcony of an all-girl hotel room? I had to run out of the pool with a soda cup covering my <laughs> to plead with the girls to return my shorts. Fortunately, they fell. <laughs> Fortunately, they fell sorry for me and threw me down a towel and shorts. I can laugh about it now, but at 18, it was really embarrassing. I'm no longer friends with that guy who stole my shorts. It's not Calvin. It's Ian. Whoever said that, you're right. <laughs> okay, uh, favorite beer or cocktail? And I just learned what this was today, so you guys, if, if you know it, then I, I, I found it very interesting. Spirulina and pineapple. And a spirulina is like an algae drink. Yes, whoever said that first over here. All right, let's just get a little touching here. Favorite part about your job? Seeing people become the best they can and achieve their personal dreams, it makes me so happy. <laughs> wait, did you said, wait, what'd you say? Yes. <laughs> That's so sweet, showing your sensitive side. 
I'm just kidding with you. Uh, okay. I have successfully completed this sheet of things. What were you doing on August 7th? I was at home, then I was working, and then the evening I went to a, a pub, surprise, meeting an old friend. No. Nope. No. Nope. How'd you guys not get that? Ian's like, if you read his Twitter feed, he's like, I'm working on science stuff. I'm at a bar, I'm at a bar, I'm at a bar. I'm working on science stuff. <laughs> You have to read his Twitter feed. It's hilarious. <laughs> Whoever said that? Oh, thanks, Andreas, for being in charge of the drink tickets. Okay, weirdest thing that no one knows about you. I used to teach a Japanese martial art, a martial art, ride motorcycles, and write science fiction. It was Peter. Whoever said it. Okay, what were you doing on August 7th? Again, I was in London, 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 writing my thesis and ordering flour made of insects. Yeah, whoever said over there the first time, that's right. I was like, what's flour made of insects? You, would you like to explain that? It sounds really cool. Okay. Um, I'm yet to find out. So um, I had to, I, I actually think I might have to make the damn stuff. Um, so uh, I was, uh, I'm, I'm leading uh, the organization of a, a future dinner, um, and it's supposed to embody the way that we might be eating food in the future. So it includes some algae, some recycled food, and some insects. Um, and I was looking to uh, find some flour made of insects so I could uh, try and find uh, a recipe that would not look like an insect when it was eaten. Uh, so I was trying to source um, insect flour over the internet, and there seems to be a very dodgy supply that you can get from somewhere in Korea, but there also seems to be um, a, a farm in Amsterdam, which seems to be the more reliable source of, of food. Um, and I was just following down the uh, um, links from a, a big feature in Wired, uh, which uh, has these you know, uh, kind of full-page uh, millipedes and uh, cockroaches on the, um, on, on the kind of double spreads of the feature. Um, so essentially, the, the best flower you can get apparently is from crickets. Uh, so uh, that story is still yet to be fulfilled. You definitely need to write about this on your Twitter feed once you... Once you do that, I want to hear about that. You have to grind them by hand when they're dried. <laughs> that's, that's new to me. That sounds cool. All right. Strangest thing you would do for money. He said, well, oh, he, sorry. <laughs> oh, everyone. Uh, well, I spent 10 years of my life flying jumbo jet-sized airplanes and doing air-to-air -air refueling. Yes. All right. Do you sing in the shower or in the car? I sing in the shower, car, bathroom, garden, in my sleep, just as long as no one is listening. That was just process of elimination. Thanks for throwing it out there. Uh, your best physical feature. I'm rather fond of all my features, of this little capsule that allow my consciousness to explore my little corner of the physical universe. <laughs> no, but it does sound like something you might say. <laughs> Any other guesses? It was Ian. Okay. <laughs> Strangest thing you would do for money. Turnip. Turnip? Turnip. I'm from Tennessee. Sometimes it just comes out wrong. Turnip judging competition. That is kind of a weird thing to do for money. Strangest thing you would do for money, a turnip judging competition. No, that's a good guess though. Nope. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we'll hear the story. So it's a really good story. Okay, so when I, I told you when I gave my talk how inspired I was about Project Apollo, okay, I said I was 14. But when I was 15, I had a vegetable pot in my back garden. 
And I love like to growing tomatoes and onions. And one day I came across a turnip. And it was like the most astounding thing I'd ever seen in my life. I was like, I love this turnip. I just, I, and ever since, I've been obsessed with turnips. And I'm looking constantly, going around the world for the biggest turnip I can find. And I just want to be the judge on a turnip competition. So we've launched the Alpha Centauri Prize competition. But I really want to launch the Alpha Centauri Turnip Prize competition. So. That's really cute. Thank you for sharing. All right, this is my last question of the evening. Favorite beer or cocktail? Dominion Oak Barrel Stout. <laughs> it was Peter. Process. Yeah, process of elimination. Um, okay, so I need four really brave volunteers to come up here. Yeah, just come up to the front. First four people. Oh, you're involved already. Oh, Andreas, you, are you joining us? Yeah, you'd be a volunteer. I need two more people. Excellent. Oh, hey, Andreas, can... No, it does not involve eating bugs. Uh, hold on one second. I need to check. No. I need to check on legalities of something real quick. I'm sorry to inform you, but uh, apparently we can't do what we were going to do because of the legalities of what we were going to do. <laughs> uh, okay, well, then, sorry, guys, that ends our evening short. Well, we were going to, I originally bought all this, like, really cool beer, and I, we were going to do a taste test, like, scientists versus the mundane people, <laughs> uh, to see who was best, and whoever won was going to win a mini keg. Let's go outside. <laughs> well, I, I'm probably the most mundane person here, so I mean. <laughs> oh, that sounds awesome. But uh, I don't think we can actually do it in this room, so maybe this can take place later on this evening. But thank you guys for coming, and let's hang out after this. Thank you.